Hello fellow comic enthusiasts, welcome back to HC Comics, your gateway to the colorful and captivating world of comics. Today, we're embarking on the next exciting chapter of this comic series together, wishing you all some relaxing moments as we dive in to HC Comics Adventure, returning to the main developments of the story. In this episode, we start with the scene. This is the story of Seo Jun, who became the world's strongest simply by farming with his cute monster pets and even evolving them, like these poison bees evolving into a thick, oh, I mean, a cute human-like bee. But things weren't always like this for him. It all started ten years ago when a mysterious black tower appeared everywhere. The tower was so strong that not even a nuclear bomb could destroy it. One day, people began coming out of the tower and sharing their experiences. They said they were sucked into a portal and ended up inside the tower. When they entered, they gained amazing powers. If they conquered the tower, they could get great rewards and mythical items, like a golden ticket that let ordinary people enter and gain powers too. Our hero, Seo Jun, dreams of buying a ticket and entering the tower one day. But suddenly, a black hole appeared behind him in the empty space. Startled, Seo Jun stared at the black hole, his heart racing with excitement about the possibility of fulfilling his dreams. He closed his eyes, thinking the hole will suck him in like others, but to his surprise, black hole hadn't transported him anywhere. Confused and alarmed, he muttered, Why am I still here? Before he could contemplate any further, the black hole began to shrink. No, my future! He shouted in desperation, unwilling to give up on his dreams. Determined to get into the tower at any cost, Sejun charged into the black hole with reckless abandon. As he disappeared into the darkness, he could feel his heart pounding in his chest, wondering where he would end up. When Sejun finally emerged from the black hole, he was confused and disoriented as, on the first floor of the tower, there were supposed to be luxurious chandeliers lighting up the area. But this place was a cave made of rocks, with the only exit was the hole in the cave ceiling. Frustrated, he screamed, Where the hell am I? Trapped and alone, our protagonist found himself in a dire situation within the mysterious tower he had longed to enter. He had spent a full day searching for an exit. To his disappointment, the only exit was the hole in the cave ceiling. However, climbing the wall to reach the arched hole in the ceiling seemed impossible unless he was Spider-Man. As he pondered his fate, the sudden ringing of his phone alarm startled him. Despite being lost in this strange place, the alarm assured him that it had been exactly one day since he arrived. Hungry and disoriented, he rummaged through his meager supplies to assess his situation. With only a bottle of water, 27 cherry tomatoes, 10 green onions, 7 pumpkin sweet potatoes, and a washed apple, he had to make his provisions last. He decided to eat the apple first, savoring its sweetness and the momentary relief it provided. Each bite of his other raw vegetables brought unexpected pleasure, their flavors and textures a surprising delight. After finishing one sweet potato and five cherry tomatoes, Sejun picked up a green onion, and then he buried the white part of the onion root in the soft soil where the sunlight entered. Then he planted two sweet potatoes on the left side and cherry tomatoes on the right side. Then suddenly, the ground beneath our protagonist's feet trembled violently, the shock wave coursing through his body, causing him to shudder in pain and confusion. What's going on? He muttered. As he tried to steady himself, he noticed the light streaming down from the cave ceiling had taken on an eerie blue hue. His eyes widened in disbelief as a colossal black dragon appeared in the sky, its roar reverberating throughout the cavern. The sight of the majestic creature soaring through the air, bathed in the blue light, left him in awe. Before he could fully process the bizarre sight, his vision blurred, and he succumbed to unconsciousness. Upon awakening, our protagonist struggled to regain his bearings. He was astonished to learn that he had been unconscious for two whole days. His shock only intensified when he turned around to find a fully grown tree standing behind him. What the? A tree? I Isn't this a green onion that I planted? When did it grow this big? Was the green onion something that could grow this big within two days? He thought. He couldn't help but wonder if the mysterious power within the tower had affected not only the green onion, but also the other plants he had sown. To his amazement, he discovered that 52 cherry tomato sprouts had emerged as well. Determined to make the most of his newfound resources, he began harvesting the enormous green onion. The task was more challenging than he anticipated, but eventually he succeeded in gathering the crop. 
Curious about the taste of this extraordinary plant, he took a cautious bite. To his surprise, it was so spicy that his eyes became watery and his face turned red. He immediately ran towards the pond next to him and drank some water to calm down, swearing he would never eat this thing raw ever again. Now to calm down his taste buds, he started eating cherry tomatoes, thinking that the sun never set there. Instead, the blue moon phenomenon occurred on the 10th floor, casting the area into temporary darkness. Ten years had passed since the tower's mysterious appearance, and the powerful Phoenix Guild had managed to clear up to the 37th floor. Little information was available about the floors above the 30th. However, he knew from YouTube videos that skeletons roamed floors 10, goblins on 11, orcs on 20, and spider monsters from the 31st floor onwards. What puzzled him was the dragon he had encountered. No one had ever mentioned dragons or lizard-like creatures in the tower. Which floor is this? he wondered. Lying down, he wondered if he was on a floor so high that no one had yet reached it. Just then, water droplets fell on his face and he quickly got up. Was it raining in the tower? He had heard that the weather was almost always pleasant and as he looked up, the sky was clear. However, he spotted something moving very fast and grew scared, thinking it might be a monster. But the creature he saw approached him, revealing itself to be a cute rabbit drooling over his crops. He was surprised and wondered if the rabbit was a monster too. The rabbit jumped from the ceiling and he rushed to catch it, but the rabbit used his head as a stepping stone and landed safely on the ground. It hopped over to the green onion plants, and Sejun realized that this rabbit was something extraordinary. The rabbit pointed at the green onion plants, and Sejun asked if it wanted to eat them. The rabbit responded, and he understood that it wanted to eat. He broke off a leaf of green onion and handed it to the rabbit, who eagerly accepted. As the rabbit devoured the leaf, he told it that it could have more if it liked. Then he noticed that the plant had already grown back. At this rate, he would have to harvest them twice daily. But the rabbit started saying something loudly, and he realized it wasn't talking to him. He looked up at the cave entrance and saw another rabbit approaching. She landed and handed the first rabbit a straw hat and a watering can, and they both stood before him. He was surprised to see another rabbit and thought that the two might be related. He asked the rabbits if they were married, and they confirmed his suspicion. The next day, we see the rabbits farming and being very happy, while Sejun reflects on how all of this happened. Yesterday, after the rabbits introduced themselves to him, they told him that they wanted to live in the cave. They looked too cute as they tried to persuade him. Sejun felt that he might die from the cuteness overdose and accepted their request on one condition. He told the rabbits that they could not live there for free. If they helped him with farming, he would consider letting them stay. He thought it would dissuade the rabbits a bit, but instead of hesitating, they jumped at him and started cuddling. Now, he is sitting in his spot, watching the rabbits work. He thinks that the rabbits are using their cuteness to control him, but he lets it slide. Before we proceed further into the video, it took a lot of time and effort to make this video, so if you haven't liked this video and subscribed to the channel yet, please do so. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for supporting this channel. Now let's continue with the video. He asks the rabbits if the tools they were using were special items. The husband rabbit had a watering can that seemed to have an endless supply of water, and Sejun is not sure about it, but it seemed to him that the wife rabbit had a magic pocket that contained all the tools she needed for farming. Sejun says that he is jealous and wishes he had such a wonderful item. The rabbits have completed harvesting the green onions, and they are excited to show them to Sejun. Sejun tells them to dry the green onions and starts inspecting other crops, but the rabbits are looking at Sejun with eager and impatient eyes. They are asking him a question, and Sejun understands what they want. He tells them that they passed his test, and now they can live in the cave. The rabbits jump for joy upon hearing the good news and start talking about something. They rush to a corner of the cave, and Sejun wonders what they are up to now. The wife gives her husband a shovel, and he starts digging. In no time, he creates a home for himself and his wife. The wife places a floral wreath on the door of their new house and welcomes her husband to enter. But he is exhausted from digging and building a house and can bear barely stand. Sejun approaches them and says that the husband rabbit was great for making a house so quickly. The husband rabbit gives him a thumbs up, but then he feels his wife's hand on his shoulder. She is blushing and cutely pointing at the door, and the husband is terrified. He is scared, but his wife drags him along for some sweet lovemaking. Sejun hears the sounds coming from their house and wishes the husband all the best, but he is crying inside as he is jealous of him for having a wife. That jealousy does not last long, and Sejun walks back to his spot. 
spot. He says that it was boring to be alone in the cave. And now, thanks to the rabbits, he has someone to help him and something cute to look for. Then he lay down onto the bed made up of onion leaves to rest comfortably, but after some time, he felt something burning. Suddenly, his back started burning. He jumps into a standing position and rolls on the ground, feeling that his back is on fire. He is wondering what just happened as he gets up, and he sees the reason behind it. The plastic water bottle filled with water was acting as a lens and burning the dried onion leaf. Sejun had knowledge from a renowned survival show, learning that rubbing two dry leaves together might produce fire. He had been trying for hours without success, his frustration and disappointment mounting. Yet just as he was on the verge of giving up, a tiny spark caught his eye, and a thrill of excitement surged through him. Curious about Sejun's activities, the rabbits emerged from their dwelling to investigate. He enlisted their aid in fanning the embers by blowing on the pile of dried leaves while he employed a bottle as a lens. United in their efforts, the trio persevered, and at long last, the leaves burst into flames. Triumphant, Sejun reveled in his newfound ability to create fire. Casting a glance at the onion plants, he opted to cook them over the open flame. He roasted one stalk, peeled away the charred exterior, and took a tentative bite. To his amazement, the cooked onion leaf was so delectable that he couldn't help but exclaim in delight. Declaring it delicious, he eagerly began roasting another. Intrigued by the transformative effects of cooking, the rabbits decided to try it for themselves. They too roasted an onion leaf, and as they sampled the sweet treat, their eyes sparkled with the pleasure of experiencing a new and delightful flavor. Sejun was very happy, as, for the first time, he had eaten a full stomach. In the past few days, after discovering fire with the help of the rabbits, Sejun made torches out of green onion leaves and placed them around the cave. This helped him to roam around the cave easily, especially in the dark areas like the pond. He was near the pond with a torch in his hand when he saw something moving in the water. A fish jumped out of the water, and Sejan was so startled that he barely dodged its open mouth. The fish had jumped with too much power and found itself on land, unable to return to the water. This was the first time Sejan had seen a fish in the cave. He wondered if the fish was attracted to the light of the torch, and his intuition was proved correct. And just like that, Sejan discovered fish in the cave. He killed the fish and roasted it over the fire, even though he had no seasoning. The fish was really tasty, and Sejan found the rabbits drooling as he ate the fish and asking for their share. He was shocked because he had not expected rabbits to be meat-eaters, but since they were basically monsters, he thought it was natural. A few days later, the blue moon appeared once again, and Sejun realized that on this floor, the blue moon phenomenon occurred every 30 days. He had been relying on his laptop and power bank to charge his phone and keep track of the date, but eventually they too reached their limit. Unable to use his phone any longer, Sejun began marking the days on the cave wall with a stone. So it's been 61 days, he said. A few days ago, something amazing had happened. Sejun had seen a tired male rabbit open the door of his house, and without wasting a moment, a group of baby rabbits bolted out. They were the children of the rabbit couple that had been recently born, and they had become fond of Sejun, who had become their uncle. They ran straight at Sejun and jumped on him, causing him to fall to the ground. They were really cute, and Sejun couldn't get enough of their cuteness, even as they nibbled at his face. He laughed and enjoyed their company. Sejun looked at the sleep-deprived husband rabbit and said that raising babies must be hard. But for now, he would take care of the babies for a while, and the couple should relax and eat breakfast. The cherry tomato plants had started flowering, and Sejun took the baby rabbits with him to check them out. The babies frolicked around on the farm as Sejun inspired his plants. The flowers had bloomed, and even though they were tomato flowers, Sejan now thought he had a flower garden. To bear fruit, pollination was necessary, and he had to do it manually. Sejan used a small stick to artificially pollinate the flowers, but all the bending and working was taking a toll on his back. A baby rabbit put its face inside a flower and got pollen on its face. It sneezed, and Sejan started laughing. But then, Sejan noticed something. The tomato plants had started to bear fruit. After so long, his hard work was starting to show some results. Sejan celebrated the first fruits of his cherry tomato plants and danced with the baby rabbits. The day before the blue moon, Sejan made preparations to survive it. He put out the fire and stored a small amount of burning leaves under huge boulders. He was wearing makeshift clothes made from onion leaves, thinking that it would be enough to stay warm and hidden. The rabbits also headed back to their homes as the time for the blue moon drew near. Something scary always happened whenever the blue moon occurred, but Sejan was confident that they would survive it like the previous ones. He thought it was going to be a piece of cake and went into hiding. The blue moon began, 
and monsters started screeching throughout the forest. Sejun was not afraid, but he was tired and hoped that the blue moon would end soon. To prepare for an unlikely situation, he had already hidden things with a strong odor and was now hiding in a corner. However, since it was hard to tell how much time had passed, he was growing tired of waiting. The monster cries did not help either. They were far away, but they could still make him shiver. As Sejun hoped that this blue moon would also pass without incident, he heard a loud roar. It was different and more intense than the voices of other monsters, almost as if it were close to him. Indeed, a huge monster was walking towards the cave, squashing full-grown trees beneath its feet. It approached the entrance to the cave, which was too small in comparison to its size. The monster stared down the hole, and inside, Sejun gaped at it. He was scared of the giant bear-like monster in front of him, but thankfully, the monster had not noticed him yet. Sejun thought he should hide in a better place before the monster spotted him. He was trembling as he picked up his bag and started moving quietly and slowly. However, taking the bag with him turned out to be a mistake. As he picked up his belongings, the things inside the bag dropped creating a loud noise due to the empty water bottle. The monster's attention was attracted by the sound. Sejun stared in horror, first at his stuff, and then up at the beast, who was now trying to peek inside the cave. Sejun screamed in fear, and the bear roared in response. A few moments later, Sejun was found unconscious with the rabbits trying to wake him up. When the baby rabbits failed to rouse him, their father slapped Sejun, and he woke up. He was still afraid of what he had seen before passing out and asked the rabbits what had happened to the blue moon. As he looked around, he realized that it had ended. The husband rabbit told Sejun that he was unconscious when they found him and said that he had passed out when he saw the monster. Sejun wanted to know what had happened after that. He had been terrified and couldn't move when the monster tried to force its way into the cave and he had passed out after the monster roared. Sejun remembered the incident and shivered. He had almost lost his life at the hands of that monster. Feeling cold, Old, the wife rabbit created a large fire and a blanket of onion leaves. Sejun sat in front of the fire with the baby rabbits snuggled up to him. The wife rabbit also brought him roasted fish, and Sejun thanked her. As he ate, Sejun realized that the monster had noticed this plate. It may have been due to another monster or because it couldn't get inside the cave due to the small entrance, but the monster had left without causing harm. However, there was no guarantee that he would be safe if it returned. He thought he had gotten lucky this time, but it might go differently next time. After everything he had done to survive, he didn't want to die. He decided that the best course of action was to eat well and stay alive. While Sejun was eating, the husband rabbit approached him, wanting to show him something. Sejun followed him and found something unbelievable, a ripe cherry tomato. But it was nothing like he had expected. It was blue and glistening in the sunlight. Sejun was shocked, but the blue color wasn't the first thing he noticed about the fruit. He bent down and tried to pick up the large, ripe fruit, then wondered why it was blue. As he pondered this, a window appeared in front of Sejun, informing him that he had completed the quest to harvest the fruit containing the energy of the blue moon. Sejun was shocked. He couldn't believe that the thing in front of him was an actual message window. The message on the window changed, and now it said that the tower manager was interested in him because of his amazing achievements. It had been keeping a keen eye on Sejun, but it wasn't happy. Confused, Sejun wondered why the tower manager wouldn't be happy with him, and the husband rabbit didn't know what was going on either. Sejun learned that he was not a duly invited guest, and the tower manager had accepted it as a blunder. It wanted to eliminate Sejun. Shocked, he asked the window what it meant. Was it a mistake that he had ended up in the tower? He angrily said that if that were the case, he should be allowed to go home immediately. But the window said that the tower master wanted to kill Sejun to eradicate all proof of this mistake. Sejun was flabbergasted. He screamed at the screen, saying that he had completed a wonderful achievement, and instead of rewarding him, the manager wanted to kill him. The system window fell silent for a while, and Sejun wondered what was happening. The next message he received changed his mood from scared and angry to elated. The tower manager was awakening him. Sejun felt an aura surrounding him as soon as the message was displayed. He couldn't believe it, and confirmed with the window that he was officially awake in the tower. Eagerly, he awaited to see which job he would be assigned, hoping for something like a wizard. However, his assigned job was a tower farmer with a proficiency of F rank. All the joy and excitement left Sejun's face, and he went blank. The windows continued to give him messages about his job. He would never get sick, be close to nature, and gain experience points by harvesting crop. Sejun was shocked. There was no job class other than a warrior and a magician inside the tower. How could he be a farmer? He commanded the system to open his status window and found that his talent was ordinary, and his stats were all at 
one. He stared at his status window, but the only thing he could focus on was his ordinary talent. Yelling in frustration, Sejun tried to smash the blue tomato to the ground, saying he didn't need it. But then he looked at the scared and concerned faces of the rabbits and stopped. Sejun was taken aback by the influence his actions had on his friends and looked at his farm, then at the tomato in his hand. He wasn't alone in growing it. Everyone had worked hard to reach this point. Sejun decided that he would continue farming, and the rabbits were happy. Sejun looked at the blue tomato in his hand, and an information window opened up telling him about the tomato. It was a magical cherry tomato imbued with the power of the blue moon. Not only was it tasty and nutritious, but when consumed, it would increase one's MP by 0.05 permanently. Sejun was shocked. The tomato in his hand was actually an item. Even though the effect was small, it was permanent and could boost one's stats. Sejun was amazed by himself. He had grown something as great as this. But the tower manager was watching him and wasn't satisfied with how things were going. As Sejun thanked the rabbits and celebrated with them for achieving this feat, a message window popped up in front of him. A quest had been triggered. He had to offer the blue cherry tomato to the manager. The reward for the quest was a job-related skill, and the penalty for refusing was death. Sejun read the entire message, and when he saw that the penalty was death, he became scared. He asked the window if it was a joke out of anger. He accused the admin of blackmailing him and using the name of a quest to justify his actions. Sejun told the admin that if he wanted the blue tomato, he should ask for it properly. If the admin played dirty games like this and made it look like he was giving Sejun options, that would not be good. Sejun was a bit relieved after venting his anger, but then he realized the death penalty and politely offered the blue tomato. The tomato in Sejun's hands vanished, and he received a message that he had completed the quest. The next window displayed the quest reward, and Sejun was excited to receive it. He knew it was a job-related skill, but since he had been focusing solely on the death penalty, he had momentarily forgotten about it. Sejun flattered the tower manager, calling him generous. Then, he decided to check what kind of skill he had obtained and opened the quest reward. The reward was the skill sowing at level 1. This skill slightly increased the probability of germination when a seed was planted. Sejun didn't know how to react, but he was certainly disappointed. However, he consoled himself, saying that since his job was that of a tower farmer, he couldn't expect much from the reward anyway. He went to the dark parts of the cave with a torch and encountered a fish that jumped out towards the flame. Sejun used a club made of green onion stems and leaves to hit it towards the land. The fish died, and Sejun learned that it was a piranha he had killed. The information window informed him that he had gained two experience points for it. This was the fifth fish Sejun had caught, and with that, he now had ten experience points. After awakening as a farmer, Sejun was able to collect experience points. He caught several piranhas every day for several days and reached level 2. He wanted to catch more of them, but he knew it was a bad idea. He thought he shouldn't kill a living thing without reason. Besides, he obtained valuable protein from the fish. If he killed all of them and their population went extinct, he wouldn't be able to eat them again. Sejun roasted the fish and called his friends to eat. The baby rabbits were much hungrier than their parents. They ran towards Sejun, who was like their human uncle, and he gave them fish wrapped in onion leaves. They had grown a little and started eating a lot more than before. Sejun asked them to leave some food for their mom and dad as well. There was another benefit Sejun received from awakening. He could get information about the rabbits. He gave them their share and the rabbits happily accepted it. They were farmer white rabbits and Sejun had a few ideas about how they ended up with him. They were a type of monster he had never heard of outside the tower. Based on their name, Sejun realized that they specialized in farming, not fighting. He thought that this must be the reason they were not wild. Widely known. The rabbits began flirting as they ate, and Sejun watched them, wondering what had happened to them. He assumed that they must have lost their farms, and, after wandering for some time, found this cave and him. He wanted to know if the rabbits had a hometown to return to, but he couldn't understand them, and they couldn't understand him beyond basic farming terminology. Sejun expressed this to the husband rabbit, saying that he wished they could understand each other, but the rabbit didn't understand human speech either, and was confused. Now that they were done eating, Sejun said they should head back to the farm. Today was an important day for all of them, and the husband rabbit was also excited. They reached the farm to find the cherry tomatoes perfectly ripe. Sejun was amazed to see them. They were even better than the tomatoes he brought with him. The rabbits were also pleased to see the red tomato fruits. Sejun grew sentimental as he said that now was the time to harvest them. They had worked so hard to grow them. They had harvested one after the blue moon, but it didn't count. Sejun was nervous as he went to harvest the first tomato. His hand trembled, and the rabbits watched him anxiously too. 
fruit. However, Sejun picked a fruit that easily separated from the branch. He exclaimed that this was his first cherry tomato and it had ripened so well. The tomatoes brought more good news. Sejun saw information windows telling him that he had harvested a well-ripened magical cherry tomato and would receive 10 experience points for it. Sejun was surprised to learn that these tomatoes were also magical, just like the blue tomato. He read their information and discovered that when consumed, this tomato would decompose 10 grams of fat and increase 0.1 MP magic points for 10 minutes. The MP effect could be stacked up to 10 times, with a maximum time limit of one hour. Although this information was impressive, Sejun's name was listed as the cultivator of the tomato, and it was mentioned that it was an E-grade item with a shelf life of 30 days. Sejun was impressed that even though the effect of one tomato was quite small, if 10 of them were eaten together, they could boost MP by one. He wondered if the other tomatoes were also the same, and set out to harvest them. He harvested the tomatoes, and each one was also a ripe magical cherry tomato, except for one that was unripe. He received only seven experience points for the unripe tomato. Sejun was taken aback by his mistake, but he still got seven experience points, and the unripe fruit returned to being a normal tomato. Sejun thought he had harvested enough crops for the day. He took a tomato and said he should have a taste, but the rabbits stomped their feet aggressively, and Sejun looked at them. They were angry, and he apologized. Sejun offered the tomatoes to them, saying they had achieved this together, so they should reap the rewards together, too. The husband rabbit was furious, but picked up a tomato. Sejun said they should celebrate the successful harvest and everyone should eat. When Sejun ate the tomato, his mind was blown. He felt as if he were lying on soft green grass, looking up at the clear night sky. Then, suddenly, a flare flew into the sky and exploded like a firework. Sejun got up and looked at it with his mouth open. The fresh scent of grass and the sweet and sour taste of the tomato mixed with the scent. Sejun felt that this feeling was similar to the fireworks in the middle of a summer festival. Sejun shed a tear of joy as he remembered the summer and felt it in the tomato. The wife rabbit asked her husband if he knew what Sejun was saying, and he had no idea. The rabbits took the remaining tomatoes and stored them in a makeshift storage facility, covering the tomatoes with onion leaves. Sejun lay down and watched them. He thought the rabbit Rabbit kids were now big enough to help their parents. He was ready to sleep on mattresses and use an eye mask, both made of onion leaves. Sejun said they were indeed the children of farmer white rabbits. Sejun knew he should go to sleep now, as he was feeling sleepy, and was sure that when he woke up tomorrow, another wonderful day would greet him. Sejun lay down and immediately began to snore. But then, a quest was issued for him. He must offer 100 magical cherry tomatoes to the tower manager. The reward was a job-related skill, and the penalty was the same as before death. However, Sejun was deeply asleep and did not notice the quest window. Suddenly, it began ringing loudly like an alarm, and Sejun was forcibly woken up. Annoyed, he offered 100 tomatoes to the manager. The manager, satisfied with Sejun's offering, gave him the reward for the quest. Sejun complained that the manager was forcing him to do things, and that he better receive something more useful this time. Upon opening the reward, Sejun discovered that his new skill was Harvest Level 1. This skill enabled him to obtain harvested crops in optimum condition, even if they were slightly overripe or underripe. Initially, Sejun was disappointed and questioned why he needed a harvesting skill. However, as he harvested tomatoes with his husband, Rabbit, he found the skill to be more useful than he initially thought. Whenever he harvested slightly overripe or underripe tomatoes, the skill would activate, perfecting them to their optimum condition. As he did this, the proficiency of the harvest skill increased. Sejun admitted that since he did not have to wait for the cherry tomatoes to ripen, it was easier and faster for him. After they finished harvesting, Sejun told the husband rabbit that they should take the rest of the harvest home. But just then, he received another quest. Sejun had anticipated it, but he was not expecting the quest to have no reward. Sejun called the manager a thief for giving no reward, but since his last reward had helped him significantly, Sejun could at least give him that much. As he offered the tomatoes to the manager, the husband rabbit was shocked, but Sejun did not know that he was entering a vicious cycle. The manager issued quests again and again with increasing demands and greed. The required number of tomatoes kept increasing, and finally, the manager reached new heights of shamelessness. The new quest was triggered, and Sejun had to offer 500 tomatoes to the manager for no reward. The penalty for refusing was still death. Sejun, infuriated, clearly refused to comply. After calmly refusing, Sejun threw a tantrum, stating that the manager had 
already taken hundreds of tomatoes. He needed to eat two, and so did the rabbits. The tower manager replied that it was the farmer's problem, not his, and told Sejun to stop protesting and give him the cherry tomatoes. This irritated Sejun even more. He said that he had worked hard for days and suffered a lot to harvest those tomatoes. The tower manager insisted that Sejun's job was as simple as sowing seeds and asked him not to overreact over something that was not a big deal. This was where the tower manager crossed the line. He should listen to his orders. Sejun replied that this was the reason he was not giving the tomatoes. The manager forcibly made him do this and did not even appreciate his efforts. Moreover, the compensation for the exploitation was also too low. Since it was the manager of the tower, this proved that it was a bad employer. Sejan's words and the hurt in his eyes shocked the tower manager. It hadn't realized this before and tried to apologize, but Sejan was already eating the tomatoes while teasing the manager. The manager got angry, telling Sejan it was upset because he ate the tomatoes himself. The manager threatened to kill Sejan on the spot if he didn't complete the request, but Sejan acted as if the manager was no big deal and gave him just five tomatoes. He said that he would tomatoes, give the rest later since he needed them to feed the kids, too. Behind him, two baby rabbits were fighting for a tomato as their father tried to calm them. The tomato vanished, and the tower manager said that it would compromise this time. Sejan thanked the manager, and the message window vanished. He laughed to himself, realizing that the manager was about to apologize just now. But then he said out loud that the tower manager was simpler than he thought. It is now the 91st day, and the fourth blue moon event occurs. Sejan is sitting in a dark corner eating cherry tomatoes. He had heard that people with high MP could endure the roars of monsters to a certain level, which is why he was eating the tomatoes. Still, he hopes that nothing like the last time happens again. As Sejan wishes for time to pass quickly, his plants begin to gleam in the blue light. Sejan realizes what is going on as the energy of the light enters a tomato, turning it blue. Sejan cannot wait to harvest it, but he notices that the tomato plants are not the only ones being blessed. Even the sweet potato leaves are getting illuminated. The desire to check on them overcomes Sejin, and he walks towards his farm. He digs out the sweet potatoes with his bare hands and is amazed at the results. He now has a blue sweet potato in his hand, filled with the energy of the blue moon. When consumed, it would increase one's strength by 0.5 points permanently. The system window informs him that he has harvested a sweet potato with the energy of the blue moon, which has gained him a lot of experience. The proficiency of the skill harvest has also increased, and now it will be leveled up. Sejun then looks at the blue tomato and harvests it. As he holds the sweet potato in one hand and the tomato in the other, Sejun thinks he is holding the world in his hand. But that happiness is soon disturbed by a quest Sejun was expecting, and there are not one but two quests. Sejun has to offer both products imbued with the energy of the blue moon to the manager. There is no reward for either of the quests, and the penalty is death. Sejun thinks that the manager is really pushing it with two quests at a time. If Sejun refuses, the manager might just kill him this time. However, Sejun has a way to solve this issue. He offers 500 tomatoes to the manager, saying that he needs to complete the previous quest first. The manager quickly accepts the tomatoes and says that he is happy with the cherry tomatoes. But then the manager asks Sejun why he has not given the energy-filled crops to it already. Sejun apologizes for calling the manager simple earlier, asking them to let this slide for today and promising to give them later. The manager sighs and accepts this condition. Sejun then looks at the items in his hands and wonders what he should do with them, and that is not even a question. He tosses the blue tomato into his mouth and shuts shutters. He could feel the summer festival and the fireworks in his mouth again, almost as if it were the first time he ate the tomatoes. The system window tells him that his MP has permanently increased by 0.5 due to eating the tomato. But then he wraps the sweet potato in onion leaves and throws it into the fire. He thinks it would be even better if he had tin foil with him, but the multi-purpose onion leaves are good enough. Sejun is happy and says that the time spent waiting for delicious food is the happiest time. The blue moon pass and the rabbits also come out. They all have questions for Sejun as they see him cooking something. He says that they had great timing as he was just about to call them. Sejun then excitedly says that he presents to them the sweet potato with the energy of the blue moon and its delicious smell makes the rabbits drool. Sejun says that it is not much 
but they should share it. But the husband rabbit stands in front of his family and stops them from taking up Sejan's offer. They are saddened as he tells them something, and Sejan realizes what the rabbit is saying. He wants Sejan to eat the sweet potato himself, as there is only one. Sejan is touched and thanks the husband rabbit for being the only one thinking about it. But even as Sejan agrees to eat the sweet potato alone, he is hiding the fact that he has already secretly eaten it. Sejan peels the sweet potato and takes a bite, but it is too hot, and he burns his tongue, spitting out whatever he just bit. The sweet potato in his hand falls to the ground as Sejan screams about burning his tongue and scalding his palate. The rabbits watch the sweet potato on the ground. The husband rabbit reaches down to grab a piece of the sweet potato, but his children swipe everything before him and then eat it. However, it is too hot for them, and they too spit it out. The baby rabbits start crying, and the husband rabbit is dejected that he got nothing, and that the sweet potato got wasted. This is another entry in Sejan's diary in the tower. He ate a fiery meal today, a little too hot for his liking. A few days later, Sejan is telling the baby rabbits that they are going to plant sweet potato sprouts from now on. The rabbits are confused, and Sejan says that it was the thing they were eating right now. Sejan scolds them and says that the baby rabbits are prohibited from eating the sweet potato sprouts for the time being. These words come as a devastating shock to the rabbits. The sweet potato sprouts have been their favorite snacks lately, and now they are trying to protest against Sejan's decision. All of them have different reactions to the order, and Sejan says that no matter how they complain, his decision is final. He thinks that there will be nothing left to plant if the babies keep on eating the sprouts. Sejun tries to convince the rabbits by saying that they will be having even better sweet potatoes for dinner, but they have to help him plant the sweet potato sprouts before that. In return, he would give them a special snack. Sejan has decided to expand the farm area to cultivate sweet potatoes, and for that, he needs the baby rabbits to cooperate with him. As soon as he tells them about the special snacks, they look at him with drooling mouths and gleaming eyes. Sejan tells them to start working, and the rabbits carry the sprouts to plant them. Their mother is harvesting the green onions, and Sejan asks her to leave one plant. It will then bloom a flower, and Sejan could get seeds from it. He has reached the conclusion that he needs to plant a seed for something to become an item. In the newly expanded farm area, the baby rabbits are hard at work. One of them digs holes, and the other plants the sprouts in them. But in a corner, one of the babies is too greedy to part with his favorite snack. He cannot control his urge and takes a bite of the leaf. Reacting to that, his father smacks him for doing something like that. Sejan is also harvesting the tomatoes, and he gets a lot of messages from the tower system. He has ranked up from an F-rank farmer to an E-rank farmer. His job level has increased, and his job characteristics will be strengthened because of this. Sejan is also glad to know that he has reached level 8. To celebrate, he decides to make the snacks a bit earlier. He takes the cherry tomatoes and puts them on a skewer. At the same time, he gets a message from the tower manager. The manager was keeping an eye on Sejun and what he was going to cook today. The message disappears soon, and Sejun thinks that this was quite a harmless action. He begins roasting the cherry tomatoes and then calls the rabbits to start eating. They leave their work and come running to him, and Sujin presents them with special roasted cherry tomatoes on bone skewers. The information window for the roasted tomatoes also opens. The skewer used by Sejun was made from cleaned piranha bones, and because of the cooking, the tomatoes were softer and sweeter. The rabbits take a skewer each, and they look really excited to eat it. Sejun tells them that it is easy to carry around and eat in this form, but he also warns them that it is quite hot, and they should blow on it before eating. However, the rabbits are already enjoying it. Sejun then says that since the sweet potato sprouts were already planted, they should dig some sweet potatoes for dinner. As Sejun digs the sweet potatoes, he finds five sweet potatoes in a plant. He reads the information about them, and they are called strength sweet potatoes. They have similar effects to the magical tomato, but with strength. Anyone who eats them would gain an additional 0.1 strength for 10 minutes, and this effect can be stacked up to 10 times in an hour. The other effect is that it would break down 10 grams of fat and help with bowel movements, and this bonus would also apply to those who have not awakened yet. Sejun counts that he now has 15 sweet potatoes, which means he got 5 potatoes for each one he sowed, and that is pretty good for a first harvest. But then Sejun spots a fallen potato sprout. He plants it, thinking it would be a waste to leave even a single sprout, but then he gets messages from the system saying that the proficiency 
frequency of the skill sewing is increasing because of this action. Now, Sejun realizes that even this qualifies as sewing, and he also realizes that he must plant all the sprouts himself to increase his skill level. Sejun asks the baby rabbits to stop in a hurry because now he wants to do it himself. Inside its office, the manager tries to replicate what Sejun just did. It has cherry tomatoes on a skewer, and they are roasted over a fire. The manager eats the tomatoes and immediately spits some of them out since they are burned and bitter. But then it ponders what was wrong with its tomatoes. The humans seem to eat them fondly. Then the sweet taste of the tomatoes spreads through its mouth and the manager realizes how delicious they are. Now it uses the magic crystal ball to see what Sejun is doing at the moment. When the manager finds him eating sweet potatoes with the rabbits, it gets angry. It screams, saying, How could those punks start eating sweet potatoes without me? I am the great black dragon alien and Friton. The manager sends a quest to Sejun immediately, demanding one roasted sweet potato. There are no rewards for this quest, and the punishment for refusing is death. Sejun is not in the mood to do the quest and tells the manager to postpone it. The manager is shocked and says that it wants the sweet potatoes right now. If Sejun does not give them, there will be consequences. Sejun says that there is only one sweet potato left. He asks the manager what it could offer in reward. The manager considers it for a while and then revises the quest. A reward is added for another job-related skill. Sejun thinks that this reward is good enough and offers the sweet potato to the manager. He opens the reward and finds that it is a level 1 seed store. When this skill is activated, Sejun can buy a product at the seed shop every 30 days. Sejun is overjoyed. A seed store means that he can purchase things inside the tower that are similar to what other awakened individuals have. He says that this was an amazing reward, and the tower manager should have given it to him earlier. Sejun activates the skill, and the seed store is open. Before that, it checks the transaction history of Sejun and finds that there were no previous transactions. But thinking about the transactions, Sejun arrives at an important question. How should he make purchases when he has no money? But then he gets another message that the store will offer entry-level services to the customer, Sejun. He is the first rookie-tier customer at the seed store, and because of that, a tower coin appears in front of Sejun, and he is shocked. He says that the seed store is the kindest and the best. The tower coin is a currency used inside the tower, but in the outside world, the cost of each tower coin is one million won. Sejun opens the seed store to see what he can buy there. The message window tells him that for the rookie tier, he could see three random types of seeds. And at his current level, Sejun could only purchase one of them. The three types of seeds for this time are shown, and Sejun sees that he can buy 1,000 seeds of either red pepper, cabbage, or carrots for 0.1 tower coin each. Sejun thinks that the name Seed Store is quite fitting as it only has seeds. But then he looks at the price and thinks about the outside world's value of the tower coin. He is getting 1,000 seeds for 100,000 won, which is very expensive. Sejun considers what he should choose. Red pepper and cabbage could be a good combo to make kimchi, but he cannot buy them together, nor does he have the resources to process them here. The only option left is carrots. As soon as he says carrots, the attention of all the rabbits turns to Sejun. He asks them what is wrong, and the rabbits try to tell him that they want carrots. Sejun sees their excited expressions and says carrots again, getting the same reaction as before. He is enjoying this a bit too much, and the husband rabbit kicks him in the face for wasting time. Sejun purchases the carrot seeds for 0.1 tower coin and receives one seed store mile. The mileage can be used to raise the level of his seed store, and he needs 100 points to reach the next level. Sejun receives the seeds in a fancy pouch and thinks that the pouch is more expensive than the seeds themselves. But then he sees a message from the manager, saying that it is satisfied with Sejun's purchase. Sejun makes a face and asks why it is getting satisfied. This is another entry in his diary. Now he has acquired carrot seeds by trading at the seed store. Sejun is excited to plant carrots, and so are the rabbits. But someone else is watching them from a distance. A large and cute bee observes Sejun and the rabbits as they celebrate acquiring carrot seeds. The bee, intrigued by the scene, hovers closer to get a better look at the new seeds and the joyous celebration of Sejun and the rabbit. Then, as the scene shifts, we see the husband and wife rabbits happily singing and lounging beside the area where Seojun had planted the carrot seeds. Observing their joy, Seojun realizes that even though the carrots haven't sprouted yet, the rabbits must have a strong affinity for them. However, he decides to let them enjoy themselves and takes a nap. After waking up, Seojun plans to pollinate the flowers and harvest the green onions. 
As Seo Jun closes his eyes, a baby rabbit also snuggles up and falls asleep beside him, but suddenly he notices a buzzing sound whizzing past his ear. Seo Jun tries to swat away the annoyance without fully waking up, but the buzzing persists. Frustrated, he mutters, why did a bug have to show up now? Curiosity gets the better of him, and he finally gets up to investigate. To his surprise, he finds a giant and adorable bee. The bee gazes at Seo Jun with curiosity, and he stammers for a moment before exclaiming, she's so cute! He assumes that this bug must be a monster in disguise. Seo Jun cautiously calls the bee closer, hoping to identify its monster form. However, his joy quickly fades when he discovers that it is a poison honeybee. Fear seizes him as he reads the name. He turns to ask the rabbits if they know whether the bee is dangerous or not. However, the rabbit couple has already hurriedly retreated with their children to their burrow. They are scared of the poisonous bee, leaving Seo Jun stunned as he watches them flee. He yells at the rabbits, calling them mean, his face contorting as he questions how they could leave him alone like this. Seeking answers, Seo Jun turns to the tower manager, who provides him with more information. The manager explains that poison honeybees are carnivorous creatures that hunt monsters using their venomous stingers. The stingers pose a significant threat, and the manager advises Seo Jun to stay away from them. Seo Jun becomes fearful after learning that these bees feed on meat, causing him to believe that they are no longer truly honeybees. As the bee approaches, Sejan frantically tries to shoo her away, insisting that he's just a bag of bones with no meat to offer. He pleads with the bee, hoping she would spare him, but she continues to draw near. Sejan perceives her as a terrifying monster, his fear growing. In his desperation, Seo Jun fumbles around Around with his other hand, searching for something to defend himself. To his surprise, he grasps a broken branch from a tomato plant, complete with a single flower. Seo Jun swings the makeshift weapon towards the bee, suggesting that she should feast on the flower instead of him. The bee, intrigued, gazes at the tomato flower, and Seo Jun remains apprehensive as she approaches. However, when he opens his eyes, he realizes that the bee was actually feasting on the flower's nectar. Seo Jun is taken aback, but then the bee, with a contented expression, smiles at him. Seo Jun questions the tower manager, asking if they were sure the bees were carnivorous, but receives no response. Then, a realization dawns on Seo Jun. He remembers something quite fundamental. Bees have a fondness for nectar. He cautiously approaches the honeybee and suggests that if she's still hungry, there are plenty of other flowers she can enjoy. Seo Jun encourages her to indulge to her heart's content, and the poison honeybee happily flutters towards the blossoms. Seo Jun smiles to himself, realizing that what he initially feared turned out to be a pleasant surprise. With the bee's presence, he won't have to manually pollinate the cherry tomatoes anymore. His gaze falls upon the rabbit family, hidden behind a rock. Seo Jun gives them a reproachful glance, remarking that they had run away, only concerned about themselves. He questions how they dare to return. The rabbits, attempting to appease Seo Jun anger, cling to him and adopt a cute demeanor. Sejan asserts that he won't stop being mad at them. However, just as he finishes speaking, the poison honeybee returns, having finished her meal. She flies directly towards Seo Jun, causing him to take a few steps back until he's backed against the rock. Seo Jun asks the bee if she isn't full yet, apprehensive about his safety. To his surprise, the bee lands gently on his stomach. Seo Jun, adjusting his t-shirt and stretching a bit, realizes that the bee didn't mean to harm or frighten him. She just wanted to sleep, and Seo Jun finds her incredibly cute even while she's asleep. However, a small part of his mind remains anxious, and Seo Jun asks the bee if she isn't planning to sting him. Surprisingly, the rabbits haven't run away either. Seo Jun realizes that he has another chapter to add to his diary about getting lost in the tower. Today, his family in the dungeon has gained one more member. A few weeks have passed since Seo Jun's first encounter with the bee, and the tomato crops are ready to be harvested once again. The wall where Seo Jun marked the number of days now displays 24 characters. Each character represents five days, which means he has been here for 120 days. We see Seo Jun diligently harvesting tomatoes alongside the wife rabbit, while the husband rabbit tends to the carrot seedling, watering them. The baby rabbits continue to play around, occasionally disturbing Seo Jun as they get too close. He scolds them and instructs them to go somewhere else. The baby rabbits run off without a care, and Seo Jun glances at their siblings, who are engrossed in their own playful activities. Seeing them so carefree, Seo Jun comments that they're having a great time. After all, they should enjoy playing while they're still young. 
The poison honeybee joins Seojun, settling on his shoulder. He asks her if she has had her fill of nectar for the day. As she lands, Seojun reflects that several weeks have passed since the poison honeybee arrived and became a part of their family. He informs her that it will soon be lunchtime, and the bee seems excited, gently rubbing her cheek against Seojun's. He remarks that the poison honeybee has developed a routine. She works in the fields during the morning, collecting nectar, and in the evening she returns to the forest outside the cave. Thanks to her contributions, his workload has significantly decreased. He calls out to the rabbits, announcing that it's time to eat, and they eagerly rush towards him. He believes that the poison honeybee probably won't go back to her original group or hive. Maybe she didn't even have one to begin with. Regardless, she has found her place among their unconventional family, and they have accepted her with open arms. As they enjoy their meal, Seo Jun holds a roasted green onion stem, and the honeybee perches on it. Recently, she started spitting honey, and she continues to do so now. The honey drips over the roasted onion, creating a unique dish called honey onion. The sweet flavor the flavor of the freshly roasted green onion is elevated by the sticky and sweet honey from the poison honeybee. Seo Jun, knowing the secret behind this combination, takes a bite of the honey onion and exclaims, Wow, it's incredibly sweet and delicious. The rabbits also share his delight as they savor the honey-coated food. Seo Jun engages in conversation with the honeybee, expressing his initial fear when he discovered her poisonous nature. However, he quickly acknowledges the positive impact she has had on his life. Thanks to her, he could obtain honey promptly, and she even helped expand his farming field. As Seo Jun relishes the honey onion, he expresses his gratitude to the honeybee for her valuable assistance. He mentions that in a few months, he will consume so much honey that he'll rival the bears in the wild. Suddenly, a message from the Tower Master appears, conveying the Master's joy for Seo Jun's progress. However, as V turns to read the message, it vanishes before his eyes. Several more days pass, and Seo Jun realizes that the blue moon is approaching soon. He reads the characters on the stone wall while the baby rabbits continue their playful antics and munch on food. Seo Jun feels a slight unease about the upcoming blue moon, even though nothing bad has happened during previous occurrences. He understands that anything can go wrong at any moment. Hoping for a safe blue moon this time, he reflects on the fact that it is the 121st day since he got lost and coincides with the day of the blue moon, which occurs every 30 days. Seo Jun is carrying a bag made of onion leaves filled with cherry tomatoes. He puts them inside their usual food hiding place, a rock circle covered with green onion leaves. Seo Jun is also wearing a jacket made of green onion leaves, and he remarks that this much food will be enough. However, his attention is drawn to the rabbit family. The husband rabbit and wife rabbit were trying to tell their children something, and the children were listening attentively. Seo Jun also notices that the rabbits seem especially anxious today. As it is almost time for the blue moon, Seo Jun asks them to go home. However, he stops mid-sentence as he sees the rabbit family huddle up. Seo Jun cannot think of anything that would make them behave so seriously, but they don't appear worried or scared either. Seo Jun is about to ask the rabbits if everything is all right when the rabbit couple suddenly bolts towards their home, leaving their kids behind. They rush inside their house, and Seo Jun is shocked by their actions. However, the rabbit couple turns back and waves at their children. They utter words that Seo Jun cannot comprehend, and with that, they quickly shut the door, leaving Seo Jun in a state of shock. He is astounded by what he has just witnessed. Seo Jun questions how the parent rabbits could leave their little ones exposed during the blue moon. However, before he can finish his sentence, the blue moon event commences. The moon eclipses the sun, casting a blue light that blankets the world. Seo Jun catches the sound of a menacing creature's roar emerging from behind him, leaving him speechless. Anxious, he slowly turns around to witness a sight that will forever be etched in his memory. To his astonishment, the noise intensifies, growing into louder roars and growls. But they are not originating from an external source. The source of the cacophony is none other than the baby rabbits. They no longer resemble their once adorable selves. Now they have undergone a startling transformation, turning into ferocious monsters devoid of reason. Seo Jun watches in silent disbelief as the baby rabbits, now towering and monstrous, have increased in size. Their fur has turned white, their eyes burn red, and they possess menacingly sharp claws and fangs. As the baby rabbits roar, Seo Jun finds himself questioning the reality of the situation. Seo Jun, left bewildered and confused, exclaims, What on earth is happening here? Unable to make sense of the situation, he believes that his fate, 
is sealed. However, in a sudden twist, something completely unexpected occurs. The rabbits begin to emit a brilliant purple light, dazzling in its brightness. The radiance becomes so intense that Seo Jun is forced to shield his eyes, closing them tightly. Gradually, as the light subsides, a remarkable transformation takes place. The baby rabbits undergo a mesmerizing evolution, gradually growing and maturing until they resemble their parents. Four of them take on the appearance of white farming rabbits, while one stands out in striking contrast, its fur a deep pitch black color. As the rabbits frolic and bounce about in sheer delight, Seo Jun stands there, mouth agape, utterly astounded by the incredible sight unfolding before him. In a state of shock, Seo Jun asks them if they have become adult rabbits now, and the rabbits happily affirm this. Seo Jun now realizes that it must be a part of the farmer rabbit's growth cycle. It is the fourth blue moon night since they were born, and Seo Jun wonders if this is some kind of coming of age ceremony. Suddenly, Seo Jun reflects on how he thought something was wrong with the rabbits. He covers his face with his hands and starts sobbing. Seeing this, the rabbits are all shocked and worried. The black rabbit tries to console Seo Jun, wanting him to not be sad anymore. When Seo Jun sees this gesture, he realizes that the rabbit's nature is still the same as before. Seo Jun becomes overwhelmed by the cuteness of the rabbits who have just reached adulthood. He stops behaving sadly and starts calling the rabbits little cute things. He even wants to give them retribution kisses, which makes the other rabbits run away. Finally, the blue moon passes and everything returns to normal. After that, the husband rabbit opens the door and his wife is just behind him. They see that their kids have grown up and they are currently sitting around a fire with Seo Jun. Seo Jun waves to them and the husband rabbit cannot stop smiling. The couple rushes to their kids and they hug them tightly. Seo Jun fondly watches the heartwarming scene unfold. He wonders if he should prepare a coming-of-age feast for the rabbits as a gift. However, his attention is drawn to one rabbit who excitedly raises his hand and says something. Seo Jun watches him carefully, and then, out of nowhere, a shovel appears in the rabbit's hand. The rabbit proudly displays it, and Seo Jun is surprised to see it. He asks what they all have because it's not just one rabbit, all his siblings have something. Seo Jun observes that one of the rabbits has gotten a sickle and a bandana. Another rabbit has acquired a cart and is happily hauling his black rabbit brother. One of the white rabbits had a watering can and the rabbit with the shovel was the first to show his tool. The rabbits are glad to have their tools and affectionately show them off, while their parents enthusiastically clap for them. Seo Jun realizes what has just happened. The rabbits can summon items. He understands that when the rabbits become adult farmer rabbits, they can have their own tools, but Seo Jun can't use those tools. Then suddenly the white rabbit with the cart accidentally drops the black rabbit. Seo Jun, puzzled by the turn of events, wonders why the black rabbit isn't summoning his own tool like the others. Determined to prove himself, the black rabbit summons his tool, much to Seo Jun's surprise. The tool that materializes is a massive wooden hammer, towering in size, especially for a rabbit. Seo Jun finds himself questioning why the black rabbit possesses such an unusual tool that doesn't seem like a typical farming implement. However, the black rabbit displays plays a hint of defiance, subtly conveying that he is no ordinary rabbit. Seo Jun takes notice of the rabbit's distinctiveness. While he could easily identify his siblings as white farmer rabbits, this particular rabbit stands apart. He is a warrior, Black Rabbit. Catching Seo Jun's mention of his name, the Black Rabbit winks mischievously, adding an air of intrigue to the situation. After a while, the rabbits begin working on the farm. Now the children are also working as diligently as their parents and sometimes even outperforming them. The rabbit with the watering can supports his father in watering the plants. The one with the sickle swiftly cuts the green onions, impressing her mother with her skill. The rabbit with the cart carries tomatoes, while the one with the shovel digs holes for new crops. Then the rabbit with the cart arrives, pushing a cart filled with ripe tomatoes, and Seo Jun instructs the rabbit to place the tomatoes in a nearby heap. As he sees the rabbit's work, tears of joy forms in his eye, witnessing how the once cute little babies have grown up so well. However, Seo Jun notices that the black warrior rabbit is lying beside him, happily munching on tomatoes without a care in the world. Seo Jun realizes that this particular rabbit doesn't have a specific job at the moment. Curious, 
he strikes up a conversation with the Black Rabbit, mentioning that as a warrior rabbit, his role would typically involve fighting. But since they are in the cave, there are no monsters to battle against. Seo Jun understands that without any threats to the farm, the Black Rabbit doesn't have a clear purpose. The Black Rabbit acknowledges this, feeling a little disappointed. Seo Jun admits that even the Black Rabbit's mighty hammer wouldn't be of much use in farming tasks, and wonders what they should do next. However, to Seo Jun's surprise, the Black Rabbit eagerly comes up with an idea and gestures excitedly. The Black Rabbit leads Seo Jun to a pond within the cave, pointing towards it with enthusiasm. Seo Jun exclaims, realizing the brilliance of the idea. Hunting fish in the pond can be considered a different kind of battle, and this way the Black Rabbit can also contribute in a helpful way. Then, Seo Jun comes up with a plan. He will use a torch to lure out the fish from the pond, while the Black Rabbit will be in charge of catching them. Seo Jun asks the Black Rabbit to show off his warrior skills, and the rabbit eagerly agrees. Seo Jun waves the torch near the edge of the pond, and suddenly a piranha leaps out of the water, drawn towards the flame. Seo Jun tells the Black Rabbit that it's his moment to shine, and the rabbit jumps up with his mighty hammer. With a powerful swing, the Black Warrior Rabbit strikes the fish, sending it flying through the air. The fish crashes into the cave wall with a tremendous impact, leaving Seo Jun astonished by the result. He witnesses how the Black Rabbit's attack completely shatters the fish, turning it into mush. Bits of fish meat scatter in all directions, and only the head and bones remain intact. The Black Rabbit turns back, giving Seo Jun a thumbs up, unaware of the mess he has created. Seo Jun is utterly shocked by the outcome, and his reaction is completely justified. Later, when he presents the fish at dinner, it dampens the mood. A sense of disappointment hangs over the dinner table, and both Seo Jun and the Black Rabbit feel disheartened. Even the other rabbits are not too pleased about having to eat a fish in such a state. Seo Jun tries to console the Black Rabbit, assuring him that he will get better with practice. He encourages the rabbit not to be sad and to enjoy the food. Gradually, all the rabbits start adjusting to their roles, including the Black Warrior Rabbit, who becomes more adept at catching fish after his initial failure. He can now swiftly catch fish with just his hands, and Seo Jun cheers him on. The other rabbits are also occupied with their respective tasks, and everything is going smoothly. Another day dawns, and it marks the arrival of the 125th day. The one-month waiting period to open the seed store has finally passed, and Seo Jun feels a surge of excitement as he sees the store open its doors once again. He eagerly wonders about the different types of crops that will be available this time and which option he should choose. The system window appears before Seo Jun, notifying him that, at his current level, three random seeds are being sold today. However, he can only purchase one of them. The options presented to him are as follows. 50 sweet pumpkin seeds for one tower coin, 10 watermelon seeds for five tower coins, and 200 waxy corn seeds for 0.5 tower coin. Seo Jun is taken aback by the list of seeds this time, noting that the prices are much higher compared to the previous offering. He realizes that he only has 0.9 tower coins remaining after purchasing the carrot seeds last time. With this amount, Seo Jun can only afford to buy the waxy corn seed. He ponders over what he should do if the seed prices continue to rise. Worries fill his mind as he fears that he won't have enough money to buy anything the next time the seed store opens. Moreover, he feels stuck without any means to earn more money in this place. Seo Jun recalls that there were three ways to acquire tower coins within the tower. The first method involved receiving rewards for clearing a floor, but those rewards were only given once as a first clear bonus, and hunters didn't earn substantial profits from it. The second method entailed hunting monsters and selling their body parts. The monster parts could be sold to traveling merchants or the store on the first floor, and it was the best way for hunters to earn money. They could keep selling these parts to make a continuous profit. Another method was completing quests and receiving rewards for them, but it was more uncertain. The rewards varied a lot, so it was hard to know how much money could be earned. Seo Jun thinks about his situation. Two of the options were not possible for him. He couldn't leave the tower, so clearing the floors was out of the question. That meant the only way he could make money was by completing quests given by the tower manager. 
Seo Jun calls out to the tower manager, asking if it can hear him. He requests to be rewarded with tower coins for completing quests now. The tower manager replies, saying it doesn't understand what Seo Jun means, but it promises to give him whatever he asked for when he grows up. Seo Jun is confused. The tower manager doesn't seem to know about tower coins and says it will give them to him when he's older. Seo Jun then asks how long he has to wait until he's considered a grown-up. The tower manager says he should be at least 300 years old. Seo Jun feels frustrated and expresses his anger towards the tower manager, questioning if it is playing a joke on him. He insists that he needs to keep a record of all the tower coins he is supposed to receive and pass on this information to his future children. Seo Jun imagines a chain that spans 300 years, with his seventh generation grandchildren eventually receiving the tower coins on his behalf. He expresses his frustration towards the manager, as this condition leaves him with no chance of even having children of his own. However, the tower manager remains unresponsive to Seo Jun's outburst and the message windows suddenly disappear, showing its disinterest in continuing the conversation. Seo Jun realizes that getting angry won't help his situation. Instead, he decides to focus on what he can do in the present moment to improve his chances of comfortable survival. Seo Jun understands that he can only afford to purchase the waxy corn seeds at the moment, and he believes it's a good choice. Corn can be delicious when steamed or grilled, and Seo Jun even considers grinding it into flour to make something like bread, although he's not sure if the idea will work. Determined, Seo Jun selects the option to buy the corn seeds. The system confirms his purchase of 200 waxy corn seeds, deducting 0.5 tower coins from his seed bank account. Additionally, Seo Jun has earned 5 seed miles, which he can use to level up the seed store in the future. A new cooldown period begins, and the system notifies Seo Jun that he will be able to access the seed store again in 30 days. In the meantime, a cloth pouch filled with corn seeds descends into Seo Jun's hand. He opens the pouch and takes a handful of seeds, showing them to the husband rabbit. Seo Jun asks for his opinion on the seeds, wondering if they look good. The husband rabbit affirms that they are indeed of good quality. Seo Jun suggests that they begin their work, and all the rabbits happily join him. However, before they start, Seo Jun interrupts himself and suggests that they have something to eat first. They roast the fish and enjoy the tomatoes as side dishes. Seo Jun finally satisfies his hunger and declares that he can't eat anymore. He decides to dry the remaining fish and store it for later. The rabbits, too, are full and relax around the fire with Seo Jun. Suddenly, the poison honeybee approaches Seo Jun and he warmly welcomes her. He asks if it's all right for her to stay in the cave instead of returning to her home. The honeybee smiles and affectionately rubs her cheek against Seo Jun, indicating that it's okay for her to stay permanently. Seo Jun is delighted by this. But then the honeybee's antennas sense something, and her expression turns serious. She flies up and faces the entrance with a determined look. The black rabbit also prepares himself with his hammer, sensing the presence of an intruder. Seo Jun notices the movement and exclaims that someone is definitely there. The black warrior rabbit expresses his anger towards the intruder, and the intruder responds, asking everyone not to misunderstand him. He clarifies that he is not a shameless cat who came to steal their food. Seo Jun is taken aback by the fact that the intruder is a talking cat and wonders how that is possible. The black rabbit and the poison honeybee are ready to fight while the other rabbits are frightened. Seo Jun asks the cat why he has come here and the cat jumps down and lands in front of him. The cat is wearing a cape and carrying a small bag. He stands up and extends his paw for a handshake. The cat asks if Seo Jun is the customer Park Sejin and introduces himself as the traveling merchant Theo. But Seo Jun was confused to see a talking cat. The black warrior rabbit behind him remains suspicious of the cat. However, Seo Jun recalls hearing that sometimes people meet traveling merchants as they ascend the tower, but he wasn't expecting the merchant to be a cat. Seo Jun finds the cat merchant quite adorable, with his big, shiny eyes, soft and chubby cheeks, and the jelly-like paws of his outstretched hand. Seo Jun can't help but imagine those jelly paws kneading on him, and being a cat lover, he feels excited. As the cat merchant tries to talk with Seo Jun, he tries to act cool and confident in front of him. Seo Jun asks the merchant what he wants. Theo explains that he heard about a new rookie who made transactions in the seed store, and he is here to greet Seo Jun and make some deals with him. Seo Jun is curious about the deals and asks Theo for more information. Theo rummages inside his bag and begins to explain, but before before he could show him anything, his stomach growls loudly, making him nervous. 
He apologizes to Seo Joon, admitting that he hadn't eaten anything that day, and that's why he ended up showing an embarrassing image to a customer. Theo nervously laughs about the silly incident while Seo Joon stares at him curiously. Suddenly, a mischievous grin appears on Seo Joon's face, hinting that he may have something up his sleeve, perhaps a plan to take advantage of the cat merchant. Seo Joon, with a bright smile, offers him a roasted fish. Seeing the fish, Theo is was shocked that a loud mew came out of him. His eyes glisten, mouth drools, and ears twitch as he gazes at the delicious roasted fish. Seo Joon insists that Theo should not decline the offer, but Theo manages to control his hunger and tells Seo Joon that it's all right, as he cannot touch a customer's food. Seo Joon is slightly taken aback by Theo's response and tries to convince the cat merchant once again. He asks Theo if he really doesn't want to eat the fish, describing the irresistible smell of tender, grilled meat, and emphasizing that it has the distinct fishy flavor that cats can't resist. Holding Theo's shoulder, Seo Joon insists that it's obvious Theo wants it and can have it. As Seo Joon persuades him further, Theo can't stop drooling, trying his best to resist but eventually giving in to temptation. He eats a lot and finally feels satisfied, expressing his fullness while happily laying down and holding a fishbone. Seo Joon tends to the fire, mentioning that it must have been really hungry since Theo devoured the fish. Theo sincerely thanks Seo Joon, feeling grateful for the treat and wondering how he can repay him. Seo Joon smiles, saying it was no big deal and that he should be the one thankful, considering that Theo came all the way to meet him. Then, as Theo was about to talk about the deal he mentioned earlier, Seo Joon suddenly asks him for 0.5 tower coins. Confused, Theo asks for clarification, and Seo Joon playfully replies with a smile, stating that he should pay for the roasted fish he just ate. Theo, panicked and in shock, asks Seo Joon if the fish was not for free. Seo Joon responds that nothing in this world is ever free, and since Theo came to make a deal, he shouldn't expect to eat the customer's fish and run away. Theo becomes nervous as he notices the black rabbit and the poison honeybee ready with their weapons, while even the farming rabbits stand prepared to confront Theo if he tries to leave without paying. With tears in his eyes, Theo reluctantly pays 0.5 tower coins to Seo Joon, and Seo Joon thanks him. Then we see the cat depressed, kneeling beside Seo Joon, and Seo Joon is happy as he finally earns some tower coins. Then we see the cat crying and thinking that he came to earn money from Seo Joon as a customer, but ended up paying him instead, and his business has already started at a loss. However, he regains control of his emotions and becomes determined not to be defeated. He decides that he will sell all his items here. Theo loudly declares that it's his turn now and requests that Seo Joon examine his items. He opens the cloth bag and unfurls it to display the luxury items he has. With pride, Theo showcases the three items on the cloth, each with its price displayed on an information window. The first item is a tumbler worth five tower coins, followed by a mini fan also worth five tower coins, and lastly, a portable hand warmer of the same value. Seeing the items, Seo Joon asks if these items are from outside the tower, and the cat proudly declares that they are. Theo starts describing the items, saying that the tumbler has preservation magic which can maintain the temperature of the things kept inside, whether hot or cold. He then highlights the mini fan's wind magic enchantment, demonstrating how it gives cold wind by pressing the buttons. Seo Joon stares at Theo in disbelief and apologizes for interrupting him, but he feels compelled to tell him the truth about the items he is selling. Seo Joon explains that all the items Theo brought are actually trash. Upon hearing this, Theo became very angry. He shouted at Seo Joon and asked him what he was talking about. He insisted that these items were from outside the tower, and how could someone not recognize their value? He expressed how much effort it took him to collect these items. Seo Joon calmly explained to Theo that he is also someone who is from outside the tower, and the terrible truth dawned upon Theo as he realized he had been scammed. Seo Joon patiently explained that there is no magic in the items Theo was trying to sell. The tumbler simply prevents heat transfer by blocking contact with the outside, and the portable fan and hand warmer operate on batteries. If they are used for only a few hours, their batteries will run out. Seo Joon pressed the buttons on the fan, demonstrating its lack of power, leaving 
Theo feeling even more disheartened. Theo, now angry and frustrated, accused Seo Jun of lying. He insisted that the person who sold these items to him claimed they had magic inside. However, the fan was about to stop as the battery had run out, and Seo Jun pointed out this fact to Theo. Frustrated, Theo started hitting the fan in an attempt to get it working again, but Seo Jun reassured him that he had indeed been scammed by the person he purchased the items from. Theo sank into a more depressed state, unable to believe that someone could be so unkind to him. Then Theo started crying loudly, saying that Scarum was a bad goblin and began beating the floor in frustration. Seo Jun felt bad for Theo and tried to comfort him, urging him to share what happened in the background. The sad cat merchant began his story. He explained that he was from the 75th floor of the tower, which was one of the tower's neutral zones. For a long time, he had been in love with a cat named Merrill, who was the most beautiful girl in their Grainer village. Finally, one day, he gathered the courage to propose to her in front of everyone. As the villagers cheered him on, Theo expressed his feelings to Merrill and asked her to date him. He even presented her with a bouquet of fish, something he thought she would appreciate. However, Merrill showed no interest and displayed her disgust at the modest bouquet Theo had offered her. She slapped it away, saying that the smell of cheap rice fish disgusted her. This hurt Theo deeply, as he had worked hard to get those roasted rice fish. But then another shock awaited him. Then someone stepped forward and told Theo to know his place, questioning how dare he try to win Merrill over. As Theo turned back, he saw Orin, the son of the richest cat in the village. Orin was well-dressed and carried a big, beautiful fish as a gift. Orin laughed at Theo, mocking him for giving a low-grade rice fish to a lady. He suggested that Theo should have brought at least a high-quality salmon as a gift, and with that, Orin presented the salmon to Merrill. Merrill appeared happy upon seeing it. A flustered Theo stammered, trying to explain that Merrill didn't even like green greasy food because she was afraid of gaining weight. However, Merrill spoke for herself and expressed that the fish was indeed beautiful. Shocked and heartbroken, Theo heard those words. Orin had his arm around Merrill and was taking her to his home to enjoy the salmon properly, and she seemed content to go with him. Theo desperately pleaded with Merrill to wait, grabbing her arm to stop her. From his perspective, it felt like a scene from a heartbreaking story. He saw himself as the protagonist, the poor but handsome cat, while the woman he loved was being swept away by a rich suitor. Theo poured out his heart, reminiscing about the moments they shared and the memories they made together. However, Merrill coldly dismissed his feelings, telling him not to get ahead of himself. She claimed that she had only smiled at him out of politeness and that he had imagined a deeper connection. She cruelly stated that she despised poor cats who smelled like cheap rice fish the most, pointing directly at Theo. Devastated and speechless, Theo's world crumbled around him, sinking into a pit of despair. Merrill was taken away by Orin, the son of the richest cat in the town, and Theo ran away crying. He made the decision to leave his village and become a traveling merchant. Determined to become rich one day and seek revenge, he vowed to rise above his circumstances. As Theo finished telling Seo Jun and the rabbits the first part of his story, they felt nervous and sorry for him. Seo Jun especially felt guilty for scamming Theo. Theo explained that he had gone through the necessary procedures and spent his lifelong savings of 50 tower coins to obtain his traveling merchant license and other important documents. He had planned to use the remaining five tower coins to buy something from the peddler to resell. However, that was when he got scammed by Scarum. Theo recalled how Scarum, a goblin, approached him and asked if he was a new wandering merchant. Scarum told Theo his name and offered to provide him with information. Naively believing Scarum, Theo engaged in a conversation with him at the inn. Scarum talked about items from outside the tower, claiming they were precious and could fetch a high profit on the upper floors where creatures collected such things as a hobby. Theo wondered why Scarum was selling these valuable items at a low price, and Scarum replied that it was a goodwill gesture from a senior merchant training a junior. Convinced, Theo quickly bought the items, hoping to resell them at a higher price. Scarum even gave Theo a bonus, a piece of paper with a map indicating the location of a new user of the seed store. Scarum told Theo that he could potentially make a great profit from this new member. However, Theo soon realized that even that information was not a true bonus. 
he regretfully handed over all his remaining money to Scarum and purchased the items. With high expectations, he embarked on his journey while starving himself along the way, hoping to make a significant profit. But his hopes were dashed, and he barely ended up here. As Theo tells this to Sejan, he feels quite sad and starts rolling on the floor, crying. He laments that all the items turned out to be trash, and that the customer took his remaining money by tricking him with fish. He cries, expressing his frustration at not being good at anything. Sejan initially thinks that Theo is quite a pushover, but then he gets an idea. He remembers something that could help him earn tower coins. Sejan smiles and tells Theo to calm down, offering to share some roasted fish to cheer him up. However, Theo, having learned from his previous experience, suspects that Seo Jun will ask him to pay for the fish later. He refuses, stating that he's not foolish enough to fall for the same trick twice. Sejan assures him that he genuinely wants to give it to him for free, even considering the five fish Theo ate earlier as just a treat. Theo looks at Seo Jun with hopeful eyes, asking if he truly means it. But Seo Jun makes it clear that this act of kindness is not without conditions. He asks Theo if he would be willing to work with him in exchange. Seo Jun smiles and asks Theo for his thoughts. In that moment, Seo Jun adds one more chapter to his diary about getting lost in the tower. He met a partner today who was a bit of a pushover. Then we see Seo Jun asking Theo if he would like to work with him. Seo Jun believes that Theo will agree because he thinks Theo is just a pushover. Theo is shocked and asks Seo Jun if he really meant what he said. Did he genuinely want them to work together? Seo Jun confirms his intentions, expressing that he wants a good merchant to sell his items. However, Theo doesn't believe Seo Jun. With drooping ears, he considers himself a noob who is completely useless. But Seo Jun tells Theo that despite making mistakes, he still possesses some qualities of a decent merchant. Seo Jun smugly smiles and explains that Theo touched his heart with his story, which is why he wants to become business partners with him. Surprised, Theo awaits further details about the business partner deal. But before Seo Jun explains, he signals to the rabbits to show their hospitality to the merchant. The husband and wife rabbit pair create chairs from onion leaves and set up an umbrella, creating a beach-like atmosphere. They even wear garlands made from tomato flowers. Seo Jun, sipping from a bottle made of onion leaves, enjoys the moment. The rabbits fan them, providing a relaxing experience. Seo Jun then reiterates what Theo told him about his desperate situation, taking a deal from a shady merchant and being scammed. He explains that Theo doesn't have any money to buy goods to resell. Seo Jun excitedly proposes a business partnership, suggesting a win-win situation for both of them. Seo Jun offers to provide Theo with his products, which Theo can sell to other people. In return, Seo Jun would receive a percentage based on the amount Theo sells. Theo asks about the incentive, and Seo Jun explains that Theo would need to sell the goods above the marked price. The more Theo sells them for, the better the incentive would be. Seo Jun believes in Theo's ability to sell the items for a higher price and offers him a 35% incentive on the selling price. Meanwhile, the Black Rabbit tries to roast a fish. Theo is appalled by the offer, thinking the 35% incentive is too low. He believes the conditions are unfavorable for him. He angrily sips from his glass, thinking that Xiao Jun took him for a fool. He refuses to be deceived. But before Theo can express his decision, Seo Jun has another important thing to tell him, the most crucial part. Seo Jun asks the rabbits to bring something, and we see them returning with a bunch of delicious roasted fish. Seo Jun reveals that there is not only a reward, but he will also pay Theo 10 fish or their equivalent value in coins every week. Theo is absolutely amazed by this offer. Seo Jun explains that these are all the terms and conditions of the contract. Theo's mouth starts watering as he asks Seo Jun if he was serious about the roasted fish. Seo Jun then asks if Theo wants to sign the contract right away. However, Theo is not easily convinced. He remembers the past incidents when he was betrayed by others like Merrill and Scarum. He knows he has to be clever to avoid being deceived again. But the temptation of the fish is hard to resist. Theo wipes the drool off his face and says he will consider it if Seo Jun offers him 20 fish per week instead. Seo Jun, with a mischievous grin on his face, remarks that Theo is quite persuasive. He tells Theo that he is feeling generous and, in addition to accepting his request, will add five more fish. Theo is shocked to see a stack of 25 grilled fish right in front of him and can't help but continue drooling. Then, Seo Jun adds another bonus to the contract. Theo can eat as much fish as he wants while he's working with Seo Jun. Seo Jun reiterates the terms one more time, and Theo can hardly believe his ears. He is filled with excitement, completely forgetting about any past doubts or concerns. Seo Jun asks if Theo has a piece of paper, and Theo quickly produces one. Seo Jun takes the paper, writes down the terms of the contract, and signs it as 
Party A. Theo places his paw on the paper representing Party B. Seo Jun announces that the contract is now complete. Theo realizes that he was so thrilled that he didn't even realize he had signed the contract. He is astonished as the contract floats up into the air and disappears. The contract has been finalized and accepted by the tower as an agreement. An information window appears, displaying all the details of the contract. The contract states that it is a lifetime distribution agreement starting immediately. Theo will be responsible for selling Seo Jun's products for the rest of his life and bringing back the profits. The compensation remains as mentioned earlier, 25 grilled fish per week, or their equivalent value in coins along with an additional 3-5% of the sales as an incentive. The contract also includes some special clauses. As part of the initial deal, Seo Jun will provide Theo with his crops to sell. The contract will be terminated if the sales amount falls below 5 tower coins in one month. Theo is expected to sell the crops at a price above the marked price. He is also prohibited from making any additional contracts without Seo Jun's permission. Lastly, Theo must speak with a cat's accent while selling the items adding a touch of uniqueness to the arrangement. Seo Jun was delighted to have the contract signed, recognizing its importance as one of the most significant documents in the tower, not easily destroyed. On the other hand, Theo felt devastated, questioning why he had agreed to such conditions in his first contract. Curiosity got the better of Theo, and he asked Seo Jun about the fourth condition in the special clauses, particularly the one about speaking with a cat accent. He found it embarrassing to use the accent from his village. Seo Jun chuckled and assured him that he would understand the reason when the time came. Seo Jun extended his hand for a handshake, but Theo slapped it away, still expressing his doubts. However, Seo Jun reminded him of the first condition in the special clauses, which stated that the contract would be terminated if the sales fell short. Seo Jun patted Theo's head, having faith in him as a reliable and resourceful merchant cat. Hearing himself being called resourceful brought a smile to Theo's face, and Seo Jun thought he was quite straightforward. Curiosity piqued, Theo inquired about the products they would be selling. Seo Jun confidently revealed that they would be selling cherry tomatoes. Theo looked puzzled, but Seo Jun handed him a freshly picked cherry tomato. To Theo's surprise, it turned out to be a magical cherry tomato that could temporarily increase MP, magic power, by 0.1 for 10 minutes. Theo asks Seo Jun about the selling price for the cherry tomatoes, curious to know how much they plan to sell them for. Theo thinks that if he's lucky, he might be able to get 0.01 tower coins per tomato from the new people entering the tower. However, Seo Jun replies that they want to sell them for 0.05 tower coins per piece. Theo is shocked to hear the price, believing that only an idiot would buy them at such a high cost. But then Theo realizes that the high price might actually work in his favor. If he fails to sell enough tomatoes to earn five tower coins in one month, his contract would be terminated. Additionally, he could enjoy grilled fish during that time. Curious about his initial sales trip, Theo asks Seo Jun how many tomatoes he should take with him. Seo Jun suggests taking 1,000 tomatoes. Seo Jun has already prepared a basket containing the 1,000 tomatoes and even arranged for the payment of 25 grilled fish. However, Seo Jun wonders how Theo plans to carry all of it. Theo reveals his special item called the Bundle, a cloth with space expansion magic, preservation magic, and the ability to make things lightweight. He explains that he can store all the items in his bundle, keeping them in their original state for extended periods of time. Theo throws the cloth over the tomatoes and fish, and with a touch of magic, they are stored inside the cloth, transforming it into a small pouch. Seo Jun exclaims how convenient it is. As Theo gets ready to leave, he assures Seo Jun that he will return. Seo Jun and his friends wave goodbye to Theo as he departs, wishing him the best of luck on his sales journey. A few days later, Theo arrived on the 38th floor of the tower, where an intense battle was taking place. A group of awakened individuals were locked in combat with a gigantic spider monster. The spider screeched loudly as the fighters strategized, determined to defeat it and prevent its escape. The spider launched its attacks at the hunters, but their leader skillfully blocked its assault with a sturdy shield. On the sidelines, the magicians cast fireball spells, diverting the spider's attention. Seizing the opportunity, their leader delivered a decisive strike, swiftly beheading the spider with a powerful blow. This leader was Kim Dong-shik, the esteemed leader of the Phoenix Guild. His team erupted in cheers, expressing their confidence in his ability to finish the battle with a single strike. However, Kim Dong-shik humbly downplayed the praise, urging everyone to remain focused on the aftermath. It was time to clean up the area and take care of the necessary tasks following the battle. He notices a woman named Jessica and sternly reminds her not to 
slack off, emphasizing that he won't tolerate any attempts to run away like she did last time. However, Jessica responds by playfully flirting with Dong Shik, expressing her affection for him. Dong Shik ponders how to handle the situation with Jessica, but his attention is suddenly captured by movement in the nearby bushes. Reacting swiftly, he switches into battle mode, drawing his sword and demanding to know who is lurking there. To his surprise, it turns out to be Theo emerging from the bushes. Theo confidently approaches the group and offers to showcase his merchandise. Dong Shik and his team are taken aback by the sight of a cat functioning as a traveling merchant. As Theo greets them, some of the members comment on his cuteness, leaving Theo astonished. One of them even admires his adorable paws. Seo Jun had told Theo that using the accent from his village would help attract human attention, and now Theo realizes that it indeed worked. He takes out the cherry tomatoes from his bag and presents them as his offering. However, the humans seem underwhelmed by the sight of the cherry tomatoes. They express their disappointment, stating that if Theo intended to sell food in the midst of a battle, he should have brought something more substantial like meat or bread. Cherry tomatoes simply weren't satisfying enough to eat during such intense circumstances. Observing their skepticism, Theo couldn't help but mutter, Foolish humans, I knew they would say that. He firmly believed that the magic of the cherry tomato surpassed their expectations. He suggested they check the status window for confirmation, recalling that a girl with pink hair had done so earlier. According to her findings, consuming just 10 G of the cherry tomato would result in permanent fat reduction. Upon hearing this revelation, a wave of fervor swept through the group, and they immediately rushed towards Theo, eager to purchase the coveted cherry tomatoes. Meanwhile, back at the cave, Seo Jun continues to harvest more tomatoes. He has just leveled up, earning a bonus stat. The wife rabbit accompanies him, and he asks her if Theo is doing well at the moment. Seo Jun speculates that the cat must have already encountered some hunters by now. At first glance, the magical cherry tomatoes seem to primarily boost magical power. However, upon closer examination, it became evident that they offered an even greater benefit. Consuming a tomato would dissolve 10 grams of fat and rejuvenate the body. Seo Jun realizes that these tomatoes are the perfect diet food, without any apparent side effects. He firmly believes that they will sell a significant amount, as he trusts that people are in need of effective diet solutions. Theo, on the other hand, is astonished to see that he has managed to sell all the cherry tomatoes. He is unsure how to react to this overwhelming success. Seo Jun stares at the sprouted carrot seedlings, lost in thought. He inquires, was it about 70%? And the husband rabbit standing beside him seems to agree that out of the 1,000 carrot seeds Seo Jun had purchased from the seed store and subsequently planted, only 700 had germinated. However, he starts pondering the possible reasons for the observed germination limitation. He wonders if the cause could be his low proficiency level as a farmer, or perhaps the fertility of the cave land was insufficient. Despite these considerations, Seo Jun decides to persevere with his current methods, optimistic about the prospect of finding a more effective cultivation strategy later. With Theo now on their side, ready to sell the harvest, he recognizes the importance of maximizing crop yield. The husband rabbit seems to be in agreement with him. Suddenly, Seo Jun's attention is diverted. He turns back to identify the source of the disturbance. He observes the black warrior rabbit tossing a torch up into the air by the lake. As the torch nears the water's surface, piranhas leap out. The black rabbit was anticipating this, springing towards the fish and striking Striking each one with his hammer. Safely landing on his two feet, he catches the falling torch. Everyone watches in awe as he skillfully hunts. Seo Jun compliments the black rabbit, stating he's improved significantly in his hunting skills. Noticing the rabbit's body gleaming, Seo Jun realizes the black rabbit is leveling up. He congratulates him, expressing this was the first time he has witnessed such an event. While he had frequently observed the white farming rabbits level up during farming, seeing a black rabbit do so was a rare occurrence. He pats the rabbit's head and reassures him he is gradually becoming a true hunter. The rabbit, pleased with himself, flaunts his achievement before his clapping siblings. As the rabbits play, Seo Jun suggests they take a short break. During this intermission, he proposes they drink coffee. Seo Jun, clutching the tumbler he had received from Theo, appears delighted. Upon opening it, his suspicions about the presence of coffee inside are confirmed. Stuffed inside the tumbler are multiple sachets of coffee, much to Seo Jun's delight. He believes that Theo and Scarum, the goblin who scammed him, 
had omitted something very important. They hadn't opened the tumbler. If Theo had known and tried to sell the coffee to him, Seojun admits he would have spent all his money just to acquire it. Tearing open a packet, Seojun can't help but thank them for their oversight. Because of their ignorance, he's acquired a valuable item for free. Seojun empties the coffee powder into his water bottle. Even though they lack the tools to boil water or make ice cubes, he comments that simply having coffee in this place is a luxury. While he can't make regular coffee or iced Americano, at least he has coffee. Seo Jun then convinces the poison honeybee to spit some honey into the water bottle, thanking her. After a bit of mixing, he finally creates his coffee. Seo Jun christens this concoction as Honey Americano, a blend of coffee powder dissolved in the cave's cool water and mixed with the poison honeybee's thick honey. He praises it as a perfect harmony of bitter and sweet tastes. According to Seo Jun, a single sip of this drink can alleviate fatigue and hunger. Upon taking a hearty sip, he finds it to be quite delicious. He then offers the coffee to his rabbit companions. The black rabbit is the first to try it, but is immediately overwhelmed by the bitterness and too stunned to react. The other rabbits, curious about the taste, also find the drink too bitter for their liking. Seo Jun just laughs as the rabbits spit out the coffee, suggesting that their tongues might be more sensitive to bitter tastes than humans. However, he then notices something unexpected. He spots the honeybee flying towards a hive inside the cave. When Seo Jun calls out to her, the bee excitedly shows him her hive. He asks her if it's really a beehive, and the realization hits him a moment later. The poison honeybee is finally moving in with them. He asks for confirmation, which she provides. Seo Jun and the rabbits are delighted by the news. Seo Jun mentions how saddening it was when she had to return home each night. Now he finally feels that they are a family. On this joyous occasion, Seo Jun wants to throw a party, but suddenly he receives a message from the tower manager. It's a quest asking for 10 magical cherry tomatoes. While there's no reward for completing this quest, the penalty for refusal is disappointment. Seo Jun is taken aback by this new type of quest. He speculates that because he kept postponing the quests, the tower manager might have realized something after witnessing his deal with Theo. Seo Jun snickers, thinking that the tower manager isn't threatening him anymore, but instead making a rather pitiful request. Feeling somewhat sorry for the manager, Seo Jun decides to give some of his tomatoes to fulfill the quest. He hands over the tomatoes, and the tower master gratefully accepts them, even thanking Seo Jun. Taken aback, Seo Jun smugly states that it was satisfying to see the manager express gratitude, but he suddenly realizes he acted submissively just now now. Upon recognizing this, V becomes dejected, and he doesn't notice the husband rabbit sipping coffee calmly behind him. Elsewhere, in another floor of the tower, a goblin sets a drink on the table. The goblin is revealed to be Scarum, the one who scammed Theo. Scarum is irritated that the pushover cat hasn't returned yet, and his friend asks if he's referring to Theo, who purchased his items last time. Another friend admires Scarum's cunning for selling low-quality items by deceiving the cat and expresses a desire to learn similar tricks. One of them then asks Scarum why he's looking for Theo. Scarum begins to explain his reasons. He says that the cat spent all his money to buy items from him, and he's worried because the cat hasn't returned, even after a considerable amount of time. He argues that by now Theo should be back to complain that he couldn't sell the items. His friend asks him if he's genuinely worried, and what he would do if Theo did return. Scarum replies that, as a good guy, he wouldn't be able to pretend not to see Theo. He would buy the cat a glass of milk, inform him about a big opportunity, and then lend him some money to take advantage of the opportunity. The other goblins are surprised, but then Scarum discloses his true plan. He mentions that the poor cat would have to work very hard to repay the loan he would take from him at a high interest rate. He predicts that Theo will be unable to repay the debt or the ever-increasing interests. Then, Scarum makes a menacing expression, stating that Theo would become his slave until his death. In the end, the other goblins praise Scarum as a genius. One of them suggests that he should find Theo as soon as possible, as it's not easy to find such a pushover. But Scarum laughs confidently, replying that they still have plenty of time. He advises his friends not to chase their prey recklessly, impressing the other goblins with his carefree attitude. Scarum then suggests that they should check today's wandering merchant sales ranking. The other goblin also comments that it's about time for it to be updated. They open the information windows in front of them, which display the ranks of wandering merchants according to their sales. 
Scarum sees that he has reached the 999th rank and is pleased to finally make it into the top 1,000. His friends are amazed to see him in the top 1,000 as they aren't even ranked yet. Scarum laughs inwardly, believing that it was worth selling those items to the naive cat. But what he saw next left him bewildered. He saw Theo ranked 982nd, and the other goblins began whispering, Isn't that the cat we were just talking about? Suddenly, Scarum screamed and slammed his hand on the table, demanding to know how Theo had achieved such a high rank in such a short time. The scene then shifted, revealing Theo's return to Seojun. Seojun shouted at Theo, asking where he had been for so many days. Theo, with a panicked expression, apologized and promised that even if he sold out next time, he wouldn't play on other floors. Seojun, shocked, asked for how many days Theo had been playing, to which Theo replied, four days. But Seojun is surprised by something else. He'd assumed that it would take a few days to sell everything, but Theo returned to the cave within 14 days. Considering the 10-day trip and four days of playing around, Seojun realizes that Theo must have sold out as soon as he reached the 30th floor. Seojun places his hand on Theo's shoulder, making a scary and menacing face. He tells Theo to reveal all the details if he doesn't want to see Seojun's wrathful side. The cat is too terrified to do anything else, so he tells Seojun and the rabbits everything that happened. Seojun asks if the hunters really bought everything after just a little bit of talking. He's in disbelief, but Theo exclaims that it was exactly as he said. He hands over the bag containing 50 tower coins to Seojun, who verifies them properly. He then addresses Theo as the cat merchant employee, commending his good work. Seojun also gives him his incentive, two tower coins. But Theo is shocked, asking Seo Jun if he wasn't the resourceful sales cat, Theo. Seo Jun coldly tells him that he's been demoted. He critiques Theo's salesmanship, pointing out that it took him four days to return after selling out. But then, Seo Jun adds that if Theo works hard the next time, his position as the sales cat will be reinstated, and he will raise the incentive to 5%. Theo says that he understands, and promises to work hard to become a salesperson. Then Seo Jun asks Theo why he's always talking in his cat accent now. Theo says that he has decided to live this way since humans seem to like this side of him. Seojun laughs, saying that everyone will soon know his name. When Theo asks him what he means, Seojun explains that the farmer's name is displayed on the status window of the cherry tomato. That's why people will soon recognize him as the person who cultivated the magical cherry tomato. These words scare Theo enough to make his hair stand on end. He suddenly realizes that he's in trouble. There's a system in the tower that hides the origin of goods beginner wandering merchants sell, protecting them from wealthy traveling merchants who might steal their suppliers. And because Theo is still a beginner wandering merchant, Seo Jun's name was forcibly hidden from the Cherry Tomatoes status window. Theo worries that Seo Jun will be furious when he learns the truth. He fears that he might be demoted from his post as an employee to an intern, or he might even become a part-timer. Theo is scared, and when Seo Jun asks him what he's thinking, Theo plays it off, saying nothing is wrong. He asks Seo Jun to hand him the Cherry Tomatoes so he can go sell them right away. Seo Jun tells him it's too soon, and that Theo should rest for a few days. He also needs to receive his weekly payment. But Theo, eager to sell more tomatoes, insists that he should work as everyone else is busy. Theo rushes to the rabbit carrying harvested tomatoes and starts putting them into his bundle, shocking the rabbit. His reason for this is to remove the restriction on displaying the cultivator's name from the status window of the goods. And there's only one way to do that, is to earn 1,000 tower coins and become a mid-level merchant. The scene then shifts to a large building on Earth, where a group of people are gathered. Upon closer inspection, it turns out they are the adventurers of the tower from the Phoenix Guild, the same group to whom Theo sold the magical cherry tomatoes. One man is trying to convince his friends of something, but they are skeptical, claiming what he tells them is impossible. As they continue their conversation, the leader of the Phoenix Guild, Kim Dongshik, receives a call on his smartphone. It's a message from his daughter, telling him how effective the cherry tomatoes he brought for her were. Her friends were envious, and now she wanted more. The message asks her father to buy more for his darling daughter. Touched by his daughter's words, Dong Shik is moved to tears. The man next to Dong Shik asks what's wrong, and in response, Dong Shik shares his daughter's story. She usually grumbled about everything due to her struggles with her diet, but today, she was happy and expressed her love for him. He then confesses that he only bought 20 pieces of the cherry tomatoes the last time, leaving the rest for his teammates. 
He hadn't anticipated his daughter would love them so much. Otherwise, he would have bought all of them. Another man asks if he's referring to the cherry tomatoes sold by the wandering cat, wondering why the girls are so obsessed with them. However, another man testifies about the charm of the cherry tomatoes. He had been seeing a girl and gifted her the cherry tomatoes, which apparently boosted their relationship significantly. His friends are shocked and can barely believe his story. One of them mentions that he also bought the cherry tomatoes and still has some left. Two others immediately enter a bidding war for the miracle fruits, each wanting to purchase the remaining fruits. One even offers to buy each fruit for 100,000 won. However, Dong Shik interrupts them, insisting they can't continue like this. He orders his men to summon the rest of the team. They're going to the 38th floor right away. Although Dong Shik is serious, his underlings are confused. They argue that it hasn't been long since their last expedition and that launching another one would incite complaints from many people. Just as they are voicing their concerns, the female members of the team enter the room declaring they are ready to go. The male members look around to see Jessica and the other girls eager to embark. They're dressed to accentuate their slim waists, striking poses to emphasize their weight loss. One girl admits they've already prepared the tower coins to buy cherry tomatoes, though she corrects herself to say they've collected coins for the expedition. Jessica makes a similar slip. With this affirmation, Dong Shik commands his team to follow his lead. The boys are eager to embark on the expedition, and the girls are equally excited about acquiring the cherry tomatoes. As Dong Shik leads his group, he resolves to secure the magical cherry tomatoes and become a great dad, no matter what it takes. Next, the scene shifts inside the tower where Theo is navigating the middle levels, contemplating when he will reach his sales target of 1,000 tower coins. He looks rather disheartened and tired. Theo notes that he can only store 150 cherry tomatoes in his bundle, and even if he sells out completely, he will have to travel back and forth more than 10 times to reach his goal. Theo decides to set aside these complex thoughts for now and concentrate on maximizing his earnings. He is currently on the 38th floor, the same spot where he encountered the human party last time. Theo wonders if this was the place where the humans had gathered previously. He scans the area for them, but instead, they find him first. They spot him and excitedly alert their comrades about the wandering merchant cat. Surprised, Theo asks the man in front of him if they are looking for him. The man confirms this and adds that they've been waiting for him on this floor for the past three days, unsure when he might return. He inquires if Theo has the magic cherry tomatoes with him again. Theo is taken aback as the man explains they've braved the dangerous area for three days just to buy the cherry tomatoes. The man asks Theo if the price of the cherry tomatoes is still 0.05 tower coins per piece. However, seeing the opportunity to earn more, Theo promptly informs the man that the price of the tomatoes has increased. Upon hearing about the price hike, the man is shocked, and his reaction draws Dong Shik's attention. Dong Shik approaches and asks about the new price. Theo informs him that it's now 0.07 tower coins per tomato. Despite his calm exterior, Theo feels nervous inside, wondering if he's raised the price too much. To his relief, Dong Shik is undeterred by the new price and expresses his desire to buy 200 fruits, dropping a pouch of tower coins before Theo. Even the other team members deem the price to be fair, arguing that such a valuable item shouldn't be sold cheaply. They also express their fear of missing out on the opportunity to purchase the cherry tomatoes, as they have no idea when they'll next be available. They then begin placing their orders. Soon enough, Theo sells out once again. He is pleased, yet surprised at the ease with which he sold everything. His basket is empty, and in front of him are pouches full of tower coins. Despite the increase in price, all 150 cherry tomatoes were sold out in a flash. Dong Shik asks Theo when he will appear again. Theo inquires if Dong Shik would wait for him in the same place, adding that if that's the case, he could return in about 10 days. Dong Shik is pleasantly surprised by this response, commenting that 10 days is a perfectly reasonable time to regroup after completing a quest. He assures Theo they'll return to buy more cherry tomatoes in 10 days. Following this exchange, Dong Shik instructs his team to prepare, stating they will now finish the spider quest and make their way out of the tower. The team members are ready for action. Theo, on the other hand, chuckles inwardly, realizing he has found regular customers. Gathering 1,000 tower coins and becoming a mid-level merchant now seems within reach. 
His plan is to reveal Sejun as his vendor after amassing the coins and reclaim his title as the sales cat. Just as Theo is about to leave, a group of excited girls interrupts him, calling him Mr. Cat. Curious about their intentions, Theo listens as the girls chatter among themselves. One of them remarks that they look really similar, which another girl agrees with. Theo, however, interrupts them to clarify that his name is not Mr. Cat, but Theo. The girl in front apologizes and introduces herself as Suha. Theo then asks her what she meant by them looking alike, and Suha responds that Theo resembles a cat she knows. Theo tells her she must be mistaken and claims he's the only handsome cat in the world. He turns to leave, stating he's busy, but Suha frantically searches through her purse and asks him to wait a moment. She pulls out a long red packet from her purse and Theo wonders what it is. Suha asks if he'd like to eat churu, a famous Korean cat snack. As he opens his mouth to take a bite, Theo asks what churu is mentioning he usually only eats grilled fish. He cuts himself off mid-sentence, overwhelmed by the deliciousness of the snack. He holds it in his hands and can't stop licking it while asking what flavor he's eating. Although it smells like fish, it has a nutty taste and melts in his mouth. Having quickly finished the packet, Theo asks Suha if she has more. She reveals she has other flavors, and he excitedly asks her to give him more. Suha agrees on the condition that he take a photo with her. Unaware of what a photograph is, Theo readily accepts the proposal in exchange for all the churu packets. Suha takes out her smartphone, instructs Theo to look at the screen and say, Peace! and they pose for the photo. Theo leaves happily, licking the churu packets, while Suha waves him goodbye. Her friends are surprised, noting it's the first time they've seen someone bring cat snacks inside the tower. They ask Suha if she found Theo cuter than expected. Another girl mentions it's nice to see Suha smiling so brightly and asks if she'll return to see Theo next time. Suha smiles as she looks at the picture she clicked with Theo and says that she will surely come again. Now we are transported to the scene of Seo Jun's cave. The black warrior rabbit is in the water and Seo Jun is encouraging him, giving him special swimming training. Other rabbits are also watching the black rabbit from the sidelines. Seo Jun instructs the rabbit to relax his body and extend the floating tube made from green onion leaves forward. The rabbit follows his instructions, and Seo Jun commends him for doing a good job. For safety reasons, Seo Jun explains, he's temporarily blocked the holes from which the piranhas come. Even though he's checked the effectiveness of his block a few times, he admits he's still nervous. The black rabbit has become good enough, and now Seo Jun wants him to practice swimming without his floating tube. Seo Jun notes that this is a significant development compared to the time when the black rabbit almost died from jumping into the water in excitement after leveling up. Seo Jun was astonished, fearing the rabbit was going to be eaten by piranhas. Seo Jun recalls the terrifying scene, the black rabbit floating on his belly in the pond, unconscious, and Seo Jun panicked. The mother rabbit was so frightened for her child that she fainted, but fortunately the piranhas did not attack. Seo Jun says that just thinking about that incident makes his heart skip a beat, and the black rabbit nervously laughs. With the black rabbit out of the water now, his siblings are taking turns learning to swim. Sejin, tired after playing in the water, expresses his desire to eat something sweet. He reaches into his bag to find his stash of honey, only to discover that the bottle is empty. Sejin has already consumed all the honey he collected last time. Thinking about the honey, Seo Jun is reminded of the poison honeybee who hasn't emerged from her hive since setting it up in the cave a few days ago. Seo Jun wonders if something happened, but then he sees something that shocks him. Around the hive, there are numerous small poison honeybees. Seo Jun reads their information window, stating that they're the offspring of the poison honeybee. Seo Jun is surprised. It's been a long time since he last checked on the honeybee, and now there are so many children around the nest. Seo Jun wonders if all these babies are the offspring of the honeybee he knows. He hadn't even noticed them before today. After some thought, Seo Jun decides that since he hasn't seen the bee for a while and because she now has kids, kids, he needs to congratulate her. Glancing at his tomato fields, Seo Jun declares that he can't visit her without a gift. He then takes the only gift he can afford in this place, tomato flowers. However, the baby poison bees grow curious when they see Seo Jun approach their nest. Seo Jun calls out the honeybee and asks if she could come out for a moment. He's holding a bouquet of tomato flowers in his hand, and two rabbits are with him. Seo Jun explains that he has a housewarming gift for her, but then he suddenly notices that the baby bees look aggressive. Their eyes are glowing red, and they're angrily flying towards Seo Jun. The farmer rabbits flee when they see the bees approaching them. Seo Jun is taken aback and the black rabbit summons his hammer to fight against them. Seo Jun questions the bees about their intentions, urging them not to proceed with whatever they're planning, as they are not enemies. As he speaks, 
Someone inside the hive appears to be listening to him. The baby bees look menacing and threatening, and the black warrior rabbit is prepared to battle them. Seojun instructs him not to fight the bees, but he recognizes that it may be the only way to protect themselves. The bees, enraged, charge at Seojun. He closes his eyes, anticipating their stings. But then the baby bees abruptly halt. Seojun opens his eyes and spots a creature he doesn't recognize. A large bee-like figure with a crown on her head is flying toward him. Seojun, taken aback, questions whether she could possibly be the poison honeybee he knows. A creature that resembles an anthropomorphized honeybee, encircled by the baby bees that are indeed her offspring, responds to Seojun's query in her own language. Seojun can read her information window. She's a poisonous queen honeybee. Seojun can only gawk at her, mouth agape, and the reaction from the black warrior rabbit is the same. Seojun wonders if she could truly be the honeybee he knows. The scene changes, and we see the tower manager looking very nervous, with sweat sparkling on her face. She was carefully reading a book called Ultimate Guide for Tower Managers. In the book, it said that poison honeybees were not your usual insects, but scary monsters who hunted other creatures for food. But there was no information about a poison honeybee being friendly with a human or even transforming into a human-like creature. She shook her head, puzzled, thinking, then why is this poison bee behaving like this? She then turned to look at her crystal ball. In it, she could see Seo Jun and the honeybee staring each other. She decided she would watch them closely for now and would ask her wise grandpa later about this weird thing happening. Back at the scene, Seo Jun was really surprised. The poison honeybee had transformed into a gorgeous humanoid bee, and even the black rabbit was stunned. He was so shocked that his warhammer slipped from his paws, his mouth hanging open in surprise. Seo Jun, pointing at the bee, asked, Are you the same little poison honeybee? The bee gave him a big, cheerful smile and nodded. Listening to this, everyone's eyes widened even more. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. The black rabbit, with his mouth open from the start, made his mouth even bigger. Seo Jun, still stunned, whispered, You have changed so much. In response, the human-like poison bee posed cutely. She bent one of her legs, put her hand near her mouth, and then, with a mischievous sparkle in her eye, winked at Seo Jun. Then the story about how the little bee became like this begins. After the day the little bee first drank nectar from Seo Jun's cave, she started experienced sudden changes in her body. With each sip of the nectar she drank, these changes grew more noticeable. Her body emitted a strong scent that made other bees uncomfortable, and she also gained a significant amount of weight. Even the queen bee of her colony became wary and began acting aggressively towards her. It didn't take long for the little bee to realize why everyone was treating her differently. She had developed the ability to lay egg. Although this discovery surprised her, she saw it as an opportunity to become independent. Leaving her old hive behind, she decided to create a new one inside Seojun's cave, as she believed it to be the safest place. Within her new hive, the bee silently endured the pain for many days. Finally, after several rounds of transformations, she evolved into the human-like form we see now. She herself was taken aback by her appearance after the final transformation, realizing she had become a queen bee. Returning to the present, Seo Jun, with a smile on his face, congratulates the bee on becoming a queen. He acknowledges that the timing might be a little awkward, but he has brought a gift for her. As Seo Jun presents her with a bouquet of tomato flowers, the queen bee is deeply moved. She gazes at the flowers and her eyes shimmer with delight. Overwhelmed with happiness, she dashes towards Seo Jun and tightly hugs him, beginning to rub her cheeks against his, just as she used to do when she was little, while the other bees watch in curiosity. Then, after seeing their mom being so friendly with the Seo Jun, the baby bees thought they should do the same, and they flew up to him, cuddled up, and started to make him their new friend. At first, Seo Jun was taken aback, but soon he got used to it. The baby bees also started being nice to the rabbits. While the queen bee was still hugging him, Seo Jun gently patted her head and told her that he liked them too. A few days passed since this strange thing happened. We see Seo Jun sleeping deeply, but the black rabbit tries to wake up Seo Jun by attempting to remove his onion blanket, while the husband and wife rabbits shout from a distance. Still half asleep, Seo Jun's eyes slowly open and he finds the baby rabbits holding his hand, trying to lead him somewhere. The husband rabbit, with an excited expression, points towards something, a blue carrot. It seems that the blue moon has passed, while Seo Jun slept through the night this time. Upon witnessing this, Seo Jun drowsily gets up, 
as he and all the other rabbits gather around the magical blue carrot. He comments that he thought the blue moon wouldn't affect the crops this time since they were still small. However, it appears that it did. Nonetheless, he sees it as a great opportunity to harvest it early. As the rabbits excitedly stare at the carrot, Seo Jun realizes that this is why they disturbed his sleep and rushed him. Determined, he decides to harvest the carrot, pulling it out from the ground. The husband rabbit can't contain his excitement and starts jumping around joyfully. Seo Jun firmly grasps the carrot and pulls it with all his strength, instantly yanking it out of the ground. A bright smile lights up his face, and the rabbits stand there in awe, their mouths wide open with excitement. The carrot was a decent size. When Seo Jun checked its information, he found out it was a magical carrot called an agility carrot. The blue moon had given the carrot a special power. Anyone who ate this carrot would permanently boost the agility stats by 0.05. Seo Jun enters a deep thought, realizing that the carrot has an E-plus rank, and he received 70 experience points instead of the usual 50 for harvesting it. His proficiency with his level 2 skill harvest also improved significantly. Then, after a while of thinking, he sat down with the rabbits and told them that he didn't deserve the carrot. They were the ones who worked hard to grow it. He gave them the magical carrot. Upon hearing this, the rabbits became very happy, and Seo Jun thanked them for their help and asked them to keep helping him in the future. Then we see the white rabbit holding the magic carrot, while the mommy rabbit and the black rabbit stare at it, their eyes twinkling. Suddenly, one of the baby rabbits with a sickle offers to split the carrot for everyone. The husband rabbit throws the carrot into the air, and with a swift move, she starts chopping it into seven equal parts. The other baby rabbits watch with drooling mouths wide open in anticipation. As the sickle rabbit lands back on the ground, the equal portions of carrot fall into each rabbit's hands. Seeing this, Seo Jun compliments the sickle rabbit's skill, and she proudly stands with a victorious pose, holding a piece of carrot while the other rabbits applaud for her. Then we see the sickle rabbit happily enjoys her portion of carrot, savoring each bite. However, the black rabbit pouts, feeling that his piece is smaller than the others. Next, Seo Jun proceeds to harvest the cherry tomatoes that have been blessed with the energy of the blue moon. He gently places the five tomatoes in a tray made of onion leaves, remembering that the tower manager had given him a quest to offer a blue cherry tomato. This seems to be the perfect opportunity to fulfill the quest. When he called the tower manager, the blue magic tomato vanishes from Seo Jun's hand, indicating that the quest has been completed. The manager accepts the tomato and expresses gratitude towards Seo Jun. Seo Jun then suggested that if the manager was really grateful, she should give him a special skill as a reward. The tower manager said she would think about it and give him something later. But Seo Jun was curious about what she meant by thinking about it. Just as he was about to ask more, he was interrupted by a loud yell from Theo. Seeing Theo, Seo Jun got excited and called out his name. But he saw Theo was surrounded by the baby poison bees who looked like they were ready to attack. Theo was standing still, his claws open, looking very scared. The black rabbit was just watching without doing anything. Theo asked Seo Jun to tell the bees not to hurt him. Seo Jun then realized that Theo wasn't there when the poison honeybees hatched. That's why they didn't recognize him, and he wondered if the bees saw him as a threat. Then Theo started acting like a scared cat puffing up his tail and hissing at the bees, while the bees, with fear in their red eyes, were preparing to attack. To solve the problem, Seo Jun picked up Theo and started rubbing cheeks with him, trying to show that Theo wasn't an enemy but a part of their family. While Seo Jun continued rubbing his cheeks, Theo complained that it tickled. Then, seeing this, the baby honeybees decided Theo was their friend too and they all calmed down and moved away. But then, Seo Jun sneezed because some of Theo's fur had gotten into his nose. Then, Theo thanked Seo Jun for saving him and started calling him brother. Surprised, Seo Jun pulled on Theo's cheek. He asked why Theo was calling him brother all of a sudden. Seo Jun joked that he was the boss and Theo was the worker. They weren't the same. Theo, cheeks stretched by Seo Jun's playful gesture, explains that Seo Jun had mentioned they were family. However, he apologizes for getting ahead of himself and admits that his cheek hurts now. Seo Jun lets go of his cheek and then gets down to business. With a serious expression, Seo Jun stretches his hand and asks Theo, referring to him as an employee, to show him the money earned from the sale of cherry tomatoes so they can begin the calculations. Theo, still rubbing his sore cheek, hands Seo Jun a swollen pouch. When Seo Jun opens the pouch, he is surprised to find it filled with tower coins. After counting them, 
he concludes that there are 75 tower coins. Seojun compliments Theo for working hard, acknowledging his efforts. But Theo has another surprise in store. With a proud face, he excitedly shows Seojun another pouch and proudly announces with a bright smile that the people had been waiting to buy the cherry tomatoes for a long time. He charged the humans an extra 0.02 tower coins for the cherry tomatoes, and they still bought them. Then, Seojun looked into the second bag with a serious face. Theo eagerly asked if he was surprised. He proudly said he knew he did a good job and asked if he could now be called Sales Cat Theo. However, Without directly answering that question, Seo Jun hands Theo his incentive. He said Theo had worked hard, so here was a bonus. He gave Theo two tower coins and called him employee again, but this time with a smile on his face. Theo, feeling sad, asks Seo Jun if he can be given another title since he has worked so hard. He wonders why he cannot be granted the title of salesman cat. Seo Jun gently explains to him that he is still far from reaching that position and would need to work even harder to achieve it. Listening to this, Theo becomes disheartened, and the black warrior rabbit offers comfort by rubbing his back. Theo vents his frustrations, expressing how difficult it was to become a sales cat. Then we see Seo Jun was secretly smiling, thinking something. He already knows that Theo sold the tomatoes at a higher price, thanks to the tower manager's intervention. The tower manager had been spying on Theo and provided Seo Jun with information about the cat merchant making more money per piece of cherry tomato. Seo Jun smirks realizing that he should reward the tower manager with another blue moon fruit for such valuable intel. However, Seo Jun's attention is diverted by slurping sounds. He turns to find Theo sitting contentedly, holding a cat treat and slurping it with delight. Theo looks extremely happy and satisfied. Intrigued, Seo Jun asks Theo what he is eating. Theo replies that it's called a churu. Seo Jun is surprised and asks where Theo got the churu from. To his surprise, a baby rabbit behind him also starts slurping on a churu. Theo proudly shows Seo Jun a bag full of cat treats, explaining that he received them from a human after taking a picture with them. He continues to share that the cat treat he is currently enjoying has the taste of chicken, but the ones that tasted like salmon were his favorite. Seeing this, Seo Jun was really surprised. He thought about what Theo said. A human had given those snacks to him. There were only two ways to bring items from outside the tower. The first was vanishing the method Seo Jun used to enter the tower. When newcomers entered this way, they brought whatever they were carrying with them inside. Since they were initially summoned to the first floor, the items they brought were mostly used for trade, helping them progress through the tower. The second way to bring things inside was when an awakened hunter brought something in. It was known that only one kilogram of outside material could be brought inside the tower, but there were no restrictions on the amount they could take when leaving the tower. Usually, hunters brought along essential items such as a hunter's smartphone, also known as a hunter phone. It was a device that could be charged using solar power, which was abundant in the tower's ever-sunny environment. Though it had basic features, it was a dependable tool and a necessity for all hunters. Sometimes, they would also bring things like cigarettes and instant foods, which they could eat while they were trying to get higher in the tower. But to bring something like cat snacks, which they didn't really need, seemed like a fancy thing to do. As Sejun thought about why a hunter would bring cat snacks before he can finish his thought, a great idea crosses his mind. He gives off a wicked and twisted smile, thinking that he is a genius. Meanwhile, Theo, observing Seo Jun smiling maniacally to himself, wonders if Seo Jun wants some of his churu. Nervously, Theo stretches out his hand and asks Seo Jun if he would like to have some. Then we see Seo Jun giving an annoyed look to Theo, and he swiftly snatches the churu from Theo, declaring that he is confiscating it. As a result, Theo falls onto his butt from the sudden force. Theo, determined to retrieve his churu, grabs and pulls Seo Jun's shirt, pleading for it back. He explains that he earned it after taking a picture with the human girl, and Seo Jun replied with anger, That's exactly the problem. You made a deal with that human girl for a photo, and with an angry expression, asks Theo to stop pulling his shirt, as it may tear. Seo Jun explains that he only has one pair of these t-shirts. With tears in his eyes and still gripping Seo Jun's shirt, Theo listens, as Seo Jun explains that in condition number three, it clearly stated that Theo was not allowed to make any deals with others without Seo Jun's permission. Seo Jun points out that Theo's actions have breached the contract. 
Theo becomes nervous and scared, realizing his mistake, and expresses that he didn't realize it and did it unintentionally. However, Seo Jun, speaking in a calm voice and wearing a smile, pats Theo's head. He addresses Theo as Sal's cat Theo, telling him not to be disappointed. Seo Jun advises Theo to forget about this incident and focus on finding new clients instead. Hearing this, Theo expresses surprise and asks if he has been promoted from an employee to a sales cat. Seo Jun clarifies that he is granting Theo this position temporarily for a few hours. If Theo performs well during this time, he may have the opportunity to become the sales cat permanently. Upon hearing this, Theo's face lights up with joy and excitement. He energetically raises both his paws upwards in celebration. Seo Jun, filled with a sense of affection and playfulness, scoops up Theo in his arms, holding him gently like a newborn baby. Seo Jun then places Theo on his lap, cradling him in his arms with care. He asks Theo if he enjoys the warmth of the fire. Meanwhile, one rabbit begins to fan Theo with a fan made of onion leaves, while another rabbit holds a piranha and approaches the sickle rabbit. The sickle rabbit skillfully chops down the piranhas, and the husband rabbit wraps the chopped fish onto onion leaves. Next, Seo Jun gently places Theo down on his lap and opens a packet of churu with a warm smile on his face. He assures Theo that he can relax now and enjoy the churu. Theo eagerly watches as Seo Jun tears open the churu packet. Seo Jun personally starts feeding Theo, gently patting his head with affection. The rabbit with the fan watches the scene unfold, smiling at the heartwarming moment. As Theo happily enjoys the churu, he wonders if being a sales cat allows for these special privileges. Seo Jun then addresses Theo as Sir Sales Cat and asks if he is enjoying the churu. Theo replies with a happy face and extended arm, expressing his delight and mentioning his desire to eat grilled fish as well. As we see Theo sitting on onion leaves, happily enjoying his churu, Seo Jun starts grilling some piranhas, assuring Theo that the fish will be ready in just a minute. Seo Jun once again addresses Theo as Sir Sales Cat. Curiously, Seo Jun turns around and asks Theo how he managed to reach the 38th floor without fighting any monsters. With a proud expression, Theo replies that it's because he has a wandering merchant license. Seo Jun is intrigued and asks Theo to explain what that is. Theo points to a coin-shaped object on his neck, explaining that it is a badge of a wandering merchant. He further elaborates that one needs to pay a certain amount of tower coins annually to maintain the status of a wandering merchant. The higher the level, the more money one has to pay, but they also receive more benefits. Having the Wandering Merchant Badge offers certain protection, such as not being attacked by monsters. Seo Jun asks Theo if he can bring other hunters with him using his Wandering Merchant Badge without the monsters attacking them. Theo replies that he cannot. He explains that he is the only one in possession of the badge, which means that monsters will still target any other hunters present. He further clarifies that even if he were to accompany the hunters, it would be of no use. This is because all merchants use a special wandering merchant portal that only those with a badge can access. Theo himself utilizes this portal to travel between floors. Without it, traversing between the 38th floor and their current floor would take an extended amount of time, possibly months. Out of curiosity, Seo Jun then asks, Months? Which floor is that? Theo calmly replies, It's the 99th floor. Seo Jun's mind goes blank, and he stands frozen like a statue. Theo notices Seo Jun's reaction and reiterates, We are currently on the 99th floor. It seems Theo assumes that Seo Jun didn't hear him the first time. As the realization sinks in, Seo Jun's silent expression turns into terror. His eyes widen in shock, and his legs begin to tremble uncontrollably. He falls to his knees, leaving Theo deeply concerned. Theo asks if Seo Jun is all right and what is happening to him, but Seo Jun's condition is so severe that he cannot hear Theo's words. Panic starts to creep across Seo Jun's face as his mind races with thoughts. Since Theo was able to travel swiftly between the 38th and their current floor, Seo Jun begins to fear that this floor might not be higher than the 40th floor. As Seo Jun's mind races with thoughts of being trapped on this floor for a lifetime, he becomes lost in his fears. Meanwhile, Theo continues calling out Seo Jun's name, desperately trying to get his attention. Seeing that Seo Jun is unresponsive, Theo takes drastic measures. With frustration and anger on his face, Theo slaps Seo Jun's face and starts squeezing it, demanding that Seo Jun wake up. Theo's voice trembles as he explains that their hard-earned payment has been reduced to ashes, pointing towards the piranhas that are now being burned. Then we see Seo Jun sitting beside the fire, once again grilling the piranhas. 
His thoughts are consumed by the idea that it took hunters years to clear just two floors. Is he truly destined to be stuck on this floor for a lifetime? Lost in contemplation, Seo Jun's attention is suddenly drawn to Theo's commanding voice from behind. Theo, in a bossy tone, addresses himself as Sales Cat Theo and gives Seo Jun an order. He instructs Seo Jun to grill the fish properly this time and not to let it burn like the last time. Seo Jun listens to Theo's command, glancing at him with a sidelong look. In a bossy tone, Seo Jun responds to Theo, informing him that one hour has already passed. Shocked, Theo's pupils widen as he realizes that time has passed much more quickly than expected. With a disappointed expression, he laments, what a shame. Suddenly, a great idea dawns on Seo Jun as he looks at Theo's wandering merchant badge. In his mind, he envisions a scene where several hunters are injured and frustrated, not knowing what to do. Seo Jun appears in his imaginary thought, wearing a black hat, old-fashioned clothes, and a large bag on his shoulder. Theo, raising both his hands, greets the hunters and tells them to come, signaling that help is on its way. As Seo Jun and Theo strike a majestic pose, with one hand on their waist and the other on their forehead. A wave of excitement ripples through the crowd. Shouting with sparkly eyes, they declare that it is the legendary wandering merchant, the tower farmer Seo Jun, accompanied by his partner, the orange cat Theo, purchasing all of Seo Jun's vegetables. Seo Jun, with two full bags of tower coins in hand, and many other bags being offered to him by the other hunters, finds himself overwhelmed by the transactions. Meanwhile, Theo tries his best to manage the group of enthusiastic hunters, urging them to form a line and not to rush. Amidst the commotion, we catch a glimpse of Seo Jun's cute face, lost in thought about all that has transpired. Filled with excitement, Seo Jun asks Theo if he can become a wandering merchant and travel alongside him. In response, Theo chuckles and asks Seo Jun if he isn't aware that only creatures born inside the tower can become wandering merchants. He continues to laughingly explain that Seo Jun, being someone from outside the tower, wouldn't be eligible for such a role. Hearing this revelation, Seo Jun's expression changes. He ponders over his limited options, contemplating whether to feel anger or despair. As Theo continues with a proud face, confidently asserting that Seo Jun must let go of the idea, Seo Jun's body tenses up. His fists clench tightly, and his entire being trembles. Suddenly, he lets out a piercing scream, his face contorted with anguish. In a frenzy, he pulls at his hair, lost in a fit of despair and frustration. The scream echoes through the surroundings, lasting for several minutes, as Seo Jun curses the tower in his torment. The rabbits raised their ears and looked at Seo Jun with wide eyes, while the venom bees flew around busily flapping their wings. Even the queen bee peeked her head out of the hive to see what was going on. The sound reaches the ears of the black dragon who pauses mid-chew while devouring some roasted cherry tomatoes, momentarily startled by the noise. After some time, as Seo Jun's scream subsides, Theo, still in a state of fear, perches on top of the head of the annoyed black rabbit. Theo wonders aloud why Seo Jun suddenly started screaming. Seo Jun, regaining his senses, realizes that screaming and cursing won't help him in his current situation. He acknowledges that he should have anticipated that unexpected events could occur once he entered the tower, as it is an unpredictable place. Seo Jun reflects on the fact that seeking outside help is impossible in this situation. He contemplates what he should do to survive within the tower's confines. Meanwhile, the Queen Bee approaches his face, worried about what had caused Seo Jun to scream so loudly, and he then apologized to his cave family. The scene shifts, and we find ourselves in an office where plates of Seo Jun's cherry tomatoes are placed in front of Michael a middle-aged man with blonde hair who is the vice president of Gaggle Food Company. Sitting beside him is Jenny, a black-haired woman who is the CEO of Eastern Pharmaceutical Company, casually folding her legs. Curious, Michael asks Jenny if the cherry tomatoes are the mysterious item that has been gaining popularity recently. Jenny confirms his assumption, mentioning that she received them from her brother, who is a member of the Phoenix Guild. She explains that, unlike her, who is not a hunter, Michael can see the status window of this particular cherry tomato because he is a hunter himself. Then Michael, after seeing the cherry tomatoes, throws them onto the plate, expressing his disdain for the item. Jenny, in response, questions whether the vice president of Gaggle, who controls 39% of the global food market, has lost his business acumen. Michael, with a threatening face, warns her about the consequences of speaking carelessly. In a confident manner, 
Jenny snaps her fingers, and a hologram of the cherry tomato data appears from her tablet, shocking Michael. Beads of sweat form on his face as he realizes the significance of the data. Jenny explains that although her company failed to extract the method of creating these cherry tomatoes, the research data they obtained is beyond anyone's imagination. Michael, still in shock, sits back down and asks why she showed him the data. Jenny, still folding her legs, replies in a deep voice that she is willing to sell this data to him in exchange for some secret project they have been working on. This revelation astonishes Michael, and he questions how she knew about the project. Jenny smirks, indicating that she has her own methods of acquiring information. She approaches Michael, leaning closer to him, lowering her voice and offers him a cherry tomato with a smile on her face. She asks for his thoughts on her proposal. With a mischievous smile, Michael takes the cherry tomato, puts it in his mouth, and exclaims that it is sweet and delicious. He bursts into laughter while Jenny stands beside him. Childishly, Michael asks Jenny if she has another cherry tomato, to which she angrily replies that he has already eaten hers. If he wants more, she tells him that he should go to the tower and get one for himself. In the previous episode, we witnessed Seo Joon's fear and panic when he realized that he was on the 99th floor. Then we see Seo Joon sitting crouched and writing something on the ground with a stick, while all the rabbits and Theo observe curiously. He comments that since they are on the 99th floor, they can't expect help from the outside and they need to make necessary arrangements to survive here. He also looks up at the cave's hole and says that they need to know about the nearby environment for their safety. Then Seo Jun turns and asks Theo about the surroundings outside the cave. He wants to know if there are any monsters nearby. Theo, with both arms widened, replies that there are no monsters near the cave, but there is one just a bit further away. Curiously, Seo Jun asks what kind of monster it is. With a serious face, Theo replies that it's a crimson giant bear. As soon as Seo Jun hears the name, a chill flows through his spine as he remembers a giant bear from when the third blue moon appeared and almost killed him. Now, with his whole body shaking in fear, Theo continues with his trembling voice, describing the terrifying nature of the monster. He explains that every time he passed by it, the bear always glared at him as if it wanted to eat him. While the black rabbit and white rabbit try to calm Theo down, Seo Jun, with a worried face, starts thinking. Just as he expected, he is only safe in this cave. As soon as he steps outside, he will face a dog's death. He realizes that he needs to get stronger as soon as possible. Then his gaze shifts towards the queen bee, who is drinking nectar from tomato flowers and enjoying her life to the fullest. While from behind Seo Jun, we can see Theo imitating the growling of the crimson and bear, scaring the black rabbit. Seo Jun continues his thoughts, realizing that thousands of cherry tomato flowers will be blooming soon, and if the number of flowers increases, the number of poison honeybees will also increase. In that case, he can use an army of poison honeybees to patrol near the cave, ensuring no monster can get close to the cave entrance. Furthermore, he can also ask the bees to tie a rope, which he can make with onion leaves, to the tree outside the cave. Using it, he can safely make it out of the cave. With a confident face, Seo Jun declares that for all these plans to work, he needs to become stronger. Then, Seo Jun stands up from his sitting position, holding his thighs, and tells Theo that he has a mission for him. Theo asks what the mission is. Seo Jun, with a happy face and pointing his finger, says it's an extremely critical mission that only a sales cat can accomplish. He addresses Theo as the sales cat and asks if he can do it. Hearing this, Theo gets excited, and with a serious face, he confidently says that Seo Jun can bet on him, no matter what the mission is. The scene then shifts, and we see some hunters wandering around while others are chilling near the fire on the 38th floor. Theo observes them from the hill above. He thinks to himself that compared to the last time, there are a lot more people here, and it seems like they are securing their place here. Theo jumps from the hill excitedly, saying that it doesn't matter because this time, the more buyers there are, the better the results will be. With his swift movements, he safely lands on the ground, shocking the hunters. Then Theo, raising his hands, was about to say that the wandering merchant is here. But before he could, all the hunters started shouting and running towards Theo, saying he is finally here. They instantly surrounded Theo. Then we see a man wearing vibrant green shorts arrogantly handing a large bag to Theo. He says that he will buy all the cherry tomatoes that Theo has, shocking the girl and the boy who were standing beside the man. While Theo watches cluelessly, a fight breaks out between the hunters. The hunter with silver armor questions how the man in green shorts could cut the line. He asks if it's his first time here, and mentions that those who arrived first have already made arrangements regarding who will buy the cherry tomatoes first. Hearing this, 
The man in green shorts gets mad and exclaims how ridiculous this is. He mentions that even the Phoenix Guild is a powerful guild, and asks if the guild thinks they can monopolize the entire third floor. He wonders how dare they be so cocky. Meanwhile, Theo watches the scene with a worried face. Unsure of how things will unfold, the hunter with the silver armor and the man in green shorts both grab each other's collars about to fight. However, Theo breaks the tension by raising his hand nervously and pleading for them not to fight. He announces that he wants to speak first. Still nervous and holding his waist, Theo announces that starting today he is changing the method of selling the tomatoes. The hunters curiously ask how he is changing the method and request him to explain in detail. Still nervous, Theo replies that starting today, he will be selling 500 cherry tomatoes in each batch, and the person who pays the highest price will get the tomatoes. Upon hearing this, the hunter with the silver armor and the girl beside him widen their mouths in surprise. Theo continues, saying that those without money can simply leave while holding a bucket full of cherry tomatoes. He shows them the bucket, which is also made up of onion leaves. He adds that the auction begins now, with a starting price of 35 tower coins per piece. Then the scene shifts and we see Seo Jun sitting and watching the rabbits work. The black rabbit is also sitting beside Seo Jun, lost in thought. Seo Jun realizes that the popularity of the cherry tomatoes outside the tower is higher than he thought. He comes to this conclusion after observing that the hunters tried to win over Theo by giving him cat treats. He is confident that his auction idea will work. Seo Jun believes that since the supply of cherry tomatoes is low and the demand is high, the rich will be willing to pay the maximum price. This means he will be able to make more profit from the auction. He shares this thought with the Black Rabbit, who is holding a cup made of onion leaf. Both Seo Jun and the Black Rabbit enjoy their cherry tomato honey drink as they discuss their plans. Then, Seo Jun sips his tomato honey juice and continues, saying that he also has another important mission for Theo. He will be assessing Theo's trading skills through this opportunity. After finishing his drink, Seo Jun stretches his hands to relax and suggests they get back to work. He asks the Black Rabbit if he could go and make preparations for dinner. The Black Black Rabbit happily agrees, stretching his hands in agreement. Suddenly, a quest appears in front of Seo Jun from the tower manager. The quest demands one glass of magical tomatoes mixed with honey, which Seo Jun just drank. The reward for completing the quest is a job-related skill. Seo Jun, with a worried face, explains that squeezing the cherry tomatoes will take a long time and he has to work now, so he will give her the drink later. However, more windows pop up in front of him, demanding the drink right now, claiming that the reward he will receive is very impressive and that he will regret his decision if he delays. Confused, Seo Jun asks if the tower manager is trying to bribe him with quest rewards and wonders if the tower manager wants his juice that badly. But the tower manager continues to insist that Seo Jun give her his juice. After thinking for some time, he smiles and tells the tower manager to wait a minute. He starts moving towards the tomato plant. Then we see Seo Jun giving the juice to the white rabbits, while all the other rabbits enjoy the drink happily. Our queen bee sits on Seo Jun's shoulder, eagerly waiting for when he will give her his juice. Then we see Seo Jun crouching beside a hole full of cherry tomatoes, which was covered with a blanket made up of onion leaves. He takes out some cherry tomatoes and places them in a bucket, also made up of onion leaves. Seo Jun closes his eyes, holding a bunch of red cherry tomatoes, and with great force, squeezes them. The juice from the tomatoes collects in a glass made up of onion leaves. Seo Jun calls our queen bee and asks for her help, while the juice still drips from his hand. The queen bee happily agrees and produces some sweet honey from her mouth. She throws it onto the tomato juice proudly, while Seo Jun watches the whole process with joy. And voila, Seo Jun's special juice is ready. He presents it with a straw, also made up of onion leaf. Then Seo Jun tells the tower manager that the juice is ready. The tower manager comments that she is really curious about the taste of Seo Jun's special juice. She is so happy that she flaps her wings in excitement. Suddenly the juice vanishes from Seo Jun's hand, indicating that the quest has been completed. However, Seo Jun becomes curious when he hears the word wing and wonders what kind of creature the tower manager is. On the other hand, we see the tower manager happily enjoying Seo Jun's special juice. After taking a large sip, she finds it so tasty that she smiles, her mouth open, and she feels like she's in heaven. Little pink hearts can be seen floating around her face, showing her delight. Then the scene shifts towards Seo Jun and the tower manager praising him for his delicious juice. With a kind face, 
Seo Jun replies that he is happy she liked it. Curious about the special quest reward, Seo Jun opens the quest reward and receives a unique skill called beekeeping. With this skill, Seo Jun becomes the owner of all the poison bees and can command them freely. As the skill level increases, he can have more than one beehive, meaning more waifus, oh sorry more queen bees. Seeing this skill, Seo Jun becomes very happy and excited, clenching his fist. He was worried about not being able to command the little bees to patrol the cave entrance, but now, with this skill, every problem will be solved. He looks up at the sky and tells the tower manager that he is very happy and also thanks her. Seeing Seo Jun happy, the tower manager also feels joy and blushes slightly as Seo Jun praised her for the first time, her fingers gently circling the glass. She lies on the floor, still blushing and holding her cheeks with her hand. Her other hand continues to circle around the glass as she watches Seo Jun through her crystal. However, Seo Jun interrupts the romantic atmosphere by expressing his curiosity. He asks if the tower manager is perhaps a pig with a pair of wings, given her appetite. Upon hearing this, the romantic atmosphere shatters. The tower manager becomes angry and starts shouting at Seo Jun, calling him stupid, a fool, and telling him to go to hell. Seo Jun, holding his ears, apologizes, realizing his mistake. As the tower manager's anger subsides, he wonders why she became so furious. Then the scene shifts and we see the hunter still shocked by the revelation of the auction. Among them, Dongshik appears to be the most shocked and worried. He realizes that if he can't secure the cherry tomatoes today, his image as a caring father will be destroyed. In a state of panic, Dong Shik breaks the silent atmosphere by shouting that he will start the auction with a bid of 41 tower coins. Another member expresses concern, questioning whether they are going over their budget. Dong Shik responds, saying they will figure out their budget later, but the most important thing right now is to secure some cherry tomatoes. The green shorts, however, increases the price to 45 coins, shocking Dong Shik. Soon, everyone starts increasing the price, going from 45 to 46, and gradually up to 60 tower coins. Witnessing this, Dong Shik and the girl become even more worried. Dong Shik realizes he doesn't have that many tower coins and asks the black-haired girl if she has any tower coin. Unfortunately, she replies that she doesn't have many because she only brought a few for gifting someone. Then, Another shocking event occurs as someone shouts from behind that they will give 100 tower coins per cherry tomato, leaving everyone in shock. It turns out to be Michelle, the vice president of the gourmet food company we encountered in the last episode. Michelle continues with a smirking smile, stating that he will buy all 500 cherry tomatoes, offering 100 tower coins each. Theo asks if anyone is going to increase the bidding, but in the silence that follows, Theo declares that all the cherry tomatoes are sold to Michelle. Still in shock, Dong Shik wonders why Michelle, who is known as the master of all hunters, is present. But then, he notices a member standing behind Michelle, a member of his own Phoenix Guild. Dong Shik angrily asks what he is doing here, to which the member bows his head and politely apologizes, addressing Dong Shik as, Sir. He explains that his sister instructed him to guide Sir Michel to the location where the wandering merchant was. Dong Shik realizes that his sister is the CEO of a pharmaceutical company, and if Michelle and his sister are working together, it will be very difficult to compete against such influential figures. Grinding his teeth, he resolves to at least win a few cherry tomatoes in the remaining two rounds of the auction. Proudly standing, Theo announces that he will start the auction for the next... Now, Theo starts the second round of auctions for the next batch of 500 cherry tomatoes, starting again with 35 tower coins. Kim Dong Shik, who is determined to win this batch, immediately raises a big bid of 60 tower coins. However, Michael outbids him with 100 tower coins again, leaving Dong Shik shocked with his mouth open. In panic, he grabs his teammate's collar and starts shaking him, asking if he has some tower coins to spare. The other hunters have already given up on winning against the rich man. Theo counts twice and then declares that the bid was successful, and Michael has bought the second batch of cherry tomatoes too. Then he starts the auction for the third round, but Michael stops him, saying that there is no need for that. He would take the third batch for 100 tower coins, too. Michael is buying all 150 cherry tomatoes for 300 coins. Their deal is made, and now Dong Shik is even more shocked and can't process what happened, still holding his teammate's collar. He falls on the ground on his knees, thinking how it was impossible to fight back against a billionaire. His teammate tells him not to be disheartened and that they should aim for the next opportunity. 
On the other hand, Michael's team has also loaded the tomatoes onto their backpacks, while Michael holds a cherry tomato with a smirking smile watching the tomato. He tells his team that they are going to the first floor immediately. Meanwhile, as Theo is packing up his money, the girl who gave him churu last time and her friend approach him. Upon seeing her, Theo points his finger and says he knows her name. After thinking for some time, he pronounces her name as Buha, but Suha doesn't mind and confirms that Theo is correct. She then offers him some churu and asks if they could take a picture together again today. Suha has brought more churu to give to him. Excited to see his new favorite snack, Theo controls his desires and declines the churu, expressing that he would prefer her to give him coffee instead in return for taking a picture. Suha searches her bag and takes out a packet, asking if this is the coffee mix he was talking about, and it is exactly what he wanted. Encouraged by this, Theo asks if she also happens to have something like salt and pepper. Suha and her friend think for a while before pooling their resources and giving him the salt and pepper they had. They ask if it will be enough, and he thanks them for it. Unbeknownst to Suha, this was another mission that Seo Jun had given to his merchant cat employee. Seo Jun had told him to ask for things like salt, pepper, and coffee if people wanted to take pictures with him. And depending on his performance, he would consider letting him become a salesman for an hour or two to achieve the coveted position. Theo immediately agrees to the deal with a wicked smile, thinking that with this, he will become a sales cat and spend good time on Seo Jun's lap again. He takes many pictures with Su Ha, and after checking the photos, she thinks that they came out well too. Theo thanks her for the deal, and as he stretches his hand out for a handshake, Suha notices his toe bean, and she cannot stop herself from touching and pinching them. They feel really soft and good to her, but Theo asks her what she is doing, and she is startled. Suha explains that she couldn't help it because it felt so good, and she was also going to give Theo the churu, in exchange for letting her touch his paws since that was a very relaxing experience for her. Theo is surprised and asks Suha if he can also touch her big melons, if humans really feel relaxed, just by touching his feet, and she confirms that it's true. She flatters Theo, saying that humans don't have those soft and pretty toe beans, and they are lucky just to touch them, because cats usually don't like holding hands. This revelation shocks Theo, as he realizes he has made another great discovery that he can use to earn more. He thinks that his toe beans are a lucky charm for him. Then, Suha's friend asks Theo if he could take a picture with her too, since she was the one who gave him the pepper earlier. He has no problem with that, and after taking the picture, he moves on to the next step. He puts his hands forward and asks the girl to touch his toes, and in exchange, he wants some reward. The girl obliges, and after touching his paws, she gives him some of her rations, including packaged food and butter, among other things. Theo is really happy and laughs loudly again with a wicked smile, while the girl thinks that he is really cute and decides to bring churu for him next time. Theo is thrilled that just by letting humans touch his paws and getting rewards, he could become a sales cat for 24 hours. However, he suddenly remembers that he had another mission too and drops the items immediately. Meanwhile, Suha is uploading the selfies she took with Theo on Instagram and smiling to herself when Theo suddenly appears behind her and startles her. He calls her Churubua and asks her what she is doing, and she asks him if he has still not left. Theo said he has an important question for her. He wants to know if she came from a place called the Republic of South Korea. Hearing this, Shua was surprised and asks Theo how he knows about that, and Theo replies that he found out because he smelled a familiar scent from her melon. Suha has not yet understood everything, but Theo asks her if she could help him, and she has no idea what he wants her to do. Back in Seo Jun's cave, the poison honeybees are collecting nectar from the cherry tomato flowers and pollinating them as Seo Jun watches over them. They are also collecting the honey they make into his water bottle. For each milliliter of honey they give him, Seo Jun's proficiency in the beekeeping skill goes up a little. Gradually, as the bottle is half filled, the proficiency increases and the skill reaches level 2 from level 1. Seo Jun thinks that it is going well. The honeybee population is steadily increasing, and his beekeeping skill is also leveling up quite quickly. Moreover, the queen bee is laying eggs nowadays after drinking Seo Jun's special juice, and he has not seen her in a long time and missed her. There are also some ambiguous changes in the description of the beekeeping skill, and he does not know if they will make any difference, but the maximum number of beehives he could own has increased from one to two. He now thinks that if he can split the beehive later, he will be able to own both of them and increase his efficiency. Also, 
The bottle is about to get full of honey, and he thinks that he will need another container to store it. He would be lucky if he could get a bottle, but he can think about that later. Right now, he has a more important task to do. The carrots are ready to harvest, and Seojun picks one out of the ground and calls his rabbit friends to eat it. They immediately rush to him as Seo Jun keeps on harvesting the agility carrots and gains 10 XP for each of them, while also increasing the proficiency of his skill harvest level 2. He had only been able to harvest them yesterday for the first time. Before that, he harvested the blessed agility carrot on the day of the blue moon a few days ago, and the rabbits could not control their happiness as they saw the ripened carrots. The type of food that can be eaten and is grown in the cave has increased by one. Now Seojun tells them to take one each, and the rabbits are really glad. They even bow down to him treating Seojun like a king, and Seojun asks if it really was such a big thing. Then as they sit around the fire and eat the carrots, Seojun looks at the information window of the agility carrot. It can increase the agility of the consumer by 0.1 points for 10 minutes, and this effect can be stacked up to 10 times. Besides that, it has all the health benefits of cherry tomatoes and more. Not only does it burn down 10 grams of fat upon being eaten, but it also boosts vision. Now, as Seo Jun eats the carrot, he thinks that since they are even more beneficial than tomatoes, the carrots will be really popular once he has enough to sell them. Seo Jun finishes eating quickly and then moves to harvest the remaining carrots so that they can be stored. The rabbits also help him, removing the leaves from the carrots and transporting them to storage, and even the black rabbit helps although he is really not good at farming. He collapses while carrying some carrots, and Seo Jun asks him if he is already tired, but it turns out that he was just trying to be smart and eat the carrot while lying down. But Seo Jun catches him in the act, and the father rabbit also beats him for stealing. The storage is almost full, and Seo Jun decides to stop harvesting the carrots for today and wrap up the job. But then suddenly, there is an influx of system messages telling him that he has gained XP from harvesting the carrots and that he has finally leveled up. Seo Jun is also surprised to learn that he has already reached level 10. He has acquired a bonus stat for leveling up, and a quest has also been issued. Seo Jun asks the Tower Master what the quest was this time, but the manager replies that it was not from him this time. This is a job quest that appears when a hunter reaches level 10. One must clear this quest to get the new class traits and move on to the next level. Seo Jun has heard about the job quests from the hunters in the real world. For normal hunters, it was often combat-related quests, such as monster subjugation. But since he is a farmer, he is sure that the quest will be something different. Seo Jun opens the quest window and finds that it asks him to expand the cultivable area by 50 square meters. He thinks that this will be easy and gets to it almost immediately. He completes the quest and gets rewards for doing so. He has reached level 11 and acquired one bonus stat. Also, he has gained 10 tower coins and one job trade as reward. Seo Jun is really glad that it is over because it was much more exhausting than he thought it would be. He is tired and so are the rabbits who have already collapsed but at least he has a good job trade as a reward for his hard work. He can now acquire XP every time he creates one square meter of the crop field, and he thinks that it was a good thing he completed the quest quickly as he can gain more experience now. After eating and planting the carrot roots, the field has increased more than he thought it would. Seo Jun is too exhausted to do anything else for the day, and he tells his rabbit friends that they should also sleep and finish their jobs tomorrow. As he goes to his spot, the rabbits are also heading back to their burrow, but then their parents stop them from coming inside. They tell them that they cannot come in and slam the door in their faces. The rabbits are sad and shocked. Two of them bang on the door while another one just sits there and cries. Seo Jun also comes to them after hearing their voices and realizes that they have been kicked out of the house. But they are full-grown adults now, so it is time for them to be independent anyway. The rabbits are not really cheered up by what he said, and Seo Jun says that it is too late to create new burrows right now, so for today they should just sleep with him. The rabbits cheer up a bit and agree to his plan, and now Seo Jun sleeps on his bed with his rabbit friends all over him. He laughs, saying that this was also good. Sometimes it feels soft and warm. Meanwhile, at Theo's location, Dong Sheik is feeling stressed and worried. He knows his daughter will be upset if he fails to bring back cherry tomatoes this time. Suddenly, Suha appears with Theo. 
surprising Dong Shik that the cat merchant is still around. Su Ha informs Dong Shik that the cat has something to tell him. Curious, Theo asks Dong Shik if he is the leader of the people who came from South Korea. Dong Shik confirms this, but he's puzzled about why the cat is asking. Then Theo proposes a contract with him. He hands Dong Shik a piece of paper with the details of their contract mentioned on it. Dong Shik reads the contents of the contract, and it states that he must give 50 million won to the family of Mr. Park Seo Joon, who lives in the Sosa district of Bachan City. Theo adds that they also have to tell Seo Joon's parents that he is doing well. For their part of the contract, they would be paying Dong Shik 50 tower coins, and the better reward is 200 magical cherry tomatoes that Theo hid during the auction. As he puts a basket of cherry tomatoes in front of Dong Shik, Dong Shik is stunned and cannot believe what he is seeing and started crying. He thinks that with this amount of cherry tomatoes, he will surely win his daughter's heart and she will call him the best dad ever. He is lost in the imagination of a happy future and then asks Theo about Seo Joon. Dong Shik assumes that since it was a message for his family, Seo Joon was a hunter who could not currently get out of the tower. Theo hesitates to give him an answer because Seo Joon has forbidden him to. He wanted Theo to keep his being on the 99th floor secret, and now, as Theo thinks for a while, he comes up with a good cover story. He tells Dong Shik that Seo Joon saved his life on the 40th floor, so he was just doing some errands for him. Even this story is not really helpful in keeping a low profile, and Dong Shik is shocked as he hears about someone being on the 40th floor. No one has yet officially reached the 40th floor, and he asks Theo if the person named Park Seo Joon was the one who discovered these magical cherry tomatoes. But Theo replies that he could not tell him anything more than this. After all, Seo Joon was a great man, and he had many secrets. Dong Shik can only think about a person being alone on the 40th floor. Even if he made a team using only the elite members of their guild, it would be difficult for them to cross the 39th floor. He has not heard about any hunter who got that far in the official records. Dong Shik thinks that Seo Jun must be a solo hunter who is not affiliated with any guild, and that is why not much is known about him. But it also means that he is remarkably talented and strong, and now he thinks that this is a great opportunity. With this contract as an excuse, Dong Shik feels he might stay in touch with Seo Jun, and if things go well, they may even be able to recruit him into his guild. Not only that, they may also be able to monopolize the distribution of cherry tomatoes, which are surely going to be harder to obtain in the future. Thinking about all this, Dong Shik tells Theo that they should enter into a contract. Both of them sign the contract, and it is finalized. Dong Shik says that the deals signed inside the tower are valid even when one is outside, but to deliver more accurate information, he would like to meet the cat merchant after 10 days. He also tells the cat to notify Seo Joon on his behalf that Kim Dong Shik, the leader of the Phoenix Guild, will take responsibility for delivering the news to his parents. At Seo Joon's cave, the young rabbits who were kicked out of their house have started making new homes for themselves. As the black rabbit pulls him towards the newly created homes, Seo Joon finds that they are already complete. He is amazed by the houses they have made that look much better than their initial house, and the rabbits are also quite proud. He compliments them, saying that the roof was made of green onion leaves, and the walls looked quite solid too. He thinks that the shovel rabbit and the sickle rabbit must have worked the hardest for this, and both of them are quite happy about their accomplishments. Also, they have made a small room to rest in between work hours, and Seo Joon wishes that he also had something like that. With that, he again compliments the rabbits and pats their heads. Then he declares that they should have a housewarming party, and the rabbits are all excited. It had been a few days since the young rabbits moved out of their parents' house, and now they had made their own. While the couple of rabbits were still clinging to each other as they sit to eat a celebration feast, Seo Joon raises a toast for the rabbits who have worked so hard. He's drinking the cherry tomato and honey juice in his tumbler, and the rabbits have made small glasses for themselves using hollowed carrots. Seo Joon pours the juice on the black rabbit, thanking him for always supplying them with such excellent quality fish, and he is quite pleased. Then he compliments the rabbits in general, saying that they are quite smart to think of using hollowed carrots as glasses. Though it was a little small for Seo Joon, it was still fun since he could eat the cup after finishing the drink. But then he notices the rabbit couple getting quite flirty with each other, and as he stares at them, Seo Joon says, This is quite suspicious. He thinks of the reason they made their children leave, and then comes to a conclusion and tells the rabbits that they are soon going to have more siblings. But they don't understand what he wants to tell them. But then, suddenly, 
A system window opens up in front of him, and it informs him that the seed store has opened. Seo Jun is happy as he finds that today was the due date for the seed that he forgot about, and he excitedly opens the store, wondering what he can buy this time. He has the option to buy 100 strawberry seeds for 0.5 tower coins, 100 potato seeds for 5 tower coins, and 1,000 lettuce seeds for 0.1 tower coin. The thing that excites him the most is lettuce, since he really wants to have some roasted meat wrapped in lettuce leaves. But then he realizes that fish won't cut it, and he has no other meat, so he decides to skip lettuce. With that elimination, only strawberries and potatoes are left, and both are also good options. He has enough money to buy anything he wants, but can only buy one, so he is really confused. But then he decides to go with potatoes since they are not only a great source of carbohydrates but also quite versatile. Seo Jun selects the option to buy the 100 potato seeds, and five tower coins are deducted from his account. Also, he had earned 50 seed store loyalty points, making their total up to 56 points, including those in the past. With that, the cooldown period for the seed store starts again, and now he can access it after one month. And then a big sack of potatoes falls from the sky, and Seo Jun is taken aback because he was expecting it to be another small bag. He barely dodges the potato sack that was about to crush him and says that he was quite scared for a moment there. The rabbits are also shocked, and the husband rabbit is especially furious since his wife was scared. Seo Jun apologizes, and then he picks up a potato to see its quality and thinks that it looks really delicious. He plans to plant it right away so he can harvest it quickly and cook it in different ways. He is really excited to boil and steam them and even make potato pancakes, and the rabbits also start drooling along with him. But then Seo Jun says that they should take rest today, and tomorrow they will plant all the tomatoes. The rabbits are also glad to get an early break. Then Seo Jun wonders if Theo is doing all right too. He thinks that the Theo must have completed the errands he told him to do by now, and Theo is just doing the last of the tasks Seo Jun assigned him. He is in the central merchants district, which is like a well-established market town with a huge population and big buildings. All kinds of creatures peacefully live there and do their jobs without feeling any danger. In one shop, Theo is buying the things Seo Jun had asked him to. He has already purchased blankets and pillows and is now looking for ladles, spoons, and bowls. As he rummages through the items on sale, he finds a decent frying pan and a pot. Theo asked the dog merchant about the price of the frying pan, and he said it's 1.6 tower coin. But Theo thought it was too expensive, so he asked for a discount. After thinking for a while, the dog merchant said that since he hadn't seen Theo around before, he assumed Theo is not from this floor. So he decided to be generous and offer all the goods for 1.5 tower coins. Hearing this, Theo made a disappointed face, saying it's too low. He turned around and started to walk away, declaring that he will not buy anything. The dog merchant got panicked, worried that he might lose the sale. The dog merchant asks him to stop, saying that he couldn't leave like that. He is already nervous, but then Theo replies that since he could not offer him any discount, he couldn't buy things from him. The shopkeeper admits his defeat and says that he is willing to sell the items for 1.3 tower coins, but Theo gives him his price, 1.2 tower coins, or he would simply leave. The shopkeeper takes the deal, saying that he cannot go any further. The cat places the coins on a nearby barrel and thanks the shopkeeper as he walks away with the things he just bought. The shopkeeper is also amazed by his skill. Initially, he took him for a beginner, but it seems that the cat was a master. But then he notices that the coins were wet and that a paw print was left on the barrel itself, and he wonders what it was. It was Theo's sweat, as he was too nervous while negotiating. He is panting now that he is away from the shopkeeper, and then he exclaims that he finally did it. He shouts that he finally bought something without being an idiot, and the other people on the road stare at him. And this was thanks to Seo Jun, who gave Theo a detailed lecture on how to not be a stupid customer. In the cave, he had told the cat three golden rules to get a good deal. First, no matter what price the shopkeeper offers you, always ask for a discount. Second, if they refuse to give you a discount, just leave. And third, if the shopkeeper stops you, get a discount three times. Seo Jun told Theo to remember just these three rules, and he would not be fooled. And it really worked, as he said. Theo smugly laughs to himself as he says that now he is a wandering merchant who knows how to get a discount. But then as he reaches a corner, he hears some familiar words. Someone was trying to sell some items from outside the town hour, and Theo looks towards the merchant. He is shocked to see a familiar face. 
It was Skarim, the goblin merchant who scammed him on his first day as a traveling merchant, and right now he was trying to do the same with another cute newbie using the same tactics. Skarim tells them that this was a secret he was revealing so that more newbie merchants would become high-level merchants, and the beginner merchant seemed to be convinced by his words. Theo is furious upon finding out that the scammer is in action once again. Theo wasted no time, fueled by anger, and clenched his fists. He cursed Scarum, vowing to teach him a lesson that day. His voice thundered as he shouted at Scarum, startling him. Theo approached Scarum with unwavering determination, while Scarum was too shocked to react. To regain control of the situation, Scarum immediately adopted a friendly tone and placed a hand on Theo's shoulder. He inquired about Theo's well-being and expressed his concern. However, Theo was no longer a pushover. He forcefully pushed Scarum's long nose away, telling him to get lost and daring this scammer to approach him. Scarum continued to feign innocence, perplexed by Theo's accusations. He questioned what Theo meant by calling him a fraud. Scarum argued that he had been kind enough to offer Theo great items at the lowest prices. Now he found himself with a knife held to his throat. Theo's anger grew further. He pointed at the newbie merchant who held a tumbler, noting that it was the same item Scarum had sold to him, claiming it was a magic item. Then Theo pointed directly at Scarum and exclaimed, Magic item, my ass! He declared that all the items Scarum sold were nothing more than trash. Even this tumbler was just a piece of metal that regulated the outside temperature, a cheap trinket easily found outside the tower. Scarum became increasingly bewildered and nervous in the face of Theo's accusations, thinking, How did this push over Theo grow balls? Oh, sorry, I mean become so confident. Scarum, now wearing a sweet smile, attempted to defuse the situation. He suggested that it was all just a misunderstanding, and Theo might have been confused about the item he had sold. He proposed they discuss it elsewhere. However, before he could finish his sentence, Theo erupted in shouts, calling for the guards and accusing Scarum of being a wicked goblin trying to scam a beginner merchant. Faced with no other choice, Scarum clutched the tumbler and cursed at Theo. He vowed to seek revenge for ruining his scheme and swiftly made his escape. Meanwhile, Theo stood proudly, having thwarted the fraudster's plan. As Scarum made his hasty exit, Theo continued to vent his frustration, trying to appear as a hero in front of the newbie merchant. The newbie expressed gratitude and politely inquired about Theo's name. With pride, Theo introduced himself and left the scene, striking a heroic pose. He warned the newbie to be careful and not fall victim to scams again, and the newbie thanked him for his advice. Inside the newbie's hood, fierce, sharp red eyes watched Theo as he departed. In a low whisper, the mysterious figure uttered something, and three police dogs obediently appeared, bowing before her. In a commanding tone, she reprimanded the three police dogs, reminding them that they were supposed to keep watch and not allow anything, not even a fly, to pass by unnoticed during her mission. The white short police dog, in a panic, quickly apologized and claimed they had indeed been patrolling the area unaware of how the wandering merchant cat had managed to slip in. With a swift motion, she removed her hoodie, revealing her true identity. She was an undercover high-level officer known as Zerth, who had been on a mission for months to apprehend Scarum, the fraudulent goblin. Frustration clouded her face as she explained that just when she was on the brink of capturing Scarum, everything had unraveled. Once again, the junior officers offered their apologies to Zerth, but she was unyielding. With a dominating and angry demeanor, she fixed a stern gaze upon them and declared that a simple sorry would not suffice. Instead, they would have to write 100 letters of apology each. As she left, the junior officers were left trembling, fully aware of the consequences of their failure. Zerth couldn't help but dwell on how close she had been to capturing the fraudster Scarum. She also found it irritating that she had to play the role of a fool to deceive Scarum, and all her meticulous plans had been destroyed by Theo. Now she was determined that Theo, the one who had thwarted her mission, would pay the price for his interference. The scene then shifted to Theo, who was strolling happily through the jungle, enjoying a fried fish without a care in the world, seemingly oblivious to the mess he had caused. Meanwhile, Xiao Jun was busy teaching the sickle rabbit how to precisely cut a potato into four equal parts. After observing and learning swiftly, 
the rabbit successfully managed to cut the potato into four perfect segments. Seo Jun proceeded with determination, firmly placing one piece of potato on the ground and carefully covering it with soil. The husband rabbit diligently watered the area, ensuring the newly planted potato would have the moisture it needed to grow. With a smirk, Seo Jun turned to the husband rabbit and asked if he wasn't shocked by the fact that with only 100 potatoes, they would be able to grow 400 potatoes. The husband rabbit listened intently as Seo Jun went on to explain that he had come across this farming trick on YouTube originally meant for passing the time. Little did he know that something he had watched just for entertainment was now helping him survive in this unfamiliar world. As Seo Jun completed the planting process, a notification from the system informed him that he had gained one XP for each potato he had planted. After a considerable amount of time and effort, they had finally planted all the potatoes. Seo Jun cheerfully announced to his rabbit family that since they were done with the hard work, it was time for a sweet potato party. The rabbits were overjoyed and eagerly anticipated the feast. However, before they could begin the party, Seo Jun had a small task for the baby rabbits. He explained that the upper part of the sweet potato acted as a seed, so they needed to separate it before enjoying the sweet potato. They should then plant the upper part again in the ground for future growth. Upon hearing this, the baby rabbit seemed a bit disheartened and flopped down on the ground. But just then, the warrior rabbit intervened. He pointed out that before Seo Jun planted the upper part of the sweet potato to increase his experience points, they should simply dig out the sweet potatoes. The rest, like planting the upper part, could be handled by Seo Jun himself. The rabbits chuckled quietly, covering their mouths in amusement. Their joy was short-lived, though, as Seo Jun informed them that, to their disappointment, he didn't want to monopolize the joy of planting sweet potatoes that day. He wanted the rabbits to enjoy all the fun. This left the rabbits feeling a bit down once again. After that, all the rabbits enthusiastically began working together. The sickle rabbit and the mother rabbit dug out the sweet potatoes, while the baby rabbits took on the task of transporting them. Despite his initial reluctance, even the warrior rabbit had to do his share of the work. After a long hour of diligent labor, they finally planted all the sweet potato sprouts. As a reward for their hard work, the system notified Seo Jun that he had successfully created a 500 square meter sweet potato field. Additionally, he gained 100 experience points, a bonus stat, and leveled up once. Then, something unexpected occurred. First, the husband rabbit raised his hand, followed by the wife rabbit. The husband rabbit, along with another male rabbit, began to sing while pointing their butts toward Seo Jun. Simultaneously, the wife rabbit and another female rabbit pointed their butts toward Seo Jun and joined in the singing. As they sang, they moved around Seo Jun in a circle, leaving him utterly confused. The tower manager informed Seo Jun that the rabbits were doing a cheerful dance in anticipation of a good sweet potato harvest and were preparing for their party. It was a celebration before the harvest, a tradition among the rabbits. Seo Jun wasted no time and sat down on the ground to start harvesting the sweet potatoes while the rabbits continued dancing in the background. As Seo Jun carefully removed the dirt from the ground, a bright golden light suddenly emitted from the area where the sweet potatoes were growing. The light was so intense that everyone had to shield their eyes. When the light finally faded, something astonishing had occurred. The sweet potatoes were now a radiant golden color. This left Seo Jun in a state of shock. Upon examining the properties of these golden sweet potatoes, he discovered they were called sweet potato pumpkins of the sun. They were a mutant variety of sweet potato, and when consumed, they provided cold resistance for 24 hours, helped burn fat, and improved health. Furthermore, the system notified Seo Jun that he had successfully cultivated a new breed of sweet potato, leaving Hin in a state of shock. Then the scene shifted to Dong Shik as he got out of his car, holding a parcel and gazing at a building. He remarked that it must be Sir Seo Jun's house. Meanwhile, Seo Jun and the rabbits were still amazed by the golden sweet potato. Seo Jun received numerous system notifications, acknowledging various achievements. However, the most important skill he acquired was the exclusive rights to the crops he grew. This skill brought genuine happiness to Seo Jun, as it meant that outside the tower, no one could grow these crops without his permission. He now had the power to monopolize his crops. After replanting the golden sweet potato in the ground, 
Seo Jun explained that although he would love to taste this new crop, he needed to ensure it reached maximum ripeness first. He then stood up with excitement, raising one hand in the air and cheered with the rabbits, encouraging them to continue digging sweet potatoes. As they worked, the husband rabbit and wife rabbit held each other romantically, watching the scene. One by one, Seo Jun dug out the sweet potatoes while the baby and warrior rabbits helped transport them. Finally, after a long hour of hard work, they completed the task. Seo Jun wrapped the sweet potatoes in onion leaves and placed them beside the campfire to cook. After some time, he poked a sweet potato with a stick and, upon pulling it out, confirmed that it was ready. Gently, Seo Jun, along with the other rabbits, blew air on the sweet potato to cool it down. As Seo Jun broke the sweet potato open, its delightful scent filled the air, making the warrior and baby rabbit's mouths water. As the rabbits ate the sweet potatoes with sparkling eyes, Seo Jun noticed that the husband rabbit was eating them so quickly that one got stuck in his throat. The wife rabbit patted his back, trying to help him. Witnessing this innocent scene, Seo Jun laughed heartily, a sound that hadn't been heard in a long time. The tower manager expressed her eagerness to taste Seo Jun's special food, her mouth practically watering with saliva. Seo Jun generously handed over ten sweet potatoes to the tower manager, who thanked him graciously. Staring at the remaining sweet potatoes, Seo Jun suddenly had a great idea. He called the scythe rabbit over to assist him. Meanwhile, the tower manager carefully peeled the top of Seo Jun's special potato and savored it, closing her eyes and savoring the delightful taste. The potato was so tasty that she didn't even realize when she had eaten them all. She watched Seo Jun through her crystal ball her lips linking together and her claws touching each other in acute reaction. She wondered if she should ask for more of Seo Jun's special potato. As she observed Seo Jun, the tower manager noticed something new. Seo Jun was placing the sweet potatoes, chopped into small pieces, onto a mat made up of onion leaves. After arranging them, Seo Jun commented that once they were ready, they would be super delicious. He then commanded the sickle rabbit to chop one more sweet potato. Happily, the sickle rabbit tossed the potato into the air, and with swift precision, instantly chopped it into equal small pieces. Seo Jun praised the rabbit, holding a piece of sweet potato and marveling at how evenly they were chopped, almost like a machine. The tower manager couldn't help but ask why Seo Jun was chopping the delicious sweet potatoes and throwing them on the ground. Seo Jun explained that he wasn't throwing them away, but rather enhancing their flavor by drying them. When they will be ready, he promised to share the delicious treat with the tower manager. The scene shifted, and we found Dongshik standing at the door of Seo Jun's house, ringing the bell. He inquired if this was Seo Jun's residence. Seo Jun's younger brother, along with his parents, hastily opened the door, filled with hope that Seo Jun had returned. However, upon seeing Dongshik, they fell silent and asked who he was. An awkward silence hung in the air. Seo Jun's mother served some berries to Dongshik, apologizing that they couldn't offer anything more delicious. It had been so long since they had guests that they didn't have anything special on hand. Dongshik politely assured them that he was grateful for whatever they could offer, even if it were just a glass of water. Dongshik politely assured them that he was grateful for whatever they could offer, even if it were just a glass of water. The atmosphere grew somber as Seo Jun's father, wearing a sad expression, explained that they didn't know where Seo Jun was. He had gone missing five months ago. Dong Shik responded by explaining that he wasn't actually looking for Seo Jun. He then handed over his card and apologized for not introducing himself sooner. He introduced himself as Dong Shik, the leader of the Phoenix Guild's fifth team. Suddenly, Seo Jun's younger brother, with a shocked expression, jumped to his feet and ran to his father, exclaiming that it couldn't be the same Phoenix Guild he was thinking of. This startled his father, and as he examined the card, his hand began to shake. It was indeed the Phoenix Guild, the top guild in Korea representing the country. Dong Shik, still feeling a bit awkward, tried to downplay his significance, but the entire family was in an uproar. Seo Jun's father, still in a state of panic, asked Seo Jun's mom to bring out the high-grade melon and remove the berries. Seo Jun's mother hurriedly took the plate of berries away. Seo Jun's younger brother, still in shock, and Dong Shik remained in an awkward silence. Dong Shik reassured them that he was perfectly fine and encouraged them to sit comfortably. With concern etched on their faces, Seo Jun's mom and dad asked Dong Shik why he was in their house and whether he knew anything about Seo Jun's whereabouts, especially since he was a hunter. Dong Shik then took out a white envelope and with a serious expression he explained that he was here to deliver this envelope at Mr. Seo Jun's request. He handed the envelope to Seo Jun's family, and the atmosphere became even more tense. 
As Seo Jun's family held the letter, their faces turned pale and they were clearly distressed. Seo Jun's father slammed his fist on the table, exclaiming in disbelief about how ungrateful Seo Jun could be and expressing his shock and frustration at Seo Jun leaving them like this. Seo Jun's mother was in tears, covering her face while Seo Jun's younger brother seemed utterly devastated. To clear up the misunderstanding, Dong Shik quickly clarified that the letter was not a will and that Seo Jun was not dead, as they might be thinking. Tears still welled up in Seo Jun's father's eyes as he opened the envelope, expecting something else entirely. To his utter surprise, it wasn't a will but a check for 50 million won, which equated to about $37,000. This unexpected turn left Seo Jun's dad in a state of shock. Dong Shik continued, explaining that Seo Jun had urgently entered the tower and wanted to convey that he was well. Seo Jun had asked Dong Shik to deliver the check to his family. Hearing this, some of the worry in Seo Jun's family began to dissipate. Suddenly, Seo Jun's father couldn't contain his excitement. He shouted joyfully while holding the check high, expressing his pride and confidence in his son. He exclaimed that Seo Jun was indeed smart, just like him, and that he knew his son would achieve great things wherever he went. Meanwhile, Seo Jun's mother and brother were still trying to process the situation, their confusion evident. Seo Jun's mother, still concerned, asked if Seo Jun was truly doing well. She wondered why he hadn't come to deliver the check in person. Dong Shik explained that Seo Jun couldn't leave the tower due to an ongoing quest. He reassured them that some quests could take years to complete, so there was no need to worry, and Seo Jun was safe. Dong Shik then turned to Seo Jun's younger brother and asked if he was Seo Dol, to which Seo Dol replied affirmatively. He then politely asked Dong Shik to talk with him more comfortably. Then, with a serious expression, Dong Shik inquired further about Seo Jun's disappearance. He mentioned that he had heard from Seo Jun's parents that he had gone missing for five months. Dong Shik wanted to know if Seo Dol had any idea about when and how Seo Jun had entered the tower. In response, Seo Dol explained that Seo Jun had vanished suddenly five months ago. Despite inquiring with South Korea's Hunter Association, they couldn't find any records of Seo Jun entering the tower or awakening as a hunter. Dong Shik suggested that there might have been an error and promised to visit the association himself to investigate further. After hearing the whole story, Dong Shik entered into deep thought. Seo Jun's family claimed that he had entered the tower about five months ago, yet there was no official record of his entry. Furthermore, it remained a mystery how he managed to climb all the way to the 40th floor, especially given that, in the 10 years since the tower had appeared, no one had reached beyond the 38th floor. If Seo Jun had truly reached the 40th floor alone, he would be an unparalleled genius. In the midst of his contemplation, Seo Dol asked Dong Shik if there was any way he could also enter the tower and become an awakened being. He believed that he possessed talent similar to Seo Jun's. However, Seo Dol's father swiftly scolded him, delivering a light punch to his head. He emphasized that Seo Jun was toiling tirelessly inside the tower, fighting monsters without rest or proper meals, while Seo Dol was causing trouble on the outside. Dong Shik supported the father's words, explaining that becoming a hunter was an incredibly perilous occupation where one's life could be in danger at any moment. He added that the association typically recommended only one person per family to become a hunter, which seemed to calm Seo Dol down. After some time, Dong Shik decided it was time to leave. However, Seo Jun's father insisted that he stay a bit longer since they hadn't been able to offer him anything to eat. Dong Shik politely declined, explaining that he had come directly from leaving the tower and now needed to reunite with his own family. He bid farewell to Seo Jun's family, and departed. As he sat in his car, the system notified him that the quest was completed, bringing a slight smile to his face. But then his phone rang, and the caller ID read, My Happiness. It was none other than his daughter. Dong Shik's expression lit up with a wide smile as he answered, slipping into father mode and asking her if she missed her dad. The scene then shifted to Seo Jun, who had crafted a container from onion leaves and filled it with water. He placed three sprouted carrots in the container, explaining that these were the leftovers they hadn't eaten. He put the carrots in water so that when the leaves grew to a certain extent, he could cover them with soil, leaving only the root part exposed, which would then be sown into the ground. This was done because the parts that had been eaten will not regrow. When the leftover plants flowered above ground, they could collect the seeds. While Seo Jun was enjoying the serene surroundings and the pretty flowers, 
The tower manager asked if the dried sweet potatoes were ready. Startled by the reminder, Seojun stood up, realizing he had almost forgotten about them. The warrior rabbit and the white baby rabbit also seemed curious. Seojun went to check the dried sweet potatoes with the white and warrior rabbits on his shoulder. Indeed, they were ready. He gently picked up a piece, holding it close to his face. The sight made the mouths of the white and warrior rabbits water with anticipation. Seojun and the rabbits took a bite, and it was absolutely delicious. The sweet potatoes were so good that the rabbits felt like they were floating in the air, holding their cheeks in delight. Seojun's eyes sparkled with joy as he exclaimed that no one in the world could resist the soft, chewy, sweet, and addicting texture of these sweet potatoes. He was enjoying them so much that he had almost eaten them all unknowingly. Realizing that he had to share, Seojun saved some more sweet potatoes to dry. While the rabbits were still savoring the meal, the tower manager reminded him that he seemed to be forgetting something. Then, Seo Jun felt a need to make things right. He apologized to the tower manager for the delay and went on to prepare dried sweet potatoes in an onion leaf bucket. However, as he was about to hand it over, he hesitated, thinking there might be a better way to present it. The tower manager, growing impatient, urged him to hurry up, but Seo Jun paused again. He felt that simply offering the food in the scallion bowl didn't seem quite right. He had a different idea. The tower manager reassured him that the presentation didn't matter, even if he gave the dried sweet potato directly in his hand. But Seo Jun had something special in mind. He carefully wrapped the dried sweet potatoes in a plastic bag, tied it with a cute ribbon made from onion leaves, and presented this beautifully wrapped gift to the tower manager. Seeing the thought and effort Seo Jun had put into packaging the dried sweet potatoes, the tower manager fell momentarily silent. Seo Jun beamed with excitement, explaining that this way, the dried sweet potatoes would stay fresh for a longer time without worrying about spoiling. Yet the tower manager remained silent, which left Seo Jun puzzled. He anxiously asked her if she didn't like it. In a bit of a panic, the tower manager finally replied with a simple thanks and accepted the gift-wrapped dried sweet potatoes. Seo Jun sat there with his arms crossed, pondering the tower manager's lukewarm reaction to his carefully packaged dried sweet potatoes. He had thought she would appreciate the effort he put into making them look nice. However, it seemed the tower manager's response hadn't been what he expected. Subscribe to the channel or I will get upset, and thank you all guys for 100k subscribers. It means a lot. Now, let's continue to the video. On the other side, the tower manager was blushing intensely, her cheeks red, and she was trembling while holding Seo Jun's special food. She couldn't contain her excitement and shouted about how she couldn't eat something so cute. Meanwhile, we could see Seo Jun enjoying the dried sweet potatoes. He marveled at how he had dried 40 sweet potatoes, yet they seemed to disappear in a single day. The rabbits were munching on the dried sweet potatoes joyfully. Then suddenly our queen, oh sorry, the queen bee approached Seo Jun and greeted him. She handed him a yellow gooey ball made of her saliva and corn pollen. Seo Jun checked its status and found out what it was. It seemed that, since there was no honey in corn, the bees couldn't collect honey from it, so they gathered corn pollen instead. Seo Jun decided to try the special treat the queen bee had prepared for him. As he took a bite, he smiled warmly and commented that it was slightly bitter but sweet, with a chewy texture that felt like candy. He thanked the queen bee for her special treat, and she couldn't help but feel happy. Suddenly, the queen bee took charge, commanding all the little bees to gather around. She stood proudly, her chest held high, as the little bees brought Seo Jun a bunch of special treats that she had prepared. Seo Jun happily accepted these gifts. However, just as things were getting merry, Theo came jumping and shouting that he was back. But as soon as he laid eyes on the queen bee, he instinctively got into a defensive posture. He was still quite scared of her. Seo Jun assured him that the queen bee was on their side. Still skeptical, Theo cautiously approached the queen bee. To everyone's surprise, the queen bee offered Theo some of her special treats. However, Theo's fear of pollen overcame his desire for treats, and he clung to Seo Jun's leg, saying he hated pollen. Seo Jun tried to pry Theo off gently, explaining that his clothes were his only set, and if they got damaged, he'd have to go around naked. The queen bee couldn't help but hold her mouth with her hand, cheekily laughing at the scene. After calming down, Seo Jun addressed Theo as Sales Cat Theo and asked if he had completed the job Seo Jun had assigned him. Theo proudly replied that he had indeed completed the mission and had even sold out all the goods. Seo Jun eagerly inquired if Theo had conveyed his message to his family. Theo showed Seo Jun the system notification that confirmed the quest had been completed. This meant that Seo Jun's message had been delivered. Seo Jun was overjoyed, thinking that the 50 million won must have reached his family. 
Now, with a sense of relief, Seo Jun felt tension free. He had disappeared from his family without saying a word, unable to leave the tower. But at least now his family knew that he was doing well. However, Seo Jun couldn't help but reflect on how his family must be surprised to learn that he was farming with his cute little rabbit family inside the tower instead of hunting and clearing floors. He imagined that if his younger brother Seo Dol found out that his job was farming, he would certainly tease him, as farming was Seo Dol's specialty. On the other hand, his father had a hobby of growing flowers, so he might show a great interest in Seo Jun's agricultural endeavors. Feeling a little emotional and missing his family, especially his mom, is how he used to eat food prepared by her with his family. He looked up at the sky. Suddenly, the warrior rabbit grabbed Seo Jun's leg, startling him. Seo Jun looked around and noticed that all the rabbits, Theo and the queen bee, were looking at him, trying to comfort him. It worked as Seo Jun patted the warrior rabbit with his right hand and Theo with his left, wearing a warm smile. The queen bee sat on Seo Jun's head, hugging it and patting him gently. It was truly an emotional moment for Seo Jun, who himself acknowledged that they were like his family. Then Theo, with one hand on his pouch, mentioned that he had used 50 tower coins for the contract and 14.2 for the errand, leaving him with 208.8 tower coins. Seo Jun was left shocked, holding the large pouch of tower coins, while Theo proudly stated that the things Seo Jun had taught him were indeed useful. But the surprises didn't end there. Theo emptied his pouch, revealing modern cooking equipment. Seo Jun was left speechless as he held a frying pan, unable to believe that he was seeing one after so long. Meanwhile, the warrior rabbit was watching the pan intently, and one baby rabbit had stuck its head into a saucepan, adding a touch of humor to the moment. Then, Seo Jun finds that even the cast iron pot has an information window, and its own item marks since it was made in the tower. He finds that the item was ranked D, and its manufacturer detail was disclosed. He asks Theo about the last part, but before he can get an answer, he spots a dagger on the ground. As he picks it up, he feels like he's inside the tower for the first time in ages. His eyes gleam with wonder and excitement as he says that this was his first weapon ever since he came inside the tower. The information window of the dagger does not tell him much and is full of question marks, but it mentions that the dagger was an E-rank and only those with strength above 5 and a level above 10 could wield it. Seo Jun is curious about the question marks and he asks Theo where he got the dagger from. But Theo is busy playing with the rabbits with a paper wind toy. Theo revealed to Seo Jun that he found the dagger in a lottery shop and thought Seo Jun might like it as a gift. Seo Jun, intrigued, examined the dagger more closely, hoping to learn more about its properties. However, when he checked the status window, it displayed only question marks. The only information he could glean was that he met the necessary criteria to use the dagger. Seo Jun contemplated trying out the dagger, but the tower manager intervened. She cautioned him that this dagger was an unappraised item, which was why its information wasn't visible. Using an unappraised item could be perilous. However, she offered to appraise the dagger for Seo Jun. Two new quests appeared, one to send the dagger to the tower manager for appraisal and another to send roasted sweet potatoes as a gift to the tower manager as part of the appraisal process. Seo Jun found this situation suspicious. As far as he knew, Using unappraised items usually didn't result in any harm. Unappraised simply meant the item's rank was unidentified, and it could be either good or bad. Despite his reservations, the tower manager seemed a bit panicked, insisting that Seo Jun didn't understand the potential risks. Eventually, Seo Jun agreed to proceed with the quests. However, the tower manager's next action surprised him. The system notified Seo Jun that the tower manager was wiping her saliva, and Seo Jun catches her red-handed, saying he knew it, but he lets it slide and decides to do the quest. First, he handed over the dagger for appraisal. The tower manager employed her appraisal skill, concluding that the dagger was not a harmful item. Then, as Seo Jun presented the dried sweet potatoes, the manager returned his dagger to him. Seo Jun, now in possession of the dagger, proceeded to read the information inscribed upon it. The dagger bore the name Eyes's Training Short Dagger and had been employed by the Ranger Eyes of the Red Mountain during his childhood training days. Seo Jun couldn't help but be astounded by the information he had gleaned about the dagger. The mere fact that it was a named weapon was a rarity in itself, and even the most modest of named weapons in the world outside the tower could fetch prices of at least 50 million won. Seo Jun was left in awe, contemplating Theo's remarkable ability to acquire such an item through the lottery. 
it was becoming increasingly evident that Theo possessed a keen talent for locating valuable and practical items. Then we see Theo and the baby rabbit enjoy their churu treat, and Seo Jun takes a moment to inspect his farms. Suddenly, he assumes a fighting stance and uses the newly acquired dagger to slash at the onion plants in front of him. The dagger proves to be quite sharp, and he turns to the rabbits asking for their thoughts on his newfound skill. They respond by clapping their tiny paws, and Seo Jun can't help but smile with pride. Theo, noticing Seo Jun's satisfaction with the dagger, inquires if he likes it. Seo Jun expresses his genuine admiration for the weapon, acknowledging that Theo made an excellent choice. However, Theo becomes irked when he hears his name used instead of his title, Sales Cat Theo, which Seo Jun had promised to give him in return for completing the missions. Seo Jun quickly corrects himself and addresses Theo properly. Theo, still maintaining his air of arrogance, accepts the apology and informs Seo Jun that he'll let it slide this time. He then playfully pushes Seo Jun's hands away. In a surprising turn of events, Seo Jun notices that despite Theo appearing as a naive pushover at times, the cat actually possesses adorable golden paws. Before he knows it, Seo Jun starts playing with Theo's paw pads, finding him incredibly cute and even begins making funny faces. Annoyed by Seo Jun's fascination with his paws, Theo questions what he's doing. Seo Jun playfully responds that Theo's paws look incredibly adorable. He then holds Theo in his lap and offers him another pack of churu. However, the warrior rabbit is looking a bit downcast as Theo is getting all the attention. On the other hand, Theo is overjoyed and celebrates internally, considering that, in the end, even Seo Jun, as a human, can't resist the undeniable superiority of his paws. He chuckles, arrogantly urging Seo Jun to hurry with the treat. But Seo Jun doesn't appreciate Theo's attitude and begins to suspect something fishy. Silently, he picks Theo up and places him on the ground, stating that Theo's one-hour shift as the sales cat is over. The warrior rabbit tries to contain his laughter. Panicked, Theo clings to Seo Jun's leg, pleading for more time as the sales cat. However, despite Theo's numerous requests, Seo Jun remains firm in his decision. With no other choice, Theo angrily decides to reveal his secret weapon. He places his hand on the pouch and asks Seo Jun to take a look at the other items he possesses. As he empties his bag, modern food items start spilling out, leaving Seo Jun trembling with excitement. Seo Jun excitedly crawls on the ground, holding salt while Theo proudly brags about how he obtained these seasonings as a reward for taking pictures. Seo Jun pours a bit of salt into his hand, and as he tastes it, he's overwhelmed by the salty flavor, something he hasn't experienced in months. Curious, he smells and tastes the other seasonings, savoring the spiciness of the pepper, the rich flavors of various spices, and the depth that these seasonings bring to his food. He can't contain his excitement, exclaiming about the newfound flavors. However, the warrior rabbit, after tasting the salt, doesn't seem to enjoy it, as it's too bitter for his liking. Theo takes this opportunity to ask Seo Jun if he believes he deserves to be the sales cat now. He requests to be the sales cat for two hours in exchange for these items. Overjoyed, Seo Jun lifts Theo up and swings him around, declaring that he can be the sales cat for as long as he wishes with these items. As Seo Jun dances around in delight, the baby rabbit has already begun trying out the salt on his carrot. With the help of the new utensils and seasonings, Seo Jun cooks a fantastic meal that day, and its enticing aroma wafts out of the cave. He prepares grilled fish, seasoning it with salt and pepper before skewering it with onion stems. As he hums while cooking, the smell reaches the rabbit's home, waking them from their slumber and enticing them to the lunch gathering. Seo Jun greets them with a cheerful good morning and inquires if they're hungry because he's prepared a special meal to showcase his culinary skills. The feast includes fish and onion skewers, roasted potatoes, dried sweet potatoes, roasted fish, roasted onions, and, of course, salt and pepper. Seo Jun encourages everyone to choose their preferred dishes and add more salt and pepper if they desire extra seasoning, but most of the white rabbits found the pepper too spicy but the black warrior rabbit relished the seasoned meal. Theo, on the other hand, was still sleeping when Seo Jun respectfully woke him up for breakfast. Seo Jun asked how Theo wanted his roasted fish seasoned, but this question irritated Theo. He hissed at Seo Jun, emphasizing that no one should play around with food by adding anything to it. Theo chooses to sit on Seo Jun's lap and enjoys his plain roasted fish. Seo Jun, still a bit frustrated, tells Theo that he doesn't understand the greatness of salt and pepper. After their hearty breakfast, Seo Jun and the rabbits return to their daily work, harvesting potatoes. Seo Jun used his named dagger to cut the tomato bunches, and to his surprise, not only did his farming skill increase, 
but his levels and dagger skills improved as well. He was shocked to discover that cutting crops with the dagger had a similar effect to defeating monsters and increasing his dagger skill. Seo Jun realized that a B-ranked named item like his dagger was indeed a wonderful tool, and he was determined to work hard and quickly increase his proficiency with it. After harvesting a bunch of cherry tomatoes, Seo Jun handed them to Theo, assigning him the task of plucking them one by one and storing them in his bag. Theo, clearly unhappy with this task, complained and questioned why he had to do such manual labor when he was the sales cat. Seo Jun, who had a strong work ethic, replied that there was no shame in working with their hands. He reminded Theo that he, Seo Jun, was the chairman of this farming operation, and that he too was actively involved in farm work. This revelation stunned Theo, who then asked Seo Jun if being a chairman was a higher position than being a sales cat. Seo Jun confirmed that it was a high-ranking position and encouraged Theo to keep working diligently as he might also reach such a level one day. Theo, with his arrogance momentarily set aside, agreed to work hard. However, he couldn't help but chuckle mischievously inside, thinking about the day when he might rise to the position of chairman and have the authority to command Seo Jun as he pleased. Then, Theo prepares to leave for his work, his bag filled with the harvested cherry tomatoes. Seo Jun requests that Theo stops by the lottery store again and buys anything he likes because he doesn't want to let the cat's remarkable talent go to waste. Theo waves his paws dismissively and assures Seo Jun that he will be back soon before he departs. With Theo on his way to work, Seo Jun could now focus on harvesting the remaining cherry tomatoes in the row. His efforts were rewarded with 90 XP for picking six tomatoes at once, a 50% increase from the usual amount. He couldn't help but wonder why the XP gain was so high, and the answer became clear as he read the information window about the cherry tomatoes he had just collected. The reason for the high XP gain was that these tomatoes were of rank D. They were no ordinary tomatoes. Each D-ranked tomato could break down 20 grams of fat when consumed and boost stamina by 0.2 for 10 minutes. Their shelf life had also extended to 60 days. Seo Jun was astonished to see how upgrading the crop from E-ranked to D-ranked nearly doubled all its attributes. What's more, these D-ranked tomatoes were even tastier than the previous ones. Seo Jun wondered if there were more crops like this waiting to be discovered. He had recently leveled up significantly, becoming a D-ranked tower farmer. He suspected that all the crops he cultivated after leveling up had grown to D-rank. He pondered about how he could have introduced the D-ranked potatoes to the market and fetched an even higher price if Theo had waited a bit longer. However, it was pointless to dwell on it now. Seo Jun decided to find out how much the taste had improved as the rank of the tomatoes increased by one. He suggested to his rabbit friends that they should enjoy the new tomatoes and then take a nap together. No one had any objection. As Theo made his way down to the fifth floor, he felt a sense of disappointment. Then the scene shifts and we see the tower manager entering a dark room full of treasures. There was a super rare statue of the tower manager herself, whose name is Spleen Fratani. This statue was made by another dragon named Kaiser Fratana, using a piece of ice from the Blue Penguin Kingdom. But the tower manager didn't care much about this beautiful ice statue. She broke it into pieces and replaced it with the sweet potatoes that Seo Jun had given her. This room had a magic spell that kept things safe forever. So, instead of eating the cute-looking sweet potatoes, the tower manager decided to keep them here like a special treasure. She acted like a schoolgirl with a crush when talking about Seo Jun's gift. At first, she almost said, my human, but then corrected herself, saying Seo Jun gave it to her, so she had to treasure it. The tower manager continued her usual routine of stalking Seo Jun through her crystal ball. When she saw him peacefully sleeping, she couldn't help but smile mischievously, her mind filled with naughty thoughts. However, her expression suddenly changed as she noticed something concerning, and her face turned serious. Seo Jun woke up because of many system notifications telling him to. He was confused and still sleepy when he asked the tower manager why she woke him up. The tower manager urgently told him it was no time to sleep. When Seo Jun looked around, he saw something scary at the cave's entrance and screamed. The black warrior rabbit on his shoulder also got curious. It was a red bear, but it was tiny, almost like a teddy bear. The tower manager tried to make it go away, but it slipped and ended up inside the cave. Seo Jun panicked and rushed to catch it, wondering if a dog had fallen from the sky. But when he checked the information, he found out it was a baby crimson giant bear, a bear that looked innocent but was still pretty big for a baby bear. It was just staring at Seo Jun with big eyes. Seo Jun was shocked as he held the baby giant crimson bear in his arms, wondering if it was the offspring of the monster that had once attacked the cave on a blue moon night. 
The giant crimson bear had been truly ferocious, and in comparison, its baby looked incredibly small and cute. Seo Jun was uncertain about what to do with the bear cub, who appeared quite innocent. However, the tower manager questioned why he had caught it. Seo Jun explained that he couldn't let the baby bear fall, as it would have been dangerous for the cub otherwise. The manager urged Seo Jun to send the bear out of the cave quickly, suggesting that its mother might be nearby and searching for it. Seo Jun decided not to send the baby bear away immediately. Instead, he gently placed the cub on the ground, feeling that it was too small to be separated from its mother just yet. He believed it would be better to wait for the mother bear to return and retrieve her offspring. But the baby bear noticed the rabbits and got excited because he had never seen creatures his size before. Playfully, he began to run towards the rabbits. However, the white rabbits, feeling a bit scared, quickly hid behind the chubby rabbits. The sickle rabbit and the warrior rabbit stood their ground, adopting a defensive stance. However, the tower manager issued a warning, stating that the crimson bear was a gluttonous monster and might consume all the food in the cave. Seo Jun thought the manager was overreacting and reassured that the baby bear was just a small cub, unlikely to cause any harm. He observed as the baby bear tried to befriend the black rabbit and felt joy seeing the rabbit patting the bear's head. While playing with the rabbits, the baby bear noticed the poison honeybees and their queen. He attempted to chase them, but the small honeybees perceived him as a threat to their queen, which made them aggressive. They glared at the baby bear and pursued it, causing the cub to become frightened and run to Seojun for protection. Clinging to Seojun's feet, the bear sought comfort and Seojun spoke to the bees, explaining that the baby bear was not an enemy and should not be attacked. He then reassured the bear, explaining that the bees had reacted aggressively because of its sudden approach and urged it not to cry. Seo Jun then asked the baby bear if it had rushed towards the queen bee because she is thick, because he had smelled something nice from her. However, the baby bear could only respond with cries, unable to provide a verbal answer. Seeing the cub in such a pitiful state, Seo Jun requested a favor from the queen bee. Although she initially resisted, although she initially resisted, the queen bee reluctantly agreed with a sigh. The queen bee prepared her special juice and gave it to the baby bear, placing it gently in his little hand. The baby bear's face lit up with joy as he received the sweet treat. He stared at the special juice for a moment, and Seo Jun encouraged him to take a bite. With excitement, the baby bear began licking the special juice, savoring its delicious taste. The chubby bear companions patted the baby bear's head affectionately, sharing in his happiness. Seo Jun realized that he had figured it out. The baby bear had chased the queen bee because of her thick because of her honey. He watched as the bear savored the honey, with the queen bee elegantly sitting on Seo Jun's shoulder. After finishing the honey, the baby bear returned to Seo Jun, who continued to pamper it, and asked if it wanted more honey. However, the tower manager, who had been growing increasingly furious, suddenly snapped at Seo Jun, generating an emergency quest to remove the baby crimson bear from the cave. The reward for completing the quest was a job-related skill, and the penalty for rejecting it was starving to death. The manager expressed anger toward the baby bear, causing Seo Jun and the queen bee to be shocked. Seo Jun couldn't contain his frustration and shouted at the tower manager, deeming the situation unfair. He argued that the baby bear was just an innocent cub and couldn't possibly eat enough to endanger anyone. He even accused the manager of being jealous. The tower manager explained that she wants to keep Seo Jun safe and avoid making any mistakes that she might regret later. She's concerned about Seo Jun's well-being and thinks the baby bear could be a threat to him. Seo Jun, hearing this, became a little angry. He mentioned that he wasn't supposed to be on the 99th floor and ended up here because of her. He questioned why she was suddenly so concerned about his safety. Then the tower manager admitted it was her honest mistake that Seo Jun is stuck on 99th floor because of her and asked Seo Jun to please listen to her order just this once. Hearing this, Seo Jun hugged the baby bear and mentioned that coming into the tower was a mistake too, which made him sad. It was the first time that the rabbits and bees saw him so down. However, the tower manager eventually gave up after seeing how gloomy Seo Jun and his friends looked, telling him he could do as he pleased. Seo Jun wasn't pleased either, and questioned why the manager was so worried about the little monster eating. He agreed to a compromise, saying he'd send the baby bear outside when the time was right. He lifted the baby bear, who was sleeping peacefully, and decided to let him stay in the cave for the day and send him back tomorrow. The next day, while everyone was still fast asleep, the baby bear woke up unusually early, his little mind set on a secret mission. After a while, the black rabbit awoke from his slumber, and as soon as he opened his eyes, he was struck with utter shock. 
His mouth hung wide open and he began to scream in surprise. The commotion jolted Seo Jun awake, and he quickly realized that the baby bear was nowhere to be seen. Rubbing his eyes and yawning, Seo Jun scratching his little pee pee, he made his way over to where the rabbits were gathered, their voices filled with anger and astonishment, and he was shocked by what he saw. There were half-eaten carrots and sweet potatoes scattered on the ground, and one of their storage areas was empty. The baby bear was rummaging through the remaining stores for more food, looking confused about what he had done wrong. Seo Jun was devastated, but the rabbits were furious. The black rabbit even grabbed his hammer, ready to scold the baby bear, while the others scolded him verbally. Seo Jun checked the remaining stores and found that one-third of their sweet potatoes and carrots had been eaten or damaged. After being scolded by the rabbits, the baby bear ran to Seo Jun and started crying. Seo Jun picked him up and realized that the baby bear had grown twice in size overnight, becoming much larger and heavier. Seo Jun remembered that plants and animals inside the tower grew at a different rate, and he wasn't surprised anymore. But he also remembered the tower manager's warning that the baby bear could eat all their food. He realized he should have listened to her. The manager sent Seo Jun another message, explaining that baby crimson bears were the biggest gluttons in the tower and could eat up to 100 kilograms of food every day if available. Seo Jun realized his mistake and asked for the manager's forgiveness. And the tower manager responds that she doesn't mind anymore since Seo Jun has apologized. Seo Jun then mentions that he thought the manager was jealous because he fed the baby bear cub. The tower manager clarifies that what's important now is to send the baby crimson bear away. Seo Jun agrees but wonders how to do it. Suddenly he gets a brilliant idea. He makes a rope out of onion leaves and ties it around the baby bear like a harness. After preparing everything, Seo Jun asks the team of rabbits outside the cave if they are ready. They are all set to help get the bear cub out. Using the rope, with the other end secured to a tree outside the cave, they begin pulling the bear cub up. Everyone, except the mother rabbit and the worker bees, puts in their full strength. Seo Jun encourages them, and slowly but surely, the baby bear starts coming out of the cave. However, once outside, the bear cub begins to struggle. He doesn't want to leave. He starts crying. Seo Jun offers him some honey to calm him down and explains that he should go back to his mom now. The honey helps soothe the bear, and he stops resisting being pulled up. Seo Jun and the queen bee wave goodbye as the baby bear cutely exits the cave while enjoying the queen bee's special treat. The bear also waves his hand, bidding his farewell. Then the quest to send him out is completed. The tower manager rewards Seo Jun with a skill called Seed Gathering Level 1 which slightly increases the chance of obtaining better seeds from harvesting crops. The bear cub is dropped off by the rabbits, and as they return to the cave, all of them are tired. Seo Jun commends them for their hard work, but then everyone feels hungry at the same time. Seeing their supplies depleted, he asks them if they should eat cherry tomatoes today. But then a few days later, something unexpected happens. Seo Jun and his rabbit friends are greeted by a giant bear that casts its shadow inside the cave, with the baby bear in her giant hands. It's the exact same bear that tried to attack Seo Jun on the blue moon. Everyone is shocked and afraid as they look upward with open mouths. The baby bear had invited his mama, the giant crimson bear. Now Seo Jun is sweating profusely as he imagined the mama bear angrily picking him up and scolding him for kidnapping her child for a full day. He fears that she won't forgive him and will eat him. Helpless against her enormous size and strength, Seo Jun begins to wonder if he will die here without ever seeing his family again. With fear gripping him, Seo Jun gets down on his knees and begs the mother bear to spare him, emphasizing that he's not tasty at all because the only thing he eats is tomatoes. However, much to Seo Jun's surprise, the mama bear appears puzzled rather than angry. The tower manager intervenes and explains that the mama bear isn't interested in eating Seo Jun. Instead, she conveys that the baby bear wants Seo Jun to provide her with the queen bee's special saliva mixed honey to feed her cub, as the little bear loved the thick, loved the taste, and was begging his mother for it. Seo Jun takes a moment to process this unexpected turn of events. He realizes that the bear mom isn't here for herself, but for her cub. As the mother bear growls loudly, the black rabbit covers his ears and the tower manager translates that the mother bear intends to protect the surrounding area in exchange for the honey. Relieved, Seo Jun and his rabbit friends are no longer in fear. He assures the giant crimson bear that he will provide her with the honey. The tower manager instructs Seo Jun to climb onto the mama bear's massive paw. He happily complies and settles onto the bear's paw. 
With a gentle motion, the giant bear slowly lifts him out of the cave. Seo Jun looks back at his well-tended farms inside the cave from this unique vantage point and feels a wave of nostalgia. He silently thanks his crops, which have thrived in the cave, and sustained him during his time there. As he emerges from the cave, Seo Jun is momentarily stunned by the brightness of the outside world. Gradually, his eyes adjust, revealing a breathtaking sight. He can't help but exclaim in amazement as he takes in the vast expanse of the tower. In the center, there's a towering structure aglow with light, and a vast mountain range stretches outward from it towards his location. Seo Jun realizes that he's quite far from the central tower, making the mountains appear small and relatively barren from this distance. Still awestruck, Seo Jun questions whether this expansive area is really inside the tower. His gaze then shifts to the central tower and the radiant beam shooting skyward. Curious, he asks the tower manager about it. She explains that it's a waypoint, leaving Seo Jun shocked by the revelation that waypoints are the only means by which hunters can move between the tower's floors. These waypoints consist of giant magic crystals encased within stone structures. Seo Jun's hopes soar at the prospect of using the waypoint to escape the tower, first reaching the first floor and then the real world. However, the reality of how to reach the waypoint sets in. The distance seems insurmountable, especially at a normal human walking pace. So he turns to the mama bear and asks if she might be able to take him closer to the waypoint. The mother bear responds with something the tower manager interprets as a refusal. Seo Jun wants to understand why, and the manager explains that the area leading to the waypoint is not within her territory. To reach the waypoint, the mother bear would have to defeat approximately 3,000 monsters, each with its boss, in areas outside her territory. Even for her, this would be a challenging task. Understanding that there are formidable monsters on the way to the waypoint, Seo Jun realizes that the journey won't be easy, even with the bear's assistance. The mother bear then points to the forest on the other side of the cave, which the tower manager interprets as indicating her territory extends from the forest inside the cave to the surrounding area. She implies that while she can protect Seo Jun within her territory outside of it, there are dangerous monsters that could harm him, and even she would struggle to defeat them while safeguarding him. Upon understanding the mother bear's message, Seo Jun said, It's okay, with a sad face. Then we saw the queen bee, the white rabbits, and the black rabbit also coming out from the cave. The black rabbit brought Seo Jun's bag and handed it to him. Seo Jun thanks the black rabbit, and as the queen bee perches on his shoulder, the baby bear affectionately hugs the black rabbit. At first, the rabbit is taken aback, but he soon happily pats the bear cub's head. Meanwhile, the mother bear is communicating something to Seo Jun. As she exhales loudly, a powerful warm wind blows, startling the queen honeybee, who hides behind Seo Jun, clinging to him while the bear cub licks the warrior rabbit. Seo Jun grasps the mother bear's message this time and retrieves a bottle of honey from his bag. He tells the bear cub it's time to enjoy some honey, and the bear eagerly turns to him after having nearly drenched the black rabbit's face in drool. Excitement sparkles in the bear cub's eyes as it starts savoring the honey, with everyone watching. Seo Jun then asks the mother bear if she'd like some honey too, and the queen bee becomes even more timid. The tower manager conveys the mother bear's response that she's fine and wants Seo Jun to give the honey only to her cub. She explains that there wasn't much to eat in this area, which is why her cub hadn't been growing well. However, in just one day in the cave, he grew significantly. Reflecting on that day, Seo Jun feels upset, along with the queen bee. He realizes that the bear cub grew so much because it ate a substantial amount, nearly depleting their stored food. The mother bear adds that the honey's sweet smell will be very beneficial, and the queen bee, now bashful at receiving compliments, hides beside Seo Jun, covering her face with his shirt. Seo Jun then inquires if there was nothing for her to eat in the forest, and if she starved herself. He has recently learned that giant crimson bears consume a lot, and if the cub couldn't get enough food, she wouldn't either. The mother bear reveals that she had been starving for three days while searching for this cave. Shocking Seo Jun. He firmly believes that, even though her baby is a priority, mothers shouldn't put themselves through such hardship. He tells her to wait for a moment and gives an urgent order to the black hunter rabbit. Seo Jun plans to showcase his culinary skills to the mother bear. Inside the cave, the black rabbit hunts for fish, while the sickle rabbit chops carrots into small pieces. Seo Jun quickly utilizes the ingredients his rabbit friends gathered to prepare a delicious stew. In the stew, he combines carrots, onions, tomatoes, and fish, creating a flavorful dish. As he tastes it, 
He deems it complete and perfect. Seojun not only makes a generous amount of stew for the mother bear, but also roasts skewers of fish and onions, whole roasted fish and various vegetables. The giant crimson bear seems a bit bewildered by this feast, but her cub is already drooling with anticipation. Seojun explains that while the stew may have simple ingredients, it's rich in taste and nutrition, and the baby bear eagerly starts eating. Seojun encourages the mother bear to enjoy the meal as well, emphasizing that it will help her baby grow up healthy and well protected. At the mention of food, the mother bear can't contain her emotions and suddenly wraps her massive paws around Seo Jun and the two rabbits who assisted him, giving them a heartfelt bear hug. The embrace is overwhelming for them, and Seo Jun and the rabbits cry out in a mixture of surprise, happiness, and a hint of discomfort from the tight bear hug. Meanwhile, the tower manager was watching this from the office. Seeing this, the manager sighed, saying that she had been watching over the bear family ever since the bear cub left the cave a few days ago because she was worried that the baby bear would call its mom to attack the cave. The manager did not know why, but the crimson giant bear wanted to establish friendly relations with Seo Jun. And since she thought it was a good thing, she stepped up and told the mother bear that she would act as an interpreter so that Seo Jun and the mother bear could become good friends. Now, happily with a big smile, she thought that she was glad that she would have more to eat if Seo Jun came out of the cave and increased his farming field. She thought that if the giant crimson bear became his bodyguard, she would have one less thing to worry about, and it would be like killing two birds with one stone. And then she started praising herself, saying that this was to be expected of the genius Black Dragon. In the middle floors of the tower, within the wandering Merchant Inspector Bureau, Inspector Zarath was engrossed in reading a report regarding Theo. Unfortunately, the report was quite lacking in information, especially considering Theo's status as a novice wandering merchant, which had afforded him certain protections within the tower. What Zareth did know was that Theo hailed from Graner Village and primarily conducted trade with humans on the lower floors. The sources from which Theo acquired his goods were unconfirmed. A similar lack of information surrounded Skarum, who, despite not appearing particularly skilled, managed to consistently turn a profit without revealing the sources of his merchandise. This raised suspicions for Zerath between Scarum and Theo. She was sure Theo was some smart burglar and would catch her. Just then, a subordinate entered and handed Zanath a file containing information about another case. This file listed stolen items that had been smuggled inside the tower. However, Zanath had little interest in this particular case. Her focus was primarily on Theo. But then another of Zerath's subordinates came to report that they had received information from one of their agents managing the passageway that a wandering merchant by the name of Theo had just arrived on the 75th floor. Zerath had been waiting for this opportunity and got up, leaving the current report on hiatus until the matter with the cat merchant was solved. She put on her hood, determined to find out the truth behind the wandering cat merchant while putting her honor as an inspector on the line. Meanwhile, unaware of the troubles coming for him, Theo was just busy eating some snacks in the market. Three days have passed since Seo Jun made the deal with the mother bear to protect him and his farm in exchange for feeding her cub. Every morning, the mother bear and her baby pay Seo Jun a visit, and there's a warm exchange of greetings between them. Seo Jun then requests the mother bear to bring him outside the cave, and as she gently carries him out into the daylight, he presents her with a substantial package of food. The mother bear expresses her gratitude and she heads out to patrol the area, leaving her now sizable baby bear in Seo Jun's care. This routine has become their daily norm, and thanks to the security the mother bear provides, Seo Jun is gradually expanding his farming operations. Together with his rabbit companions, they begin moving their belongings outside the cave, slowly clearing the rugged terrain surrounding it. However, the situation outside is a stark contrast to the fertile underground soil they were accustomed to. Here the earth is dry, littered with rocks and pebbles, making it a challenging environment for crop cultivation. Seo Jun and his trusty, shovel-wielding rabbit friend assess the situation, sharing mutual concerns about the soil's quality and the abundance of obstacles in their path. Just as worry begins to creep in, they are interrupted by the joyful roar of the baby crimson bear. They watch in amazement as he digs through the soil with bound endless enthusiasm, as if he were swimming through it. He's thoroughly enjoying himself, and Seo Jun's black warrior rabbit and cart rabbit eagerly assist by removing the stones and pebbles from the freshly dug earth. Seo Jun is elated, witnessing their dedication and effort in improving the land. He praises the bear cub for his valuable assistance 
declaring that stone removal will now be a much more manageable task. As a token of his appreciation, Seojun rewards the bear cub with a delicious roasted sweet potato, which the cub devours with great enthusiasm. Then Seojun decides to plant sweet potatoes because they might have a better chance of growing in the rocky soil. He's getting better at sowing seeds, which increases the likelihood of the sweet potatoes growing successfully. His skills are getting better, and he's gaining more experience. His rabbit friend with the shovel is there to help him. Seo Jun tells his rabbit companion that they can try growing cherry tomatoes later. However, as Seo Jun turns around, he's shocked to see the baby bear digging up and eating the sweet potatoes they just planted. He scolds the bear, letting him know they're not digging for treasures. The bear looks remorseful, realizing his mistake. Seo Jun understands that he needs to teach the bear how to plant, because they'll be staying here for a while. Meanwhile, Theo is back on the 38th floor of the tower to sell another batch of cherry tomatoes. He's selling them in groups of 300, and he has 180 of them in total. The hunters are excited about the auction. However, Theo notices that he's making less gold this time because the wealthy buyer from before isn't present. Dong Sik approaches Theo and asks if he has checked whether the contract from their previous deal has been fulfilled. Theo confirms that he has, and Dong Sik seems relieved. He requests a favor from Theo, a photo together because his daughter is fond of cats. Theo agrees, and in gratitude, Dong Sik gives him a pouch of red pepper powder. Curiosity got the best of Theo, and he became intrigued by why Seo Jun liked the spices so much. Ignoring Dong Sik's attempt to stop him, Theo decided to taste the chili powder for himself. As soon as he did, he regretted it instantly. His mouth was on fire, and he began jumping around in distress, leaving Dong Sik unsure of how to help him. After a while, we see Theo heading to the market city to upgrade his bag capacity now that he's a mid-level merchant. His face is still swollen from the red pepper powder, but he's determined to make the most of this opportunity. He's pleased that the increased bag capacity will allow him to carry more cherry tomatoes and increase his profits. He's willing to invest all the incentives he received from Seo Jun to upgrade his bag. Theo even jokes to himself that he might soon gather 1,000 tower coins and become a higher mid-class merchant. He daydreams about becoming the chairman and making Seo Jun kneel before him. However, as Theo plans to stop by the lottery store to complete Seo Jun's task, he's enticed by the delicious smell of roasted skewers from a roadside stall. He decides to soothe his still hurting tongue by indulging in some good food first. He orders a dried fish, but the stall owner asks for one tower coin. Theo, now with a dominating aura, he learned from Seo Jun, confidently asks for a discount. Panicked, the stall owner quickly gives him one. Theo happily munches on his dried fish as he continues on his way to the lottery shop. Then Theo bumped into someone, and Theo immediately recognized her as the pushover from the last time who almost got tricked by Scarum. Furious upon being called a pushover by the cat who ruined her operation, she was boiling in anger from the inside, but she had to keep calm to know all about Theo. Theo asked her what the matter was, and Zareth said that she never got to thank him for saving her back then, so she wanted to treat him to a meal. But boy, oh boy, after getting rejected by his first love, now our Theo is a chad. Theo instantly rejected the offer, saying that he is busy and started moving forward. Hearing this, Zarath was in shock and tried her best to get him to come with her. She asked him not to be so cold and said they could just have tea if he did not have much time. But Theo said that he cannot drink hot thing. Zarath changed the bait and said that one of her friends works at a really popular dessert shop where people have to wait a few years for reservation, and they can have a very special dessert there for free. Now Theo was getting annoyed by her persistence and said that he does not even like sweet things. Now, Zareth was irritated after getting rejected so many times and she had no choice but to take out her secret weapon. She then kneeled down before him and asked him to listen to her. Theo was flustered. Zareth put on an act, saying that she became a wandering merchant only recently, and that's why she lacked the skills of a merchant. She said she was very impressed when Theo saw through the clever ploy of the evil sky at once and saved a complete stranger like her out of his consideration. She said that she respected Theo and wanted to learn his merchant skills, calling him the amazing and cool great wandering merchant cat, Sir Theo. Now hearing this, Theo was overjoyed to hear so many adjectives before his name, and he smugly said that since she was so insistent, he could teach her a bit. As Zareth thanked him, she grinned because her ultimate technique had worked again. Zareth is secretly proud of herself, as her unheeded begging technique has never failed her before. She watches as Theo, feeling a bit embarrassed and awkward, 
tells her to get up. She nervously complies, and then she asks him where he's headed. He replies that he's on his way to buy something from the smithy alley. This piques Zareth's curiosity. She decides to follow him silently, wanting to see what excellent items Theo is about to purchase. They eventually arrive at a shop, but Zareth is surprised by what she sees. The shop has a 50% discount on everything, and it looks rather shabby with a collection of old, unapprised items. It's essentially a junk store. She wonders what kind of merchant skills Theo intends to teach her in a place like this. Theo approaches the shopkeeper and inquires if the sign outside is true that they really sell all items for 20 tower coins. The shopkeeper confirms it. Zareth recalls the premium and reputable shops they passed on their way here. She had suggested to Theo that if he was looking for items to resell, he should visit one of those stores. However, Theo just smugly laughed off her suggestion and told her to shut up and follow him. Now she finds herself in this seemingly run-down shop, where the owner has made it clear that most of the items are unappraised, old, and junk. Suddenly, Theo slams his paw on the table and loudly demands a discount from the shopkeeper, leaving Zenith shocked, thinking, what the hell is Theo saying? Asking for a discount on a shop that is already offering a 50% discount? How stupid is that? Theo was confident that he could secure a good deal. However, the shopkeeper surprised him by offering a slight discount, selling the items for 18 tower coins instead of the usual 20. This left Zareth speechless because Theo's bold tactics seemed to be working. Yet, Theo wasn't content with this reduction. He pushed for an even better deal, demanding a price of only 13 tower coins. He sweetened the deal by promising to become a regular customer if he received this discount. The shopkeeper, amused by Theo's determination, couldn't help but chuckle. He admitted it had been a while since he encountered such an entertaining merchant and agreed to the lower price of 13 tower coins. As Theo celebrated his triumph, Zerath couldn't quite fathom what had just transpired. She watched as Theo turned to her, grinning widely, and asked if she had seen his negotiation skills at work. She responded with praise, calling him cool, yet deep down, she couldn't shake the feeling that he had simply been stubborn. Then Zareth asks Theo what he was planning to buy here in the first place, and Theo takes a look around as he tells her that he will decide it soon. It does not take him long to find what he is looking for in an old wooden box, and he shows off an old straw hat to Zareth, saying he was planning to buy this. She cannot believe it, and asks Theo if he was serious about buying that trash thing, and he replies that he was serious but asks why she was reacting like this. Zareth asks him if he cannot see what was wrong with his choice because he did not even select a weapon, but a worn-out straw hat that definitely had to be junk. The shopkeeper hears her words and asks her if she has any complaints about his shop, and she is taken aback as she says there is nothing like that. Even Theo scolds her for being a nuisance, and she apologizes while being upset and confused about why she was apologizing. But Theo has decided to buy the straw hat as Sejun had told him to buy whatever he liked, and he liked the hat at first glance. Then they leave the shop, and he tells Zareth that since he has shown her everything, he will be going back now. She is confused, and Theo gently pats her shoulder while acting smug and tells her that his merchant techniques must have passed on to her nicely. He tells Zareth that he hopes that she becomes a good merchant, and with those parting words he takes off. She is stupefied for a moment, but then thinks that she can't help it. She thinks that despite her doubts, it would be unnatural to follow the cat merchant any more than this, and decides to retreat for now. But as she turns to go back, something clicks within Zirath's mind. She turns back in shock, takes a good look at the straw hat with Theo, and suddenly remembers that it was on the list of height-level stolen items from the landlord. She was shocked and wonders if it was really the same hat, and she tries to convince herself, thinking, there's no way, right? And was left with confusion. Inside the cave on the 99th floor, Seo Jun is meticulously extracting seeds from the carrot plants he cultivated. These carrots had unexpectedly blossomed earlier than he had anticipated, generously providing him with a bountiful harvest of seed. Seo Jun contemplates dividing them, with half to be sown in inside the cave and the other half on the land. Lately, their carrot reserves have been dwindling, mainly due to the voracious appetite of the baby bear. The rabbits, growing increasingly impatient, also warrant a larger carrot crop. Just as he's immersed in this task, the cart rabbit and the black warrior rabbit excitedly call out to Seo Jun, 
signaling that they've caught some fish for breakfast. Seo Jun briefly ponders the morning menu and decides on fish soup. He instructs the black rabbit and the sickle rabbit to prepare the fish. He has a specific purpose in mind for this meal, to cater to the pregnant mother rabbit whose waning appetite has been a concern. Seo Jun heads to collect fresh cherry tomatoes, which he intends to incorporate into the soup. He deftly harvests a handful of them using his name dagger. The father rabbit calls out to Seo Jun, reminding him to stay focused and work efficiently. Seo Jun understands that this isn't the time for distractions. He continues to prepare the food, adding some finely cut carrot leaves as garnish, and serves the clear fish soup to the pregnant mother rabbit. He takes pride in his creation, and an information window appears, describing the fish soup as a clear broth infused with Seo Jun's love and care for the mother rabbit. It's made by simmering fish, carrots, and green onions for an extended period. Seo Jun emphasizes to the mother rabbit the importance of eating well, even if she doesn't have much of an appetite, as it's crucial for her health during pregnancy. The father rabbit feels a bit awkward, but appreciates Seo Jun's concern. Seo Jun reassures him that the others are managing the farming tasks efficiently, so he should focus solely on taking care of his wife. As the father rabbit begins to feed his wife, Seo Jun shares his excitement about the upcoming arrival of the baby rabbit. Outside on the roof, the baby bear calls out to Seo Jun, and he responds that he's ready. Seo Jun dons his backpack and carries a large basket made from green onion leaves. He informs his rabbit friends that they'll be heading out to eat, leaving the crops in the care of the cart rabbit and sickle rabbit inside the cave. Seo Jun secures the basket with a rope tied around his waist and makes sure it's firmly fastened. After confirming that everything is set, he signals to the baby bear to start pulling him up, and the baby bear, despite being small, easily pulled Seo Jun up while he stood on the basket made of onion leaves. This DIY elevator was made possible because of the mommy bear's help. A few days ago, the mommy bear had moved a massive boulder and placed it beside the cave entrance. Now, using the onion rope, Seo Jun could enter and exit as he wished with great ease. Seeing the baby bear's effort, Seo Jun started patting the bear, and the baby bear responded with a happy smile. However, as the bear starts sniffing around the breakfast basket and scratching it, Seo Jun realizes that the bear's eagerness is primarily for breakfast. Seo Jun grants the bear's wish and reveals a bunch of roasted sweet potatoes. He explains that while the bear usually eats them raw, today he'll try the roasted one. Seo Jun had saved some sweet potatoes from last night's cooking, despite the manager's protests. The bear is completely captivated by the taste of the roasted sweet potatoes, eating them enthusiastically, even including the onion leaf cover. Seo Jun advises him to slow down, but by then only one sweet potato remained. Then, the baby bear had an idea. He grabbed a sweet potato in his mouth and started digging in the soil. Seo Jun, puzzled, asked the bear what he was up to. The bear pointed at the roasted sweet potato he'd just buried in the ground and patted it down. Seo Jun questioned if the bear planned to eat the sweet potato after it grew. The bear proudly nodded, thinking he'd mastered the concept of farming. However, Seo Jun and the rabbits burst into uncontrollable laughter, rolling on the floor. The bear was baffled. Seo Jun explained that planting cooked food in the ground wouldn't make it grow. Farming didn't work that way. Despite their laughter, Seo Jun promised to make more sweet potatoes for the bear. He wiped away tears of mirth and admitted it was the best laugh he'd had in a while, all thanks to the bear. But the bear's antics weren't over. Seo Jun heard a squishing sound and turned to see fish buried in the soil. The bear had planted the fish meant for breakfast. Seo Jun and the rabbits were shocked and didn't know what to say. Seo Jun realized they needed to give the bear some lessons on farming. The rabbits seemed to agree, especially considering the bear had just planted all his food in the ground and was now hungry. Meanwhile, inside the honeybee comb, which had become a grand inverted castle, the queen poisonous honeybee sat alone in her chamber. She looked gloomy and uncertain as she held a special egg in her hands. Then we see the baby bear in a fighting position, his eyes glowing red with a terrifying aura, while the warrior rabbit also readied his fighting stance, holding his hammer. The baby bear charged towards the warrior rabbit with a playful smile, but the warrior rabbit easily dodged by jumping high into the air. Then, the warrior rabbit struck the baby bear with three heavy hits, thinking the fight was over. But suddenly, the baby bear's claws reached from behind, shocking the warrior rabbit. Instead of attacking, the baby bear hugged the warrior rabbit and began licking him. It turned out to be nothing more 
than a playful session for the bear. The warrior rabbit, a bit surprised, started attacking the baby bear seriously again. However, it seemed like mere play for the baby bear, as not a single hair on the warrior rabbit was even scratched. Seo Jun, watching them, wondered whether they were training or just playing around. The chubby cart rabbit approached Seo Jun, carrying tomato and honey juice in carrot cups. Seo Jun took one of the cups and thanked the rabbit as he enjoyed a refreshing sip. The cart rabbit returned the greeting, and as Seo Jun relished the drink, his attention was drawn to the poisoned honeybees emerging from their nest. It seemed like they were starting their daily patrol, and Seo Jun wished them a safe journey. But what surprised him was when he noticed the queen honeybee among them. Her demeanor was unusually serious as she carried a small, round object wrapped in onion leaves. She flew purposefully towards Seo Jun, leaving him puzzled. It didn't make sense for the queen bee to be outside her hive, especially when she should have been busy with her duties. Seo Jun voiced his confusion and asked the queen bee about her unexpected presence. In response, the bee made an indistinct sound and gently placed the small wrapped object into Seo Jun's outstretched hands. His curiosity peaked. Seo Jun inquired about the nature of the object, but the queen bee simply shook her head before flying away. The other bees followed her, returning to the cave. With a sense of intrigue, Seo Jun decided to unwrap the mysterious gift he had received. As he carefully peeled away the layers, he made an astonishing discovery. Nestled inside was a cocoon, but not just any cocoon. It was the cocoon of a poison bee queen. This revelation left Seo Jun in awe. He realized that this cocoon was the result of the queen bee consuming his special juice and becoming pregnant. Now, it was destined to transform into another thick queen bee, rather than an ordinary worker bee. With 10 days remaining until the cocoon's hatching, Seo Jun grasped the significance of what he held in his hand. He understood that the newly emerged queen bee would regard the first being it saw as its owner. His rabbit companions listened attentively as he shared these remarkable details, still captivated by the revelation. Seo Jun understood the implications of the queen bee's gift. If a new queen were to emerge prematurely in a hive unprepared for a split, it would lead to a significant weakening of the hive's strength. He realized that the queen bee had entrusted him with the cocoon for this very reason. Seo Jun surmised that this cocoon held great importance to the queen bee, and his excitement bubbled over. He couldn't contain his joy, and in his exuberance, he startled the rabbit perched on his shoulder, causing it to tumble to the ground. Seo Jun exclaimed with delight, recognizing this as a remarkable opportunity. He was determined to put in the effort to ensure that the cocoon would hatch into an exceptional queen poison honeybee. With enthusiasm, he cheered on the future queen within the cocoon, eagerly anticipating their eventual meeting. Meanwhile, Theo had just returned from his sales expedition, having journeyed from the lower floors to the 99th floor. He was very happy, singing as he made his way towards Seo Jun's cave. Then he started laughing weirdly, thinking about how Seo Jun would kneel down, and he would enjoy the authority of ordering Seo Jun around. However, as he approached the cave entrance, he noticed a baby crimson bear. Seeing this, he got shocked and started screaming, wondering what a crimson bear was doing at the entrance of Seo Jun's cave. But then Theo noticed something. It was Seo Jun's bag in the crimson bear's mouth. Now all sorts of bad thoughts started racing through Theo's mind. His face turned pale and he became very nervous and scared, thinking, did the crimson bear kill Seo Jun? He fell to the ground, crying, while the baby bear looked on in confusion. A dark aura surrounded Theo as he unsheathed his claws and screamed in anger, saying that he hadn't even used his remaining time to become sales cat Theo, and now he had killed Seo Jun. With tears in his eyes and a deep rage burning within him, he leaped toward the crimson bear to strike it, while the bear remained bewildered, not understanding what it had done wrong. But before Theo could land a hit, Seo Jun emerged from behind, greeting Theo and welcoming him. Theo was paused in mid-air, shocked. Then he gently landed on the ground and suddenly jumped onto Seo Jun's face, who was hanging on the onion rope as he emerged from the cave. Seo Jun clung to the rope as he almost fell because of Theo suddenly jumping onto him. Then Theo, in a panic, started asking Seo Jun if he was okay and if he was hurt anywhere. Confused, Seo Jun asked what Theo was saying, but without listening to Seo Jun, Theo crawled towards Seo Jun's legs, checking if he was hurt anywhere or not, while Seo Jun was shouting that he would actually fall at this rate and then get injured for real now. Theo, not satisfied with just the presence of the giant crimson bear cub, bombards Seo Jun with questions. 
He asks Seo Jun to explain what's going on with the bear. Seo Jun, displaying patience with his inquisitive sales cat, asks Theo to limit his questions to one at a time. He steps out of the cave and proceeds to provide a comprehensive explanation. Seo Jun introduces the giant crimson bear cub to Theo, recounting how their friendship began when the cub accidentally fell into the cave. He explains that they quickly became friends, and now he has an arrangement with the bear's mother. She guards the surrounding areas in exchange for food and honey for her cub. Theo, although initially skeptical, starts to grasp the situation better. Even his rabbit friends confirm Seo Jun's account. With some relief, the cat merchant admits that he was concerned that the giant crimson bear might have devoured Seo Jun. Seo Jun acknowledges Theo's apprehension, recognizing that the cub's size could indeed pose a threat to humans. He realizes that it's time to give the bear a proper name instead of simply referring to him as a cub, making it easier for everyone to address him. Seo Jun enlists Theo's assistance in communicating with the bear cub to determine its name. Through their exchange with the bear, Seo Jun translates its response for Theo. The bear cub claims that it doesn't know anything about having a name. Since the bear cub appears excited about receiving receiving a new name, Seo Jun decides to assign it a temporary name. He's quite pleased with his choice, believing it to be excellent. When Theo inquires about the name, Seo Jun, with an air of smugness, reveals that he's chosen the name Kyung for the bear cub. Seo Jun's choice is based because the baby bear keep crying Kyung all the time. But Theo and the two rabbits present don't share his enthusiasm for the name. The fat cart rabbit's expression clearly indicates his disapproval. Theo, stepping forward, gives Seo Jun a thumbs down and criticizes his naming sense, stating that he lacks the skill for naming. Seo Jun is taken aback by Theo's reaction and turns to comfort the bear cub. He inquires if the cub likes its new name, Q, and proceeds to give it chin rubs and head pats while addressing it by the chosen name, seeking its opinion on the matter. Before the bear cub can respond, Seo Jun takes matters into his own hands by tickling the bear cub until it's rolling on the floor, unable to utter a word. It becomes evident that this was Seo Jun's ploy to coax the bear cub into accepting its new name, and it appears to have worked. However, Theo is growing increasingly frustrated with the attention Q is receiving. Climbing onto Seo Jun's head, he implores Seo Jun to stop tickling the bear cub and directs his attention to what he has brought. Theo opens his bundle and presents Seo Jun with a pouch filled with tower coins, proudly declaring that he has successfully completed all the missions and sold everything as well. Seo Jun congratulates the cat merchant on his accomplishments, commending him for a job well done. In response to Theo's query about the duration of his time as the sales cat, Seo Jun informs him that when considering the remaining time from before, he has around 38 hours left to enjoy his preferred position. Theo rejoices at the prospect of luxuriating in the privilege of being a sales cat and expresses his intention to make the most of it. He asks Seo Jun for the churros, which Seo Jun holds in his lap and begins to feed the cat merchant by hand. Theo is thoroughly content, complimenting Seo Jun on his excellent work this time, all while enjoying his favorite treats from the comfort of Seo Jun's lap. However, a sudden turn of events occurs when the baby bear unexpectedly pushes Theo aside and licks the churro instead. Theo is quick to notice this and directs a disdainful look toward the bear cub. He questions the bear cub's audacity for touching his churro and for intruding upon Seo Jun's lap while he was there. Fuming with anger, Theo warns the bear cub that he won't be forgiven for his actions and appears ready to attack him once more. Seo Jun is barely able to restrain Theo, preventing him from launching an attack on the sobbing bear cub. The bear's cries grow louder, reaching a deafening crescendo that leaves those in proximity stunned. Suddenly, the entire forest begins to tremble, creating an eerie atmosphere. As Seo Jun comprehends the impending catastrophe, a wave of terror courses through him. There's little time for him to react, for with astonishing speed and power, the mother bear emerges from the forest. Seo Jun and Theo can only gape in shock as she hurtles towards them. The colossal mother bear lands gracefully before them, and the shock wave generated by her arrival is enough to knock Seo Jun off his feet. Then the baby bear, while crying, tells his mommy that Theo bullied him, while the mommy bear stares at Theo menacingly, as if she could crush him like a bug. On the other hand, Theo is in turmoil, his tail tucked between his legs, and he is shivering in fear, as he might pee any second now. Seo Jun is left wondering what will happen next. In the previous episode, we saw how after drinking Seo Jun's special juice, the queen bee became pregnant and gave Seo Jun her cocoon. And because of the fight between Theo and the baby bear, the mommy bear came angrily, giving Theo a death stare. Theo, looking like he might pee himself at any moment, nervously greeted the mommy bear. He introduced himself as Theo, 
a wandering merchant. With a shaky voice, he showed his wandering merchant badge, hoping that upon seeing it, the mother bear might spare him. He continued, still with his shaky voice, explaining that he believed there had been a small misunderstanding with the baby bear. However, in response, the mommy bear growled loudly, and a powerful gust of wind nearly knocked Theo off his feet, leaving him barely standing in front of the mommy bear. As the bear's growls stopped, Theo found himself on his knees. Seo Jun and the other rabbits stood beside Theo, holding their ears, still affected by the bear's roar. Theo had tears in his eyes, crying in fear as he sincerely apologized. He promised that he and her baby bear would not fight anymore, and he is truly very sorry. Now seeing the situation getting out of control, Seo Jun stepped in between and tried to calm things down. He explained that it was just a little argument, and nothing serious had happened. Her baby wasn't hurt. It was just a harmless little fight. Theo, still trembling with fear, remained on the ground. Hearing Seo Jun's explanation, the mama bear stared at him for a while with a deadly looks. Then, she let out a heavy breath and turned to move back into the jungle. Seo Jun and Theo, still scared and in a state of panic, watched her go. As the bear left, Seo Jun let out a sigh of relief. He admitted that he thought they were in real danger today. The white rabbits huddled together for comfort. While Theo was still crying, his sobs interrupted by hiccups. Seeing Theo in this state, Seo Jun adopted a caring tone. He held Theo and asked if he was all right, urging him to calm down as the mama bear had left. Theo slowly wiped his tears and managed to say thank you to Seo Jun, his hiccups persisting like a little child. Then Seo Jun gently held Theo and placed him on his lap, cradling him like a baby. He apologized sincerely, expressing regret that if he had informed Theo about the mama bear, this whole frightening situation might have been avoided. But Theo was still crying, his sobs punctuated by continuous hiccups, and he covered his eyes with his paws. The other rabbit sat beside Theo, watching him with sad expressions. To comfort Theo, the warrior rabbit began to lick him gently. For a moment, Theo stopped crying, surprised by the unexpected comfort. Then the other rabbits joined in, licking and tickling Theo. Slowly, Theo's sobs subsided, and he finally stopped crying as the tickling made him giggle. From a distance, the baby bear watched as all the rabbits licked and tickled Theo, making him laugh loudly. It was clear that they were all having a wonderful time. However, as the baby bear observed this joyful scene, he suddenly felt a wave of sadness wash over him. He lowered his head, his eyes filled with gloom. Unable to bear seeing Theo so sad, the baby bear approached Seo Jun and with gentle care started licking Theo as well. It was his way of apologizing for calling his mama earlier, which had frightened Theo. Theo, now smiling a little, told the baby bear that he was also sorry and that they could be good friends from now on. Seo Jun and the rabbits watched this heartwarming moment with happiness. However, Theo politely asked the baby bear not to eat his treat, explaining that it was very hard to find it, and the baby bear agreed, understanding the importance of Theo's treat. After a while, as everyone calmed down, Seo Jun spoke up. He said that they were all like a happy big family. As he said this, the rabbits started yawning and were sitting on Seo Jun's lap and shoulder. Theo rested in Seo Jun's hand, and Seo Jun himself sat comfortably on the baby bear's lap. Together, they all yawned, feeling sleepy as they slowly closed their eyes, ready to embrace a peaceful rest. But, due to the commotions, the rabbit couple emerged from their cave. Then, the husband rabbit noticed the straw hat that Theo had brought for Seo Jun from the lottery shop on the ground. He picked it up happily from Theo's pouch, and the mother rabbit pointed her fingers towards Seo Jun. As they observed, they saw Seo Jun and his companions sleeping like newborn babies. Seo Jun was resting against the baby bear while Theo lay in Seo Jun's lap. The warrior rabbit perched on Seo Jun's shoulder, and the other white rabbit found a cozy spot on the baby bear's stomach. Then, the mother rabbit said something to the husband rabbit, and he gently placed the straw hat on Seo Jun's head. The hat shielded Seo Jun's face from the direct sunlight, and as he slept with the hat covering his face, a warm smile graced his lips. Well, seeing this... I myself want to sleep between them. The scene shifts to a different dimension, a galaxy-like expanse with a hovering palace emanating brilliant light. As we draw closer, we witness four enormous black dragons encircling a crystal, radiating intense light with lightning bolts flickering around it. There is also a human-like figure close to the crystal. Upon closer inspection, we discern the identity of this being. It was Kaiser Fratani, the grandfather of our tower manager. He appears to be struggling to manipulate the crystal, but suddenly, the crystal's power spirals out of control. In frustration, he shouts, questioning why the portal to the tower is not opening. Then from behind, a calming voice speaks out, 
urging Kaiser to calm down. It was Anton Fratani, the tower manager's father. But Kaiser didn't calm down. Instead, he raised his voice even more. He expressed his frustration about not being able to see his granddaughter, Aileen, who happens to be the tower manager. In this dire situation, he found it impossible to remain calm. He explained that Aileen was unwell, suffering from regular seizures, and her condition had worsened significantly lately. To find a cure, they had journeyed to other dimensions and galaxies. Finally, they had found a cure, but now they were unable to open the portal back to the tower. Kaiser gazed at the crystal, stating that their only option to return to the tower now was to rely on the emergency system they had installed in the tower. This system could forcefully trigger the portal to open. Until that happened, they were stranded here, anxiously unaware of what was happening to Aileen. Then, Anton replied with a serious expression, explaining that the emergency portal would only trigger when Aileen suffered a seizure. He reassured Kaiser that this was good news, indicating that Aileen was currently okay. He urged Kaiser once more to calm down, assuring him that they would surely find another way to enter the tower. The huge black dragons who had been listening also chimed in. They expressed their understanding of Kaiser's feelings, and Anton continued, elaborating on their concerns for Aileen. He explained that the 99th floor of the tower, where Aileen's cabin was located, was the center of the tower. It had an incredibly dense concentration of mana, and the dragons took turns managing the tower from there, growing stronger in the process. But they had all chosen to give that cabin to Aileen alone, as the dense mana would help Aileen now... All the dragons were gathered here for Aileen's sake to fix Aileen's broken dragon's heart. In response to this heartfelt speech, Kaiser, still annoyed, remarked that even though the dragons had strong feelings for Aileen, the reality was that they were stuck in this dimension, unable to do anything about it. Maintaining his serious expression, Anton replied that he understood what Kaiser wanted to say. He addressed Kaiser as father and emphasized that he believed in his daughter Aileen more than anyone else. Then for the first time, a hint of sadness crossed Anton's face. He knew Aileen was a strong girl and was confident that she was bravely fighting her seizures. Kaiser, listening with a serious expression, responded that if Anton said he would calm down. He then ordered the huge dragons to patrol the area and guard the crystal until the portal opened. The massive black dragons took flight. Now, looking upward, Anton asked Kaiser if something good might have happened to Aileen since it had already passed the expected date for her seizures. They both gazed at the crystal, expressing hope for Aileen's well-being. However, Kaiser couldn't help but worry about whether Aileen was getting enough to eat on the 99th floor given the limited food available there. Meanwhile, Aileen, our tower manager, was savoring the juicy cherries provided by Seo Jun. She sat comfortably on a couch with a book in hand, enjoying the moment. Next to her, a bucket made from onion leaves was filled to the brim with cherry tomatoes. With a mischievous smile, the tower manager held up a cherry tomato and commented on its taste. She wondered if the tomato had become even tastier due to its rank increasing from E to D. Before, she needed to fill her mouth with a bunch of cherry tomatoes to experience their sweetness. But now, only a few of them were enough to satisfy her palate. However, as she mused about the tomatoes, an unexpected shock coursed through her. Startled, she dropped the cherry tomato she had been about to eat, a look of surprise on her face. Then, with a curious look on her face, she gently touched her chest. In a hushed tone, she revealed that her dragon heart had never once beaten since the day of her birth. Yet, just moments ago, something incredible had occurred. Her heart had, for a brief second, begun to beat. Not only that, but it had also absorbed mana for a while. This unexpected turn of events left her deep in thought. She wondered how such a thing could be possible. For her entire 200-year existence, she had been ill with a mysterious disease since birth, which caused her heart to stop beating. According to fate, she should have been experiencing seizures and nearing the end of her life. However, to her utter amazement, she was perfectly fine. She found herself in a state of confusion. Then, a realization struck her like a bolt of lightning. Her gaze fell upon the bucket brimming with Seo Jun's special cherries. She grabbed a handful and examined them closely. It was then that she discovered a hidden ability. Consuming these cherries slightly increased one's mana. Aileen couldn't contain her joy. She had been eating these cherries purely because they tasted incredibly good. But she hadn't expected that they also possessed the power to heal a dragon's dormant heart. Then she began to smile mischievously, saying, The great black dragon, Aileen Fratani, 
who was 200 years old, had finally found someone she wanted to smash, she wanted to protect. Even though it was just for a moment, her heart had started beating. Now she was determined to do whatever it took to protect Seojun. She closed her eyes, placing her hands on the crystal ball with pride. She declared that Seojun should feel honored, as it was truly a tremendous blessing that the tower manager liked him, and then she resumed her usual routine of stalking Seo Jun with her crystal ball. Then, the tower manager urgently tried to wake Seo Jun up. He slowly opened his eyes, still feeling groggy and sleepy. However, as soon as he saw a system notification right in front of his face, he jolted awake and began shouting in surprise. The tower manager asked Seo Jun why he had used an unappraised item when she had explicitly warned him about their potential dangers. Still a little disoriented, Seo Jun was confused about which item the tower manager was referring to. Then he noticed the straw hat on his head. Meanwhile, all his animal companions were still fast asleep, and the husband rabbit had just woken up, rubbing his eyes in confusion. Holding the straw hat in his hands, Seo Jun couldn't help but wonder how and why Luffy's straw hat had ended up on his head. Then, the husband rabbit approached, holding Theo's bag and explained that he had found the straw hat in Theo's bag. To protect Seo Jun's face from the direct sunlight, he had placed it on Seo Jun's head. Seo Jun started to think if Theo had brought this item, but Theo, in his deep sleep, was nestled in Seo Jun's hands, covering his face. He wiggled his tail and curled up, making it clear he didn't want to wake up just yet. Left with no other options, Seo Jun affectionately scolded Theo for being so obsessed with sleeping. He gently placed Theo on the baby bear's soft, furry belly, allowing him to continue his peaceful slumber. Seo Jun carefully held the straw hat in his hand and decided to check its status window. The name of the straw hat was Farmer's Straw Hat, and it didn't seem to be anything particularly special. Its grade was marked as D. What caught Seo Jun's attention were the numerous restrictions associated with its use. It required the wearer to be above level 20, with both strength and stamina also needing to be above 20. Upon seeing this, the tower manager suggested that Seo Jun appraise the straw hat. Seo Jun, recalling how she had appraised the dagger earlier, asked if she would appraise the hat in a similar manner. The tower manager confirmed that this would indeed be the case. With that assurance, Seo Jun handed the straw hat over to the tower manager. As soon as it left his hand, the straw hat disappeared and reappeared in the tower manager's hand. She placed the hat proudly on top of the books, preparing to use her appraisal skill. The tower manager initiated her appraisal skill. Her eyes began to glow with a soft blue light, and a similar blue aura enveloped her. At the same time, the straw hat seemed to float in the air, surrounded by this mystical blue aura. As the appraisal process concluded, the tower manager couldn't contain her laughter. She admitted that she knew the hat was special, but its true nature had exceeded her expectations. Now, back to Seo Jun. The system notified Seo Jun that the tower manager had examined the straw hat and was absolutely delighted. She was congratulating Seo Jun for obtaining an exceptional item. Hearing this, Seo Jun fell into a moment of silence, contemplating just how incredible this hat must be. Then, a new quest appeared before Seo Jun. It stated that the tower manager wanted Seo Jun to promise that he would present her with his special, juicy fruit filled with the energy of the blue moon. In return, he would receive the appraised straw hat. However, there was a catch. If Seo Jun declined the offer, he would lose the chance to reclaim the straw hat. Now, deep in thought, Seo Jun realized that the blue moon was just a few days away. He remembered that he had expanded his crop fields, which meant he'd have plenty of juicy fruits filled with the energy of the blue moon. So, making the promise to the tower manager seemed like a manageable task. He assured her that he would deliver his special, energy-packed, juicy fruit, as promised. Then, the system alerted Seo Jun that Aileen Fratani, the tower manager, wanted him to hold out his pinky finger and make the promise official. She introduced herself, emphasizing how honored Seo Jun should feel knowing her name. However, Seo Jun, with a touch of humor, jokingly remarked that he wasn't particularly interested in knowing her name in the first place. This comment seemed to irritate the tower manager. She asked Seo Jun whether he wanted his straw hat back or not, her excitement growing as she pounded her feet on the floor. She asserted that Seo Jun would eventually realize how fortunate he was to even know her name. Seeing the tower manager growing agitated, 
Seo Jun quickly adopted a more polite tone. He expressed that it was indeed a great honor to know her name. With respect, he raised his hand and extended his pinky finger, solemnly promising to provide his special juicy fruits to the tower manager when he harvested them during the next blue moon. The tower manager's eyes gleamed with excitement as she responded. She mentioned that this was Seo Jun's first promise to the tower manager. Seo Jun didn't quite understand what she meant, but through her crystal ball, the tower manager, who also raised her pinky claw, saying, Yes, our first promise. And with a loving smile, she continued to gaze at Seo Jun. Then, with a sense of awe, the system notified Seo Jun that the quest had been successfully completed. The straw hat floated gracefully in midair before him. Seo Jun couldn't contain his excitement as he eagerly checked the status of the straw hat. The system revealed astonishing information. This was no ordinary hat. It was one of the ten legendary artifacts known as the Straw Hat. It was originally worn by a farmer named Patrick, revered as a saint for saving countless lives through his farming. The unique feature of this hat was that its abilities and rank would grow alongside its owner, and only those with the farmer job class could utilize its powers. Seo Jun was left in shock. The term artifact alone implied immense rarity and power, and with only ten of these artifacts in the entire tower, he realized just how precious it was. Without hesitation, driven by excitement, Seo Jun placed the straw hat on his head, eager to discover the incredible abilities it would grant him. As he adorned the hat, a flurry of system notifications appeared before him, revealing that various restrictions had been lifted. New abilities and skills were displayed, including increased strength, enhanced stamina, improved mana recovery and a host of other remarkable capabilities that left Seo Jun feeling truly bewildered with his mouth open. Now, gazing at the rugged terrain above the cave, Seo Jun felt a surge of contentment. His strength and stamina had been limiting his farming progress, but with these newfound powers bestowed by the straw hat, he knew he could significantly accelerate the expansion of his farm. With a warm smile gracing his face, Seo Jun turned to look at Theo. He couldn't help but express his gratitude, acknowledging that Theo truly had the golden touch, since he always seemed to bring good things along. Theo, however, remained blissfully unaware, fast asleep with his mouth agape. Unable to contain his happiness, Seo Jun approached and gently hugged Theo, saying with affection, My lovely and proud sales cat, Theo. He showered Theo's paws with kisses, overcome with joy. At this unexpected display of affection, Theo stirred from his slumber. He seemed a bit bewildered, asking Seo Jun what he was doing with his paws and stating, in a somewhat awkward manner, that he wasn't interested in male human. Seo Jun suddenly jumped to his feet, his excitement evident in his voice as he exclaimed, saying, Theo can be sales cat Theo for a whole week. Theo, taken aback by this unexpected offer, couldn't help but express his surprise. A whole week instead of just 38 hours? He questioned. Seo Jun playfully scooped Theo into the air, his face beaming with happiness. He confirmed with enthusiasm, saying, yes, and affectionately referred to Theo as a cute bastard. The commotion stirred the baby bear and roused all the rabbits from their slumber. In the midst of this jubilant atmosphere, Theo couldn't contain his joy. He happily responded, he don't know why he is getting this special treatment, but he is really, really happy. The scene takes a sudden shift, and within the cave, the piercing scream of the wife rabbit resonated. It was an unmistakable sign. The wife rabbit had gone into labor. Amidst this tense moment, the chubby rabbit seemed quite unfazed, casually nibbling on a stick. However, the warrior rabbit was a bundle of nerves, clutching his hands tightly and offering prayers. Seo Jun appeared even more nervous, his legs trembling uncontrollably. Clenching his teeth, he struggled to contain his anxiety. Theo, seated on Seo Jun's lap, was becoming increasingly irritated by the constant leg shaking. Annoyed, Theo asked Seo Jun to cease his restless leg movements, expressing that he might go crazy otherwise. Seo Jun, realizing his anxious habit, apologized, explaining that he couldn't help himself due to his nerves. As time ticked by, there was still no news from the wife rabbit. The baby rabbits sat huddled near the cave's entrance, their eyes filled with worry as they anxiously stared at the cave where the rabbit couple had disappeared. Then suddenly, the cave's entrance swung open. Everyone rushed toward it, their hearts pounding with anticipation. From the cave emerged the sickle rabbit, cradling three adorable little baby rabbits. But the surprises didn't end there. Following the sickle rabbit, the husband rabbit appeared, holding three more of these precious little ones. Six new baby rabbits had joined Seo Jun's growing family, 
The baby rabbits were gently laid down on a bed made from onion leaves, and all the rabbits formed a circle around them, their hearts warmed by the sight. Seo Joon, with a caring smile, commented that he needed to prepare a nutritious soup for the mommy rabbit to help her recover her strength. The husband rabbit beamed with happiness at this thoughtful gesture. Observing Theo's hesitance to approach the baby rabbits, Seo Joon encouraged his curious feline friend to come closer and take a look. Theo, with a thoughtful expression, remarked that the baby rabbits were indeed tiny. Seo Joon chuckled and explained that they were small because they were babies, which earned more laughter from the chubby rabbit and the warrior rabbit. Then, Seo Joon playfully addressed Theo as Uncle Theo, which seemed to startle Theo. With a warm smile, Seo Joon elaborated that now that Theo was an uncle, he had to take good care of the baby rabbits and become a cool uncle. This idea excited Theo, and he reached under his cape to retrieve his precious churu treats. He happily offered them to the baby rabbits, proudly declaring himself as Cool Uncle Theo and gifting them his most treasured churu. However, Seo Jun and the other rabbits burst into laughter, explaining that since the babies were still so young, they could only drink their mommy's milk for now. However, Seo Jun teasingly accused Theo of hiding churu treats secretly from him. Nervously, Theo explained that they were meant for emergency, but since it was a joyous occasion, Seo Jun decided to let it slide. Meanwhile, far from the cave, the scene shifted to get a closer look at the waypoint crystal. Something ominous was happening. A dark creature with large menacing horns and glowing red eyes was commanding a horde of creatures, all possessing fierce horns and muscular body. This menacing creature was none other than the boss of the 99th floor, Demon King Ox. He stood there with a terrifying aura, clutching a massive battle axe, and ordered his minions to attack during the upcoming blue moon, promising them a hearty feast. Back in the cave, Seo Joon was busy picking cherry tomatoes while Theo played with the baby rabbits. In the previous episode, you saw how the tower manager was ill and was about to die in a few years. But after eating Seo Joon's special juicy cherry tomatoes, she started to heal. Meanwhile, the mother rabbits gave birth to six cute baby rabbits, and as the blue moon approached, the demon lord, the boss of the 99th floor, was ready to attack Seo Joon's cave with his army. Now, thanks to the Straw Hat's magical ability, Seo Joon enjoyed a significant harvest bonus. The upcoming week promised a 50% increase in the cherry tomato harvest. Standing by the cherry tomato farm, Seo Joon observed the miraculous results of this bonus. The cherry plants were adorned with double the usual number of flowers, and hundreds of busy honeybees buzzed around them collecting nectar. Seo Joon couldn't help but smile as he gazed at the thriving cherry tomato plants. The sight of the honeybees at work was like a symphony of nature in action. Now, sitting near the cherry tomato plants, Seo Joon started to think. He contemplated that tomorrow marked the seventh blue moon since he had arrived in the tower. He wondered if the baby bear and his mommy were also preparing for the blue moon, which might be the reason they didn't come to the cave today. Seo Joon also realized that he had to go to work and quickly prepare for the blue moon. However, Seo Joon's attention was diverted by the commotion of new baby rabbits. He turned back to see the cute baby rabbits running around, with Theo wearing a worried expression as he tried to catch them to prevent them from getting hurt. Theo managed to catch one of the baby rabbits that was nibbling on a half-eaten fish. He scolded the little one, explaining that the fish was dirty and not suitable for them to eat. The baby rabbits, of course, couldn't understand his words and continued their innocent exploration. Next, the baby rabbits attempted to approach the campfire. Another potential danger, Leo once again intervened. He scooped up the little rabbits and warned them about the fire. Frustrated, Theo gathered all the baby rabbits, holding one in his hand, another on his back, and one more in his other hand, gently scolding them all. Theo stressed that everything around them was too dangerous for the baby rabbits and that they needed to stay close to Uncle Theo. However, the baby rabbits, in their adorable innocence, remained clueless. Before we proceed, today's like goal is 7k likes. Please like and subscribe to the channel to show your support. Thank you, let's continue. Observing Theo's caring and protective nature towards the baby rabbits, Seo Joon couldn't help but smile warmly. He never expected that Theo would become such a wonderful guardian for the little ones. While Theo continued to pick up the adventurous baby rabbits and place them on his cape, Seo Joon approached him. With genuine affection in his voice, Seo Joon asked Theo how he was faring as Uncle Theo to the baby rabbits and as the sales cat. Theo, a bit tired from all the baby rabbit wrangling, admitted that he was quite exhausted. The mother and father rabbits were very happy, watching how Theo was taking care of their babies. Theo then placed his hand proudly on his chest and declared that despite the exhaustion, 
He was thoroughly enjoying his role as the cool Uncle Theo. Seo Jun couldn't help but let out a slight chuckle at Theo's response. As Seo Jun turned back, the husband rabbit and the wife rabbit gave him a thumbs up very happily. Seo Jun returned the thumbs up with a smirking smile, indicating that they had successfully made Theo take care of the baby rabbits, freeing themselves from this responsibility. Theo, with all the baby rabbits now on his back, expressed his excitement at taking them on a grand adventure. He encouraged the little ones to hold on tight as they embarked on their journey. The baby rabbits clung to Theo, their tiny faces filled with pure joy. As Theo prepared to set off on this exciting adventure with his small companions, Seo Jun shouted from behind, reminding him to return before dinner. The scene shifted to the grand castle of our honeybee colony. Here the workers were diligently sealing the windows of the castle to keep out the influence of the upcoming blue moon. The rabbits too were one by one closing the entrances to their caves and retreating to the safety of their underground dwelling. Seo Jun, sitting on the ground nearby, began to unpack his bag. He too was all set for the impending blue moon. As he went about his preparations, he couldn't help but notice Theo attempting to enter his own bag. A curious expression crossed Seo Jun's face, and he asked Theo what he was up to. Theo, with his body halfway inside the bag, replied with a hint of playfulness in his voice. He explained that he was planning to take refuge inside his bag to avoid the effects of the blue moon. Since he had recently advanced to become a higher mid-level merchant, his bag had grown in size. Now, he could comfortably fit inside it, providing him with shelter from the moon's influence. As Theo settled himself into the bag, Seojin listened curiously. Theo continued, explaining that his bag, while useful, wasn't anything particularly special and was about the size of a simple tent. However, he added that other high-level merchants had bags as large as entire houses. Seo Jun listened to Theo with curiosity, and then he got a great idea. Seo Jun carefully took out the Queen Bee's cocoon from his bag and handed it to Theo. He requested Theo to keep it safe. Theo received the cocoon with a mix of excitement and determination, cradling the precious item gently in his furry paws. He assured Seo Jun that he would protect the Queen Bee's cocoon with all his might, promising that not a single thread on it would be damaged. Seo Jun smiled warmly, expressing his trust in Theo's ability. As the blue moon slowly began its ascent, casting an otherworldly blue hue across the landscape, Seo Jun found himself gazing up at the sky. He couldn't help but wonder about the well-being of the baby bear and its mother during this unusual night. However, their thoughts were soon interrupted by an unexpected event. The ground beneath them began to tremble. Seo Jun swiftly placed the ear cups made of onion leaves over his ears, his face etched with concern. The vibrations from the shaking ground were accompanied by increasingly loud screams that pierced through the night. The sheer volume of the noise threatened to overwhelm Seo Jun, and he clutched his ears tightly, fearing they might burst from the intensity of the sound. It seemed as though something extraordinary and potentially perilous was unfolding folding outside the cave. After what seemed like an eternity, the deafening noise finally ceased, leaving a bewildered Seo Jun to ponder its origin. It had resembled the cry of a cow, but that raised a peculiar question. Were there cows on the ninth floor? Such thoughts swirled in his mind, but soon his attention was drawn to the cherry tomato plants. In the eerie blue light of the blue moon, the cherry tomatoes had undergone a remarkable transformation. They absorbed the moon's energy, turning a vibrant shade of blue. Seo Jun watched in astonishment as not just one, but multiple blue cherry tomatoes glistened in the moonlight. He couldn't help but wonder if the blue moon that night was exceptionally intense. However, the surprises didn't end there. To his amazement, Seo Jun noticed a corn plant also soaking in the energy of the blue moon. His excitement grew as he contemplated this unusual phenomenon. He speculated that the straw hat's ability, which had boosted the harvest by 50% for the week, might be responsible for these incredible developments. Morning eventually arrived, and Theo ventured outside the cave first. After surveying the area and ensuring it was safe, he informed Seo Jun that there was no sign of danger at the cave's entrance. Seo Jun, using the onion leaf rope, followed suit and emerged from the cave. However, Theo expressed concern about the potential dangers outside, especially after the unsettling screams from the previous night. He suggested that it might have been safer to wait until the mother bear returned to the cave. However, Seo Jun reassured him, explaining that he needed to investigate if the creatures responsible for the loud noises had caused any damage to their farm. Theo firmly clung to Seo Jun's legs, insisting that he would accompany him. He respectfully addressed Seo Jun as chairman. Seo Jun, with a warm smile, expressed his gratitude to Theo, referring to him as Sales Cat Theo. 
Outside the cave, the scene was far from pleasant. Their farm had been torn apart, leaving large mounds of dirt scattered around as if someone had used heavy machinery to dig extensive holes. But then Seo Jun noticed something, a large footprint of a monster about seven meters in size, and, and after careful examination, concluded that the footprints resembled those of a large cow. He approached one of the massive dirt piles and marveled at the immense strength required to dig and form such a mound. As Seo Jun inspected the area, he noticed something that left him in shock. He sprinted toward one of the dirt piles and began to climb it energetically. Theo, bewildered by Seo Jun's actions, inquired about his intentions. Seo Jun, a handful of dirt in his hands and a look of pure happiness on his face, explained that the soil had a different texture from the usual barren ground. Instead of being crumbly, hard, and filled with pebbles, this soil was soft, moist, and appeared to be rich in nutrients. Seo Jun's mind raced with possibilities. He fantasized about transforming the area outside the cave into a lush, fertile farm teeming with crops. However, reality soon set in. To do this, he would need heavy machinery like tractors and excavators, which seemed impossible to obtain. The tower manager inquired about Seo Jun's presence outside the cave. Seo Jun casually explained that he had just come to check on the farm and was planning to return to the cave shortly. However, the tower manager scolded him, expressing her concern due to the intense blue moon from the previous night, which had led to dangerous conditions outside with monsters scattered about. With a hint of jest, Seo Jun slid down a mound of dirt and cheekily affirmed that he was indeed on his way. Playfully, he referred to the tower manager as Aileen and asked if she had been okay during the intense blue moon last night. Annoyed by his nonchalant attitude, the tower manager firmly asserted that Seo Jun need not worry about her and emphasized his safety, instructing him to return to the cave immediately. Seo Jun couldn't resist a smirk and commented that it seemed like Aileen, the tower manager, was showing more concern for him today. In response, Aileen remained silent, leaving the conversation hanging. Then, Seo Jun descended from the cave, determined to harvest the crops nourished by the blue moon. Meanwhile, Theo was utterly exhausted and had retreated for some much-needed rest. Seo Jun took hold of a corn stalk, brimming with the energy of the blue moon. With careful precision, he plucked the corn and began to peel it open. To his amazement, the corn gleamed with a sparkling blue hue. Seo Jun then examined its properties, discovering it was called the Corn of Stamina. Consuming it would result in a permanent stamina increase of 0.1, making it both nutritious and delicious. Holding this unique blue corn in his hand, Seo Jun realized that because it was a D-rank crop, it provided double the stat boost compared to E-rank crops. Setting aside thoughts of calculations and numbers, Seo Jun eagerly prepared to take a bite of the blue corn. However, just as he was about to indulge, the tower manager issued a stern warning, reminding Seo Jun of his promise. Startled, Seo Jun swiftly wiped away his saliva, assuring the tower manager that he hadn't forgotten his commitment. To make amends, he plucked five blue cherry tomatoes and presented them to the tower manager. In response, the tower manager expressed her gratitude and promised to repay Seo Jun in the future. Seo Jun responded with a smile, eagerly looking forward to whatever awaited him. The tower manager held the five blue cherry tomatoes, each brimming with Seo Jun's special juice. As she gazed at these extraordinary fruits, a thought crossed her mind. If a regular cherry tomato could make her dragon heartbeat, what would happen when she consumed one of Seo Jun's special juicy cherry tomatoes? Without dwelling further on her curiosity, she impulsively popped all five blue cherry tomatoes into her mouth. The juiciness and flavor were beyond her wildest expectation, and for a moment, she felt as if she had entered a heavenly realm. She held her cheeks in delight, savoring the extraordinary taste. However, just as suddenly as the pleasure had washed over her, something unexpected occurred. First, a ticklish sensation pricked at her bottom. Then, a surge of intense pain engulfed her, and she collapsed onto the ground. Racked with agony, she cried out as a dark purple aura enveloped her heart. In the previous episode, we witnessed how, when the blue moon arrived, a menacingly loud noise nearly caused Seo Jun to faint. He obtained blue corn and some blue cherry tomatoes, and after consuming Seo Jun's special cherries, the tower manager fainted in pleasure. Oh, sorry, but fainted in pain. Seo Jun skillfully separated the husk of the corn, which had been blessed by the blue moon. He gently placed it into a pot along with some water, then covered the lid. As the corn simmered over the campfire, Seo Jun sat beside the pot, wearing a satisfied smile. He remarked how he was finally able to put the pot that Theo had bought to good use. 
He explained that the corn husk would create a layer of air between the pot and the corn, resulting in a perfectly cooked corn. Next, Seo Jun took the remaining corn husk, washed it, and set it to dry between two rocks with the help of two wooden branches. He smiled gently, saying that once the husk was dry, he would be able to make corn silk tea, adding another beverage to enjoy in the cave. Then, the husband rabbit and the other rabbits greeted Seo Jun with cheerful wishes of good morning. Seo Jun returned their greetings with a warm smile, starting the day on a positive note. Seo Jun inquired about the baby rabbits, wondering where they were. The husband rabbit gestured toward the cave, indicating that the babies were inside, sleeping peacefully beside their mother, who was currently breastfeeding. With excitement, Seo Jun called all the rabbits and proudly displayed the blue and juicy cherry tomatoes, blessed by the blue moon, that he had harvested the previous night. He explained that the harvest had been plentiful and that each of them could have one. The husband rabbit and the warrior rabbit were overjoyed to receive their share. Before we proceed, today's like goal is 7,777. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you. Now let's continue with the story. Turning back to check on the boiling pot, Seo Jun informed the rabbits that he was preparing a new batch of Blue Moon corn, and they could all enjoy it together once it was ready. The rabbits eagerly anticipated this treat. Then, the husband rabbit, holding his blue cherry tomato, tried to convey to Seo Jun that he wanted to share the blue cherry tomato with him. Hearing this, Seo Jun was overjoyed by this gesture, and he responded with a warm smile as he patted the husband rabbit. He expressed his deep gratitude, acknowledging that the husband rabbit always looked out for him. Happily, the husband rabbit wagged his tail in response. On the other hand, the warrior rabbit felt a bit sad because Seo Jun was only patting the husband rabbit, and the chubby rabbit seemed a bit displeased, puffing up his cheeks in a mildly annoyed manner. Then Seo Jun turned towards the warrior rabbit and the chubby rabbit, and with a smile he said that even if he wanted to eat all the blue cherry tomatoes by himself, he couldn't because they were all a family. So they would have a grand feast and share the tomatoes with everyone. Hearing this, the warrior rabbit became very happy, and the chubby rabbit started drooling in anticipation. The scene then shifted, and we saw our queen bee with her worker bees collecting nectar. Seo Jun gently opened the hot pot's lid, and steam filled the air with a sweet aroma. Gazing at the hot blue corn, Seo Jun remarked on how delicious it looked. He carefully picked up the steaming ear of corn, even though it was very hot, unable to wait any longer. He blew on it to cool it down, thinking that since it was a D-grade crop filled with the energy of the blue moon, it should taste even more delicious. After the corn had cooled down, Seo Jun, with a very happy smile, prepared to take his first bite. Sitting beside him were all the rabbits, each holding a cherry tomato, eagerly awaiting their share. However, the chubby rabbit couldn't wait and had already devoured an entire blue cherry tomato in one go. Finally, all the rabbits began taking small bites with great joy, savoring every bit of sweetness and deliciousness. The chubby rabbit, having already eaten his portion, sat holding his plump stomach. Just then, the husband rabbit appeared in front of Seo Jun, smiling happily and holding two blue cherry tomatoes. He announced that he would share them with his wife. Seo Jun wished him an enjoyable meal. Seo Jun then took a bite of the blue corn. As he had anticipated, it was incredibly delicious, and he could taste the sweetness in every single kernel. Unable to contain himself, Seo Jun began devouring the blue corn, eating it with the same enthusiasm as a rabbit. The more he chewed, the more delicious it became. The rabbits watched in shock at the speed with which he was eating, and some even started cheering for Seo Jun. Then the system notified Seo Jun that he had consumed the stamina corn, and Seo Jun's stamina increased by 0.1 permanently. Holding the cob of the blue corn, Seo Jun expressed his joy at how delicious it was and how he ate it so eagerly. Then, he threw the corn cob into the campfire, cleaned his hands by clapping, and declared that it was time to harvest some corn. The rabbits also cheered happily. They were all ready to start harvesting. Now standing near a corn stalk, Seo Jun examined the corn closely, commenting on how perfectly ripe it was and ready for harvesting. He carefully plucked one corn, and the system notified Seo Jun that he had harvested a corn of stamina. His job experience increased slightly, and he gained 20 XP. Holding the corn, Seo Jun wondered about its stats and decided to check. The system then provided information. The corn was called corn of stamina. When consumed, it would permanently reduce 20 grams of fat and increase stamina by 0.2 for 10 minutes. This effect could be stacked up to 10 times. Furthermore, when consumed by non-awakened individuals, it would also improve their overall health and make them look young. Happily holding the corn, 
Seo Jun couldn't help but think about how great it would be if he could give this special corn to his mother. He believed it would make her look younger. Seo Jun decided that when Theo visited next time, he would send some of this corn along with cherry tomatoes to his family. It wouldn't be fair if he was the only one enjoying such delicious food. The sickle rabbit continued to cut corn, while the chart rabbit and the white rabbit gathered more corn. They all agreed with Seo Jun's thoughtful idea. Suddenly, a slight growl echoed through the cave, and the mommy bear along with the baby bear greeted Seo Jun with a warm smile. Seo Jun quickly came out of the cave and asked the mommy bear if she was okay and if she had been hurt. He mentioned hearing loud noises from outside the cave the previous night. The mommy bear assured him that she was perfectly fine. Seo Jun then turned his attention to the baby bear and offered him some of Queen Bee's special juice knowing that he must be craving it after not having it for a long time. The baby bear's eyes sparkled with delight as he eagerly took the honey and began to enjoy it. After that, Sao Jun turned to the mommy bear and told her to wait for a moment. He promised to bring her some roasted fish in just a minute. Then, still rubbing his eyes and dragging his bag, Theo woke up. Seo Jun asked why Theo had woken up so early, and Theo proudly responded that he couldn't waste any time as sales cat Theo. He was going to work because he was the ultimate pro among wandering merchants. Seo Jun, trying to maintain a neutral expression while feeling a mixture of emotions, commented on how Theo was truly becoming a professional wandering merchant. Then, Theo clung to Seo Jun's foot and asked him to have the mommy bear take him to the wandering merchant passage. He explained that many dangerous monsters were prowling around due to the blue moon. Without hesitation, the baby bear gently picked Theo up and, with his mommy's assistance, started heading towards the passage. Theo wiggled in their grasp, worried about his precious cake being torn. Observing the damaged field, Seo Jun commented that it was time to restore it while waiting for the mommy and baby bear to return from dropping off Theo. The scene shifts and we find the Ox King, the boss of the 99th floor, sitting on his throne while his thousands of soldiers stand before him. One by one, the Ox soldiers approach the Demon Ox King, each one placing mud beside him. The Ox King begins counting. Soldier number one brought dry mud, and then another soldier arrives and he remarks. So, soldier number two brought dry soil. Upon hearing this, the soldier who brought the dry soil starts to panic a bit and forces a smile. However, the Ox King becomes furious and starts shouting. He berates his Ox soldiers, declaring them to be dumb for bringing mud and dry soil. He emphasizes that he's a living being, not a plant, and questions how he could eat mud. He asks them if they've lost their minds. One of the soldiers raises their hand and explains that it's been so long since they've seen any green grass in their territory that they didn't know where to find food. They express their gloom, admitting that even if they were to dig up their entire territory, they would find nothing but mud. Listening intently, the Ox King reflects on their word. He curses under his breath and slumps back onto his throne. He starts to wonder why this is happening. Once upon a time, their territory was filled with lush green fields and high-quality grass. However, after he became the boss of the 99th floor, he needed large quantities of grass to maintain his muscular physique. He had ordered all his men to gather grass in their territory, but the Minotaur race are large monsters with voracious appetites. The rate at which they consumed the grass far exceeded the rate at which it grew, leading to the land becoming barren, devoid of a single blade of grass. Now, thinking deeply, the Ox King was worried. He and his subordinates were not eating and were losing muscle. Even the health of the newborn young Minotaurs was not looking good. If they didn't receive anything to eat, their lives would be in danger. Then, the Ox King shouted, calling for ox number three. However, even after calling for several minutes, no one came. The ox king asked in concern if ox number three had mistakenly entered another monster's territory and got himself into trouble. But from behind, ox number three came, apologizing. He explained that when the blue moon ended and he opened his eyes, he found himself very far away, so it took him a long time to reach here. Hearing this, the ox king showed relief, saying it's fine as long as he returned safely. However, before he could finish his sentence, the ox king noticed something and his eyes widened in shock. He had a puzzled expression on his face as he started coming closer to ox number three, making ox number three nervous thinking the Ox King might punish him. Suddenly, the Ox King came even closer to Ox number three, holding his shoulder and shouted, What is that on Ox number three's head? This left Ox number three in confusion. The Ox King continued, saying he was talking about that sweet-smelling root that was hanging on Ox number three's horn. While saying this, the Ox King was breathing heavily, and Ox number three noticed something hanging on his horn as well, and he too got shocked. 
What could it be? The scene shifted, and we saw the tower manager lying in pain. Her head was throbbing severely. She tried to recall what had happened, wondering how she had ended up in this condition. Slowly, she attempted to stand up, but as she rose, her head collided with the chandelier hanging from the ceiling. She was confused and shocked, wondering how the chandelier had come loose. Then when she looked down, another surprise awaited her. She noticed that her crystal ball had shrunk in size. As she gingerly picked up the crystal ball, she realized that neither the chandelier nor the crystal ball had gotten smaller. It was she who had grown bigger. In the previous episode, we saw how after eating Seo Jun's juicy cherries, our tower manager grew thicker. Shit grew larger. On the other hand, the Ox King was getting ready to attack Seo Jun. Still deeply confused, the tower manager realized that she had hit puberty and her body had undergone a significant change. She felt a strange tickling sensation in her stomach as she sat crouched, lost in thought. She couldn't comprehend why she had suddenly grown so big. Then, a memory flashed through her mind. She remembered eating those five blue, juicy cherry tomatoes that Seo Jun had given her. She began to wonder if there was something special about Seo Jun's cherry tomatoes. Just before she had fainted, she recalled her dragon heart beating for a brief moment. Afterward, she had grown larger, and even though her heart wasn't beating now, she felt incredibly light, as if she could fly right now if she tried. Then, holding her crystal ball tightly, she started kissing Seo Jun through the crystal ball, saying that it was all because of Seo Jun that her heart had healed somewhat. She couldn't contain her excitement as she thought about what she would do with Seo Jun once they got out of the tower. Then, as she observed Seo Jun through her crystal ball, happily munching on the blue corn, she couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy. She shouted, asking how Seo Jun could relish those delectable treats while leaving her out. However, the crystal ball she held was too small for her grown-up body, preventing her from getting a clear view of what Seo Jun was enjoying. Without wasting a single minute, she hurriedly tried to go to her treasured room to bring a larger crystal ball. However, she got stuck at the door since it was too small for her thick Oh, it was too small for her current body, and she started shouting in frustration, saying she needed to lose weight, or Seo Jun would devour all the delicious treats without her. Before we proceed, please subscribe to our new channel. Link in the pinned comment. Our goal for today's likes is 6,900 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you. Now let's continue with the video. The scene shifts, and it's a bright, sunny day outside the cave's entrance. The baby bear waves his hands happily toward the queen bee, who joyfully waves back while flying around the cave with her worker bees. Meanwhile, the shovel rabbit stands atop a pile of corn, watching the worker bees work with delight. Over by the corn pile, the husband rabbit and the wife rabbit are busy peeling the corn and placing the peeled corn on top of onion leaves. The baby rabbits are having fun playing with one of the worker bees, while the sickle rabbit is preparing wooden sticks. The warrior rabbit takes the peeled corn and places it onto the wooden sticks, with a cute little baby rabbit watching in admiration. Another baby rabbit patiently waits beside a pile of prepared corn, neatly arranged on top of onion leaves, all ready for roasting. The cart rabbit then comes in, loads up the prepared corn onto his cart to roast, and a baby rabbit sits on the cart, cheerfully waving to the white rabbit who's in charge of roasting the corn over the campfire. Then we see Seo Jun complimenting all his animal friends for doing a great job preparing the corn. He called the cute baby rabbit on the cart, Captain Baby as the baby rabbit also did a great job coming all the way here. The baby rabbit reacted happily, holding the baby rabbit in his arms. Seo Jun said to the chubby rabbit that he had steamed the corns and his work was almost finished. He suggested wrapping up and told the chubby rabbit to gather everyone, as they would all have dinner together. The chubby rabbit nodded in response, excitedly. Seo Jun gently opened the lid of the pot and the delicious aroma of the juicy corn filled the entire cave. Seeing the corn, the baby rabbit in Seo Jun's hand also started drooling with sparkling eyes. As Seo Jun was taking out the hot, juicy steamed corns from the pot and placing them on plates made of onion leaves with a DIY glove made from onion leaves, the tower manager asked Seo Jun if she also could taste the juicy corn. She then asked if Seo Jun could give her one steamed corn. Suddenly, a quest appeared in front of Seo Jun, saying, Share the corn with the horny, share the corn with the hungry tower manager and the reward was extreme gratitude. If refused, the tower manager would become extremely disappointed. Seeing this, Seo Jun replied, addressing the tower manager as Aileen with a smile on his face. He mentioned that he was going to give some steamed corn to her anyway, 
and said to wait for a moment. He was also preparing some grilled corn, and once ready, he would send both the steamed and grilled corn to her all at once. The tower manager nodded, saying she would wait. Then we see the warrior rabbit and the white rabbits bringing the delicious, mouth-watering grilled corn. Seo Jun instructed them to place the grilled corn on a plate made of onion leaves. After a moment, we see many grilled corns neatly arranged on a large plate, also made of onion leaves. The cart rabbit brought the steamed corn, and all the rabbits worked together to prepare the corns for dinner. Meanwhile, the husband rabbit and the wife rabbit happily stood with the baby rabbits, and on a large bowl made of onion leaves beside Seo Jun, there was a full load of steamed corn. Three cute little baby rabbits watched, unable to wait to taste them. Now Seo Jun, holding a roasted corn with seasoning sprinkled on it, commented that the seasoning Theo brought was a godsend to the grilled corn. He continued, saying it's a pity that he can't taste the butter-grilled corn like his mom makes, but this also looks very delicious. The white rabbits were also holding grilled corn, and the warrior rabbit was contemplating whether to eat the grilled or steamed corn. Then, Seo Jun began preparing his special corn. First, he applied the sugar that Theo bought onto the corn and grilled it until it turned golden brown. Next, he sprinkled some Parmesan cheese onto the grilled corn. With his tongue licking his lips, Seo Jun reached into his bag while a cute baby rabbit watched curiously to see what Seo Jun was doing. Suddenly, he excitedly brought out a pouch full of red chili powder and explained how he found this chili pouch in Theo's bag while Theo was sleeping. He started to think with a slight anger that Theo didn't tell Seo Jun about such a precious item and considered removing Theo from the sales cat position. However, he decided to let it slide since he was in a very good mood today. Lastly, he sprinkled some chili powder onto the corn and voila, Seo Jun's special juicy corn was ready. The system notified Seo Jun that it was a corn filled with Seo Jun's aura and so delicious that one couldn't hold back once eaten. Finally, Seo Jun took a bite out of his special corn, and yes, it was truly delicious. Seo Jun smiled with pleasure, feeling like he was in heaven as the sweet and spicy taste reminded him of his home. Then, Seo Jun prepared six grilled juicy corns and gave them to the tower manager, who thanked him happily, completing the quest. Seo Jun then turned toward the white and warrior rabbits and asked them if the grilled corn was was delicious. They nodded in response with smiles on their faces as they munched on the grilled corn. Then, Seo Jun noticed that the husband rabbit and the wife rabbit were not eating their meals as they were busy feeding the baby rabbits. Then, Seo Jun got an idea. He placed a steamed corn on a bowl and with a spoon scraped the corn kernels, separating them. He gave the bowl full of corn kernels to the husband rabbit and the wife rabbit, saying that now the baby rabbits could eat without being fed, and they could also enjoy their meal. The husband and wife rabbit sighed in relief and thanked Seo Jun while the baby rabbit surrounded the bowl full of corn kernels and started picking them one by one. Then Seo Jun also started munching on the corn happily. However, as he took a bite, he noticed something, and the next moment he spit out all the corn he had eaten, saying, What the hell? He saw that the baby rabbits were playing with the corn kernels, and all the corn kernels were sticking to their bodies. Three baby rabbits were lying on the bowl, with one eating a corn kernel while the other two called out to Seo Jun cutely. Seo Jun gently, with a warm smile, started removing the corn kernels one by one from their bodies, remarking on how they were getting naughtier day by day. Meanwhile, one baby rabbit, with a full stomach, was sleeping on the bowl, while another was eating some corn kernels. Others had their corn kernels removed by Seo Jun. With an exhausted expression, Seo Jun started feeding the baby rabbits, saying that working while taking care of babies was very tiring. He missed Theo, as Theo was the one who used to take care of the baby rabbits. Then Seo Jun gave the mommy and baby bear some sweet potatoes, fresh fish, and some corn to eat, and they also started eating happily. Then the scene shifts, and we see a member of the Phoenix Guild banging his hand on the table in frustration, asking why Theo is not coming as he is taking longer than usual. They had set up a camp on the 38th floor where Theo usually comes to sell the cherry tomatoes. Another hunter asked why he came here to buy cherry tomatoes again, as just the other day, he bought a good amount of cherry tomato. He replied with a serious face that outside the tower, rich people are buying these magical cherry tomatoes at very high prices. A single cherry tomato is selling for more than $400, so he came to stock up on the cherry tomatoes to sell them at a higher price later. Then we see Dong Shik talking with a blonde-haired woman, Jessica, a member of the Phoenix Guild. She asked Dong Shik what to do as their supplies are slowly running out and it will become very difficult to leave the tower once they're empty. Now Dong Shik, thinking deeply, replied that they have no other choice. He decided to stay in the tower 
while all the other members will get out from the tower to refill the supply. As all the members were leaving the tower, Dong Shik, watching them from behind, said to the big melon girl, he thought Jessica would be the one staying in the tower, but didn't expect Soha to be here with him. Then, Suha explained that Jessica had already gotten rid of her fatty stomach, so she no longer needed the cherry tomatoes. With a warm smile, she said that Jessica gave her share to Suha instead. Dong Shik asked Suha if she would also participate in the auction personally, wondering if she also needed the cherry tomatoes. Suha replied that she was not there for the cherry tomatoes. She playfully winked and brought out five packets of churu, saying she was here to give this churu to Theo. Dongshik laughed and replied that it's good to keep Theo happy since he's a very important guy. Then the scene shifts, and we see Theo singingly walking in the forest, saying that the baby rabbits are waiting for the cool Uncle Theo, so he has to quickly finish his work and return to the cave. Finally, after a long walk, Theo reached his destination, the Wandering Merchant Passageway. It was a humongous, thick tree with a large hole, and was now standing just above the passageway on a hill. Theo commented on how big the tree was, and looked up, saying he felt like the tree was so big that it would reach the sky. Then we see many wandering merchants preparing to enter the passageway. Among them, there's a big elephant, a goblin, and two little mice, all following Theo, who was at the front of the group. A cute dog merchant officer asked Theo which agency he was from and what Theo's grade was. Theo proudly replied that he was a high-grade wandering merchant and wanted to use the passageway to reach the 38th floor. The officer approved Theo's request, and he started moving forward. However, unbeknownst to Theo, three wolves from behind him began glaring at him with deadly eyes and followed him. They were silver-furred wolves with sharp yellow eyes. One of them was larger, the captain, and the other two were smaller. The two smaller wolves, upon seeing a drawing, they stared at Theo, trying to find something. Eventually, they revealed that they were looking for the straw hat that Theo had bought from the blacksmith. The two wolves' names were Wilco and Elkie. The little wolf asked the big wolf with a worried face why the floor boss was looking for the straw hat, especially just an ordinary straw hat that could be found anywhere. However, the captain replied with a serious tone that it didn't matter what the item was. They were the Silver Wolf tribe, the best mercenaries in the whole tower, and they should just act according to what the commissioner ordered. Then their captain ordered his subordinate that it's unlikely that Theo is the one who has the straw hat, but for now, they will just follow him. They pulled their hoods over their heads. Unbeknownst to them, from behind, a ghostly figure was watching them. She was the fox police girl. Seeing all of this, she was also shocked as to why the Silver Wolf tribe was after Theo, and then wondered if it was because of the straw hat. She started to wonder what the mysterious straw hat that the floor master had hired the Silver Wolf for even was. Deciding to follow the Silver Wolf, we see all the wandering merchants passing through the passage with Theo at the front, unaware of the danger following him. Just behind him, the Silver Wolf was tailing, and just behind the Silver Wolf, the Fox Girl was stealthily following them. In the previous episode, we saw how, after eating Seo Jun's blue cherry tomatoes, our tower manager grew thicker and became all lovey-dovey, starting to kiss Seo Jun from her crystal ball and just couldn't get enough of him. Meanwhile, Seo Jun was facing challenges in taking care of the baby rabbits in Theo's absence. On the other hand, Theo embarked on a journey to the 38th floor with the intention of selling cherry tomatoes. Little did he know that three silver wolves were silently tailing him. These wolves were on a quest to retrieve the straw hat that Theo had purchased from the black market. To make things even more interesting, the diligent police fox, Zeraf, was keeping a close watch on the three silver wolves, adding a layer of mystery to the unfolding events. On a lovely sunlit day, the shovel rabbit was hard at work, digging into the earth. Meanwhile, the cart rabbit diligently piled up the excavated soil into his cart. Right beside them, the warrior rabbit, with determined swings, was hammering the ground, making it more even and suitable for planting. So guys, today's like goal is 7,000 likes, so please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Zooming out, we could see both the mommy bear and the baby bear also busy at work, fixing the soil that had been disrupted during the previous Blue Moon's chaos caused by the buffalo. Seo Jun stood there cheering them on and expressing his gratitude to the mommy bear for her assistance. In a flash, the once hilly piles of dirt were leveled, and the field above the cave was all set for planting. Seo Jun's excitement was palpable as he reached into a red pouch. 
When he opened it, it revealed a sparkling abundance of peanut seed. The sight of those seeds brought smiles to the faces of Seojun and his furry companion. Seojun began sowing the peanut seeds across the prepared field. The husband and white rabbits were right behind him, watering the freshly sown seeds, while the cart rabbit, with a contented grin, observed Seojun's efforts. The shovel rabbit tirelessly continued to dig, ensuring that the field was perfectly ready for Seojun to sow his seeds. After a while of hard work, Seojun wiped the sweat from his brow and turned around to see all the peanut seeds neatly sown across the ground. With a cheerful tone, he remarked to the husband rabbit that increasing his agility had truly paid off. It had significantly boosted his work speed, allowing him to plant all the peanut seeds in just a few hours. Seojun attributed this remarkable speed not only to his improved agility, but also to the magical straw hat which provided him with nearly infinite stamina exclusively for farming. The husband rabbit responded with a happy smile, genuinely pleased with Seojun's success. The narration then takes us back in time, showing us how Seojun acquired these peanut seeds. On the previous day, when the seed store opened, three seed options lay before Seojun, radish seeds, cucumber seeds, and peanut seeds. After careful consideration, he decided to purchase peanut seeds. His choice was influenced by a YouTube video he had watched, which highlighted peanuts as an excellent crop for soil restoration, something he urgently needed to address the condition of the soil above the ground. Despite his initial inclination to buy cucumber seeds, he ultimately bought 1,000 peanut seeds for five tower coin. However, there had been a pleasant surprise waiting for Seo Jun. The system had notified him that he had accumulated 100 seed store points allowing him to increase his seed store level. This revelation left Seo Jun astonished, and he promptly upgraded his seed store level. As a result, the system informed him that he had been promoted from a rookie to a commoner. With this new status, he could now choose from four types of seeds instead of the usual three. Furthermore, he gained the privilege to purchase an unlimited quantity of seeds from the seed store, although there was still a maximum spending limit of five tower coins per month. After completing this transaction, Seo Jun received his precious peanut seed. Now, standing there with his bag full of peanut seeds, Seo Jun wore an excited expression. He couldn't help but imagine what next month's visit to the seed store would bring. His mind buzzed with the possibilities of how many varieties of seeds he would be able to purchase and how his progress would more than double. The anticipation of what lay ahead left him positively thrilled. Returning to the present moment, Seo Jun found himself amidst a task. He was carefully collecting all the harvested corn plants, which were a part of his secret plan as corn plants, once harvested, became useless as they couldn't be replanted. The baby bear, full of cheerfulness, lent a hand in carrying the corn plants, while the rabbit buddies observed the activity with happy expressions. As Seo Jun patted the baby bear, thanking him for his hard work, the baby bear responded happily in his own language. Seo Jun and his rabbit buddies then began placing the corn plants one by one on top of the exposed peanut seeds. Seo Jun explained that he had cut the corn leaves to create a cover for the peanut seeds, preventing moisture from evaporating. This precaution was necessary due to the constant 24-hour sunshine in their environment. Afterward, seated on the ground, Seo Jun took a corn and started separating the corn kernels, placing them in a bowl. Once he had finished, wiping his sweat away, the system notified him that his experience points had increased, along with his seed gathering level. Seo Jun was planning to soak the corn kernels in water to encourage germination before replanting them. However, before he could proceed, the baby rabbits approached him, and one of them began nibbling on the corn kernels in the bowl. Seo Jun quickly lifted the bowl, reminding them that the corn kernels were not for them to eat. Nevertheless, the baby rabbits persisted, climbing onto Seo Jun's body, eager for a taste. Seo Jun couldn't help but notice the baby rabbits looking a bit downhearted, some even appeared quite bored. With Theo absent and everyone, including himself and the other rabbits, busy with farming, the baby rabbits had little to keep them entertained. Realizing their need for some fun, Seo Jun had a brilliant idea. Excitedly, he reached into his bag, declaring that he had a fun task for the baby rabbits. Their eyes sparkled with anticipation as they waited eagerly. Seo Jun wasted no time and got to work. Using empty seed pouches, he crafted three small backpacks and fashioned three miniature handbags from leftover cloth material. To fill these pouches, he added dried sweet potatoes and carrots. 
Now, the baby rabbit stood there, brimming with excitement, each holding one of these adorable snack-filled bags. One of them beamed proudly, while another sneakily nibbled on a piece of dried sweet potato. Observing them with a warm smile, Seo Jun couldn't help but comment on how cute they looked, like a group of kindergarten kids. With a smile, Seo Jun instructed the baby rabbits that their mission was to deliver these snacks to the hard-working adult rabbits. They eagerly prepared themselves and, with a wave to Seo Jun, indicated they were ready for action. Seo Jun, addressing them as supply units, shouted a playful command to march forward and complete their mission. The baby rabbits, filled with excitement, happily began their march ready to deliver snacks to their rabbit companion. Next, we witnessed the heartwarming sight of the baby rabbits distributing snacks to their hardworking companions in the field. The working rabbits were clearly delighted. Their faces lit up with happiness. The husband rabbit, full of pride, patted one of the baby rabbits on the back. The mommy rabbit wore a contented smile as she lovingly embraced a baby rabbit, her motherly heart swelling with pride. Meanwhile, the cart and sickle rabbits indulged in their snacks, savoring the treats. Two other lively baby rabbits playfully scampered around the field, their joy infectious. From a distance, Seo Jun observed this heartwarming scene, and an idea began to form in his mind. He resolved to talk to Theo about purchasing some cute little outfits for the baby rabbits once he returned. As he imagined the baby rabbits dressed as a ship captain, a postman, and even a cute Cinderella, he couldn't help but chuckle. The mental image of these adorable baby rabbits in costumes brought a smile to his face. Yet he regret that his phone's battery had run out, preventing him from capturing this charming scene for posterity. The scene shifted, and we found Ox Number 3 wandering through the vast lands with a heavy heart, a profound sadness etched on his face as he contemplated where he had discovered that extraordinary radish. His memories were foggy, and he couldn't recall anything that had happened since the arrival of the Blue Moon. What he did remember was that he had found the radish before the Blue Moon had graced the sky. In a flashback, we saw how the Ox King had reacted when he first laid eyes on the radish. The Ox King had gone absolutely wild with excitement. Clutching the radish in his massive hand, he had bombarded Ox Number 3 with questions, demanding to know the origin of this peculiar root. However, Ox Number 3's memory was hazy due to the effects of the Blue Moon, and all he could manage was a sweet, innocent smile. He admitted that he had discovered the radish somewhere outside the Ox King's territory, but couldn't remember precisely where. The Ox King had regarded the radish skeptically at first, but then, as if seized by an irresistible urge, he had taken a big bite. He chewed the radish slowly, his eyes wide, and the other oxen watched in envy with drool on their chins. Then, the unexpected occurred. The Ox King let out a resounding moo, his eyes bulging as if they might pop out of their sockets. He began to breathe heavily, and drool cascaded from his mouth. With both arms raised high, he shouted that the more he chewed this root, the sweeter it became. Incredibly, as he consumed the radish, his muscles began to bulge and grow, transforming him into a veritable mountain of muscle, all from the power of a single radish. Then, with heavy excitement, the Ox King grabbed Ox Number Three's shoulder and started shaking him, asking him if he had to dig the ground or fly in the sky. He had to find the place from where he got this magical root, as the future of the Minotaur clan depended on it. He ordered Ox Number Three to find this place in the name of the pride of all the oxen, while Ox Number Three stood there confused. Now we're back in the present, and Ox Number Three stood expressionless, contemplating what to do next. After traveling for a while, he reached the border of the Ox King's territory and explained that one step from here and the territory of the Crimson Bear would begin. He had no idea what would happen if the bear found him. Just as he pondered his next move, something unexpected occurred. Ox number three suddenly smelled a sweet fragrance in the air. Without knowing it, he instinctively followed the scent and soon found himself in front of a farmland where Seo Jun had just planted peanuts and covered them with corn leaves. Seeing these green plants, Ox Number 3 was shocked and bewildered. He immediately started eating some of them and gathered the plants. Before he could do anything more, the sweetness of the corn plant melted in his mouth, and he exclaimed how delicious it was. Without wasting a moment, he started gathering the crops. With each bite and every plant he harvested, 
Ox number three's happiness grew. A radiant smile crossed his face as he considered what kind of plant this could be. He couldn't help but think of the joy the Ox King would experience upon seeing this bounty. With unmatched enthusiasm, Ox number three collected all the corn plants. Holding them high and dancing with glee, he made his way back into his territory. The sweet treasures he carried would surely bring immense delight to the Ox King and the entire Minotaur clan. Meanwhile, the crimson bear in her nest sensed something amiss. She abruptly stood up, fully alert, causing the baby bear who was sleeping beside her to tumble onto the ground. Confused and still half asleep, the baby bear wondered why his mother had awakened so suddenly. The mother bear was furious, her eyes blazing with anger, emitting a terrifying aura. On the other side, the tower manager was sipping Seo Jun's special juice while enjoying a hot bath in the spa. This spa was designed for adults, but due to her smaller size, she hadn't been able to use it until now. With her increased thickness, she finally got to savor its warmth. However, her relaxation was interrupted when she noticed someone calling out to her. At first, annoyance clouded her face as she wondered who had the audacity to disturb her bath. But when she saw that it was the Crimson Bear, her anger subsided. She inquired about what had happened with the bear. Upon learning that someone had invaded her territory, the tower manager's shock was evident and her mouth hung open. Meanwhile, Seo Jun was in a deep slumber, completely unaware of the unfolding events. He lay on a bed made of onion leaves, with an eye cover crafted from the same leaves, and a trail of drool trickled from the corner of his mouth. It was the tower manager who eventually roused him from his peaceful sleep. As Seo Jun slowly opened his eyes, the tower manager hurriedly informed him about the Crimson Bear's report. Someone had invaded her territory and approached his cave. At that very moment, the Crimson Bear herself arrived near Seo Jun's cave, calling out for him. Seo Jun, feeling a bit anxious, contemplated his next move. Eventually, he decided to step outside with all his rabbit friends to investigate. To his relief, he found that his peanuts were unharmed this time, and the farmland was intact. However, there was a major problem. All the corn plants had mysteriously vanished. Someone had stolen every single one, leaving Seo Jun in complete shock. The sickle rabbit appeared disheartened, clutching a corn leaf, while one of the white rabbits seemed a bit frightened, as all their hard work had seemingly gone to waste. Seo Jun, perplexed and frustrated, held his head in his hands, wondering who could have done this and what to do next. Meanwhile, Theo had just arrived on the 38th floor, where he cheerfully greeted the hunters, unaware of the dangers awaits him. In the previous episode, we saw how everyone worked together to cultivate the land above the ground. Seo Jun had bought peanut seeds for his farm. However, an unexpected turn of events occurred when Ox Number 3 discovered Seo Jun's farm, stole all his corn leaves, and made a quick getaway. This act left the mommy bear and the tower manager furious while Seo Jun and his rabbit buddies were left speechless as their farm was once again destroyed. Now, Seo Jun watching his farmland was in deep thought. He noticed that this time, his land wasn't destroyed. It was just the corn leaves that were missing. Whoever or whatever did this had to be intelligent creature. While he was fretting over this, Mommy Bear spoke up. She suggested to Seo Jun that it must be the work of the horn bastards. The mention of horns got Seo Jun thinking hard. He remembered hearing a sound like a cow on the blue moon day. If those creatures were behind this, it meant trouble. Seo Jun then had a word with the sad warrior rabbit. He told the little guy not to be down because it was actually a good thing the farm wasn't totally destroyed this time. They just took the corn leaves and they could always cover the peanut seeds again with the tomato leaves from the cave. Mommy Bear, trying to make Seo Jun feel better, promised to step up her game. She said she'd be more alert from now on, patrol the area more, and even expand her territory. Seo Jun gave her a grateful smile and thanked her for being so solid. But then, giving the baby bear a gentle pat, Seo Jun gave Mommy Bear a friendly warning. He appreciated all her hard work, but didn't want her to overdo it. Health comes first, he said, and Mommy Bear nodded, understanding what he meant. So guys, today's like goal is 5,000 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Now, with the mommy bear off patrolling, Seo Jun was left feeling concerned. He reflected, let's just be satisfied that no one is hurt. But he knew he needed to prepare for the future. While patting the baby bear, Seo Jun clenched his fist and spoke with confidence. He declared that he had to become powerful to protect himself and everyone from outside dangers. The baby bear looked puzzled, not understanding the gravity of the situation. Meanwhile, the warrior rabbit was ready to face anyone who dared to threaten their farm again. The scene shifted, 
and we saw the white worker rabbits gently placing corn leaves on top of the beautiful white cocoon of the queen bee. They carefully arranged them in a basket made with onion leaves. Seo Jun expressed his gratitude to the white rabbits for their help, and they waved in response. Seo Jun was seated on a chair made with onion leaves and wood, shading himself with an umbrella made of onion leaves. Beneath him was the basket containing the queen bee's cocoon. Seo Jun gazed at the cocoon with excitement, knowing that today was the day the queen bee would hatch and he would become her daddy. He planned to spend the entire day beside the cocoon and had left all the farming work to the farmer rabbits. Seo Jun went on to explain that the system had informed him that when the queen bee's cocoon hatches, the first person she sees would become her daddy. He lounged in his comfy chair, nibbling on some dried sweet potato, and continued. Currently, there were around 200 honeybees in the colony. When the new queen bee hatches, she would establish her own colony, dramatically increasing the total number of honeybees, and he can control them all using his beekeeping skill, adding an extra layer of protection. Beside him, there were some cherry tomatoes and sweet potato flowers displayed. Despite many hours passing, the queen bee had yet to hatch. Seo Jun, feeling drowsy, began to yawn. He held a cherry tomato flower in his right hand and a sweet potato flower in his left. With a warm smile, he thought about offering these flowers as a welcome gift to the new queen bee once she hatched. Then, a curious question crossed his mind. Which of these flowers would the queen bee like more? However, despite his best efforts to stay awake, sleep overcame him. Seo Jun drifted off into a deep slumber, his mouth hanging open, and he began to drool. In his sleep, he mumbled, I like thick bee. Then, something entirely unexpected occurred. The queen bee's cocoon began to tremble slightly. As moments passed, the shaking intensified, causing a crack to form on the cocoon's surface. From within that crack, a brilliant yellow light began to radiate, growing larger and more vibrant with every passing second. Multiple cracks emerged, creating an intricate pattern on the cocoon's surface. All the while, Seo Jun remained blissfully unaware in his deep slumber. After a relentless struggle, the dazzling light slowly subsided, leaving the entire basket in a gentle tremor. And then, a tiny hand emerged, delicately removing the remaining corn leaves from the basket. Finally, our queen bee had hatched. She was overflowing with joy and excitement, buzzing with life. The newly hatched queen bee inspected her tiny hands and body while receiving a notification from the system, indicating that she was the second generation of queen bee. But then... Something else caught her attention. She turned and saw something. Her curiosity peaked, and with a swift push, she took flight with her thick body. Landing gently on Seo Jun's chest, she stretched her body and curiously examined Seo Jun's face with her mouth slightly agape. After gazing at Seo Jun for a moment, the system delivered the crucial notification. The newborn Queen Bee had officially recognized Seo Jun as her daddy. In response, she gave a warm, contented smile her buzzing filled with happiness as she attempted to wake Seo Jun up, her newfound daddy. However, Seo Jun remained in a deep slumber, undisturbed by the joyful commotion around him. Then she noticed the cherry tomato flower that Seo Jun had prepared for her. Holding it in her hand, she blushed a little, her eyes sparkling with happiness. From inside the cave, our queen bee buzzed out, startling the new little queen bee. Our queen bee happily greeted her child, and as the new queen bee stared at her, she realized that this majestic bee was her mother. The mother queen bee began to speak, and the new queen bee listened attentively, nodding her head in understanding. Meanwhile, Seo Jun was still sleeping, oblivious to the joyful reunion happening in the cave. It seemed like nothing could wake him up. Mother and child queen bees started to fly, and we saw them joyfully circling around the cave. The baby queen bee followed her mommy closely, and the mother bee couldn't stop smiling as she watched over her child. All the while, Seo Jun remained in peaceful slumber. The baby queen bee finally greeted her mother, and her mother warmly returned the greeting. The baby bee buzzingly flew towards Seo Jun with an excited and happy expression, even though he was still sleeping. She approached Seo Jun's face and began rubbing her cheek against his, her tiny body filled with joy. In response to this unexpected wake-up call, Seo Jun mumbled, Bee! and slowly woke up. Startled and confused, Seo Jun was met with multiple system notifications. As his sleepiness vanished, he was shocked by what he read. The system notified him that the new Queen Bee had recognized him as her daddy, and his beekeeping skill had leveled up from two to three. This left Seo Jun both puzzled and intrigued. He desperately looked around, searching for the Queen Bee, expressing how badly he wanted to see her. The scene then shifted, and we saw that Ox Number Three had finally brought the corn leaves and proud 
proudly presented them to the Minotaur King. The confused Minotaur King asked where he found them. Ox Number 3 explained that he had acquired them from the Crimson Bear's territory, where there was an abandoned area with these leaves. The Minotaur King carefully examined the corn leaves, noting that they looked different from what he had eaten before. These plants were unfamiliar to him, and they appeared too scarce to be shared with others. Then we learned that Ox Number 3 had eaten all the corn leaves while returning, and he could only manage to bring back a single corn leaf. Hearing this, the Minotaur King was left speechless, his face filled with annoyance and uncertainty about how to react. Now, returning to the present, the Minotaur King held a piece of the green corn leaf in his hand, clenching his fist with a sad expression. He acknowledged that their clan had a big appetite, so it was understandable. Out of curiosity, the Minotaur King decided to take a small bite of the corn leaf, noting its sweet aroma. However, the moment he chewed the corn leaf, an electrifying sensation surged through his body and a thick white saliva oozed from his mouth. With sparkling eyes and a delighted expression, he exclaimed that it was incredibly delicious, almost divine. He felt an overflow of energy. With great excitement and wide open eyes, the Minotaur King patted Ox Number 3 on the shoulder, praising him for his discovery. He expressed that if they could somehow obtain a large supply of this grass, their clan wouldn't suffer from food shortages anymore. If they could cultivate it on their land, all their problems would be solved. However, with a serious expression and a gaze directed to the south, the Minotaur King pondered how this magical grass grew in the Crimson Bear's territory and how they could obtain more of it. Then his expression became sad as he mentioned how badly he wanted to go there and bring back as much of this magical grass as possible. However, he couldn't go to other monsters' territory while leaving the waypoint, as other monsters might attack them, and they were currently weak, so his clan members would not be able to survive. The Minotaur King urgently summoned Ox Number 3, who arrived in a panic, fearing he would receive a scolding for eating the corn leaves. The Minotaur King pointed his finger toward Ox Number 3 and shouted, making it clear that his new mission was to find the exact source of this magical grass. His excited face turned serious as he continued, emphasizing that if Ox Number 3 discovered that someone was intentionally growing this magical grass, he needed to find out their identity. Before the Minotaur King could finish his sentence, Ox Number 3 intervened. He raised his hand and began to yawn, his eyes closing as he explained that after eating so much grass, he was feeling incredibly sleepy, and he mentioned that he intended to take a nap before proceeding. Hearing this, the Minotaur King swiftly pulled out his great axe and shouted at Ox Number 3 to hurry and leave, threatening to cut him into pieces, and Ox Number 3 ran as fast as he could, saying he will sleep when he get back from his mission. The scene then shifted, and we saw that Theo had reached the 38th floor. Dong Sheik and his companions rushed toward Theo, accompanied by other hunters. The hunters questioned why Theo was late, speculating that he might have gone to another floor to sell his goods. Theo stood proudly and apologized, explaining that he had some important matters to attend to. He hinted that he had brought something special, surprising everyone. Dongshik asked Theo what could be more special than his already exceptional cherry tomatoes. Theo proudly revealed a red cherry tomato, emphasizing that it was even more special than his usual ones, as it's a D-rank cherry tomato. The sight of the D-rank cherry tomato left everyone in shock. Amid the astonishment, the big melon girl couldn't help but express her delight, finding Theo's reaction adorable. Each person held a piece of the D-rank cherry tomato, closely examining it. He discovered that this tomato reduced 20 grams of fat, twice the usual 10 grams, increased mana boost from 0.1 to 0.2, and had a longer shelf life of 60 days. Dongshik, in a state of speechlessness, contemplated the potential impact of this magical cherry tomato once it left the tower. He foresaw that it could cause quite a stir outside. Without further ado, Theo proudly unveiled a bucket made of onion leaves, filled to the brim with D-rank cherry tomatoes. He announced that he would be selling a total of 2,000 cherry tomatoes in batches of 400, with five rounds in total. As soon as he finished speaking, the hunters began bidding fervently. The initial bid of 70 quickly escalated to 90 and beyond. After an intense hour, the auction concluded, and Theo had successfully sold all his cherry tomatoes. Holding bags filled with tower coins, he chuckled with flushed cheeks. He declared that with this trade, his profits would exceed 1,000 tower coins. Moreover, it would enable him to register as a high-grade wandering merchant. Standing proudly, Theo held his head high and laughed heartily. He stated that once he achieved the status of a high-grade wandering merchant, 
all restrictions would be lifted. He looked forward to the day when Seo Jun's crops would be mentioned in the system notifications as desired by Seo Jun himself. He even jestingly contemplated that Seo Jun might confer upon him the title of chairman, granting him the authority to command Seo Jun. As Theo was lost in his daydreams, the big melon girl approached him and asked if he wanted to take a picture with her. Theo, with a hint of arrogance, thought to himself that he must be so famous that everyone wants to be around him as soon as they spot him. He opened his eyes with a flourish, proudly extending his paw. He confidently declared that anyone who wanted to touch his paws should form a line and be prepared with a suitable reward. However, before he could finish his sentence, he realized that only the big melon girl stood before him. She wore an awkward expression, and behind her, there was nothing but the wind-blown lead. Perplexed, Theo started searching for the crowd, wondering where his adoring fans were. The big melon girl explained that because Theo hadn't been on the 38th floor for days and their food supplies were running low, most of the residents had left. Only a few remained. Hearing this, Theo was shocked, his mouth hanging open. He felt a pang of hurt pride because it seemed that no one wanted to touch his paws anymore. To console him, the big melon girl offered Theo some churis, explaining that it wasn't that he was unpopular. People had left due to the shortage of supply. Theo, with an innocent and sad expression, gazed at his paws, wondering if they no longer had the power to attract people. He had hoped to receive many things from humans in exchange for letting them touch his paws, which would have boosted his chances of becoming a chairman. But now, it seemed like that might not happen. Just then, two girls approached Theo, excitedly exclaiming that he was Theo, the wandering cat. They came closer, stating that Theo was just as cute as they had seen on Instagram. They asked if they could also take pictures with him. Now Theo was utterly confused, asking the two girls what this Instagram thing was all about. With enthusiasm, the girls eagerly showed their phone screens to Theo and began explaining everything about smartphones and Instagram. As they went on, Theo's eyes sparkled with great excitement. He suddenly got a brilliant idea. In the previous episode, we witnessed the hatching of our new queen bee. As soon as she hatched, she affectionately approved Seo Jun as her daddy and rubbed her cheek against Seo Jun's. Following this adorable moment, she met with the mommy queen bee and they both had a wonderful time together. However, just before Seo Jun woke up, the baby queen bee flew away, leaving him bewildered. Afterward, upon sniffing and tasting the corn leaves from the Minotaur King, he went absolutely wild, feeling like he was experiencing the effects of marijuana. In his state of euphoria, he ordered ox number three to go and find the person responsible for growing this magical marijuana plant, no matter what. Meanwhile, Theo had a brilliant idea after seeing two girls' phones where his photos were posted on Instagram. Now, Theo was looking at his Instagram profile where multiple photos of him were posted, and he had amassed 23,040 followers. Curiously, he turned to the big melon girl and asked if the two girls came to find him because they saw his images on an app called Instagram. The big melon girl explained that yes, and she apologized sincerely for uploading Theo's images without his permission. Theo continued to stare at the Instagram profile in complete silence, while the big melon girl stood there anxiously, worrying that Theo might be angry about the unauthorized uploads. Before she could say anything, Theo suddenly turned and exclaimed, Of course she should be sorry. Why didn't she tell me something like this existed? The big melon girl was taken aback, wondering how to calm Theo's apparent anger. However, before she could respond, Theo placed one hand on his head and struck a cute pose, extending one foot forward. He then handed the phone back to the big melon girl, instructing her to hurry up and start taking pictures of him to upload to Instagram. This unexpected reaction left the big melon girl utterly shocked and clueless about what to do next. Then Theo started giving multiple poses, ranging from cool and confident to cute and innocent, making it look like he was asking for help. He stretched both his hands, winked mischievously, and struck a naughty pose. The big melon girl continued to take picture after picture as Theo posed enthusiastically. After hours of taking pictures, even the big melon girl started melting at Theo's cool poses, calling them too cute and adorable. Theo told the big melon girl that she could do whatever she wanted with the photos of him once she reached home at bathroom. But for now, she should focus on taking more pictures. Finally, Theo struck a killer pose, raising both of his hands and winking his right eye. He announced that if anyone wanted to meet this cute and cool wandering merchant, Theo, they could find him on the 38th floor. He urged everyone watching the video to follow him on Instagram before coming to meet him. With a playful threat, he counted down from 3, 2, 1, and exclaimed that everyone should subscribe to the channel 
or he would be mad at them and today's like goal was set at 5,000 likes so please like and subscribe the channel. After the intense photo shoot session, Theo was heading back to Seo Jun, stretching his arms and feeling quite satisfied. He mentioned how the photo shoot went well and how crazy it was that 23,000 people were now following him on Instagram. He wondered what would happen if even more people started following him and coming to him after watching the video. With confidence, Theo stated that he could already hear the sounds of hunters rushing to meet him. He planned to seize this opportunity to gain maximum rewards, and at this rate, he believed he could reach the chairman position in no time. Theo began to laugh, his cheeks turning red as he daydreamed about how he would command Seo Jun once he became the chairman. However, his daydream was abruptly interrupted as a strong gust of wind nearly pushed Theo back. He clutched his ears in irritation and demanded to know who it was. He had worked hard to straighten his fur, but now everything seemed ruined. Angrily, Theo turned around to find two giant silver-furred wolves, each standing at five meters tall with large claws glaring at him. Upon seeing the two giant wolves, Theo's face turned pale, and he quickly assumed a defensive position, looking terrified. But things were about to get worse for Theo. He heard loud footsteps behind him, and as he slowly turned back, he saw an even larger wolf than the previous two. This wolf stood at a towering seven meters tall and glared at Theo with a deadly serious expression that seemed to promise his imminent demise. Theo was too frightened to utter a single word, standing there with his mouth open, sweat covering his entire body. The seven meter wolf smashed its giant claws beside Theo, shaking the ground. With an angry and fierce look, the silver wolf leader slowly brought its head closer to Theo, growling and displaying its sharp teeth. In a deep voice, it asked Theo if he was the wandering merchant who had bought the straw hat at the smithy in the merchant district. But Theo was so scared that even the slightest growl might make him pee himself at that moment. Theo, still shaking, finally gathered the courage to speak, though his voice trembled. He tried to say something, but the words were barely coming out of his mouth. Seeing Theo's unresponsiveness, the silver wolf leader growled loudly, using a threatening tone to demand answers from him. It addressed Theo as a puny cat and demanded to know where the straw hat he had bought in the smithy was now. The leader warned Theo that if he remained silent, they would tear him apart and chop him into small pieces. The other two wolves joined in, growling and menacingly threatening Theo. He was in a terrible condition, already scared out of his wits, and now he had started to cry. But then, something unexpected happened. Suddenly, a rock-like object flew and landed between them, startling everyone. From that peculiar stone, a foul smell began to emanate, filling the entire area. The silver wolves had highly sensitive noses, so the stinky smell overwhelmed them. They closed their eyes and blocked their noses to escape the unpleasant odor. Even Theo had to hold his nose, as the smell was too strong for him. From the midst of the smoky, foul-smelling cloud, a mysterious figure appeared, glaring at Theo. Suddenly the mysterious figure grabbed Theo's hand, startling him. She introduced herself as Zarath, the newbie merchant whom Theo had helped before. Then she placed her finger to her lips, signaling Theo to remain silent. In the next moment, as the wolves were occupied trying to cope with the smell, Zarath, still holding Theo's hand, started running into the jungle. Theo followed her with a surprised expression on his face. As the smoke screen slowly faded away, the wolves noticed Theo and someone else running. Seeing this, the wolf leader shouted at them to stop warning that things would not end well for them. He hurriedly ordered his subordinates to follow and capture them no matter what. However, the two subordinates were lying on the ground, holding their noses and shouting for help to escape the stinky smell. They felt like they might die from the odor, leaving the wolf leader standing alone, holding his head and wincing in discomfort. This time, they had failed to catch Theo, and their mission had failed due to that mysterious figure. The scene then shifted, showing Theo and Zareth standing in the middle of the jungle, trying to catch their breath. Theo was still panting heavily, while Zareth let out a sigh of relief. She mentioned that they wouldn't be able to chase them for now, at least. Theo, with a worried expression, thanked Zareth, stating that something terrible would have happened to him if it weren't for her. Zareth replied with a smile, saying it was nothing, as Theo had also saved her once when she was in trouble. It was only natural for her to help Theo in return when he was in trouble. Hearing this, Theo happily started patting Zareth's shoulder, saying she is the nicest person he has met in the tower since his first crush. However, he added that he's a changed man now, a Giga Chad, and they should remain best friends, nothing more. 
Then Theo asked Zarath if she liked grilled fish and suggested they could go for a little walk. As they talked for a while, Zarath, seeing that Theo had become a little more comfortable with her, asked if Theo would be kind enough to give her some guidance on how to become a great merchant like him. Theo prepared his bag and replied that it's no problem at all. He will definitely guide Zarath, and they should go now. And with that, Zarath thanked Theo. Then, as they walked together, Zarath suggested to Theo that they should head to the merchant district, and she knew the best shortcut to get there quickly. However, Theo replied that first, he needed to go to the merchant guild and apply for a promotion to become a first-class mid-level merchant. After that, they could go to the merchant district and enjoy grilled fish. Hearing this, Zarath was genuinely shocked, and in her astonishment, she held her mouth and exclaimed, Did Theo say first class, mid-level merchant? She then asked in a surprised tone how Theo, who was just a low-level merchant when she last met him, had reached the level of first class, mid-level merchant in just one month. Moreover, Theo had been a newbie only a few months ago. Upon hearing this, Theo maintained a neutral expression and asked Zareth how she knew that he was a newbie a few months ago. Zareth realized she had revealed more information than she should have and started to panic, realizing that she couldn't afford to be caught as an agent of the wandering merchant secret police force, or her mission would not be completed. Then, Theo folded both his arms, looking suspicious, and asked Zareth why she was acting strangely and seemed suspicious. Zareth, trying to maintain a neutral expression, attempted to explain that it wasn't what Theo was thinking. But before she could say anything more, Theo shouted in anger, calling Scarum a bastard, and revealed that Scarum had divulged all the information about Theo when they first met. Bewildered by the situation, Zareth replied that yes, it was indeed Scarum who had shared everything about Theo without being asked for it. Hearing this, Theo became even angrier and started cursing Scarum, vowing to teach him a lesson when they met. Zareth, on the other hand, felt relieved that Theo appeared to be innocent and easy to manipulate. Then Zareth, with an innocent face, asked Theo how he managed to gather 1,000 tower coins in such a short period of time. She mentioned that it was an amount she couldn't even imagine making in her entire life as a low-grade merchant. She was curious about what Theo was selling to earn so many tower coins. On the flip side, Zareth felt a little worried. She wondered if Theo would be willing to share his trade secrets. She suspected that there might be someone very powerful behind Theo, providing him with premium products for trade. She believed that this item could be very dangerous or even illegal. If she found out about this item, she planned to arrest the backer first and give Theo a lighter punishment, as he seemed somewhat innocent and manipulated by the mysterious backer. Then Theo, with an innocent face, replied, I sell cherry tomatoes, Naya. Hearing the words, cherry tomatoes, Zareth first stood in her place in a state of shock and surprise, trying to process what she had just heard. Then, with a puzzled and surprised expression, her mouth open in disbelief, she asked, Is Theo trying to say those round little red fruits that thing? Theo confirmed by saying, Yes, it's the exact same thing. Theo then attempted to check his bag to find a cherry tomato, but he had sold them all that day. He promised Zareth that he would show her what a cherry tomato looked like the next time they met. With that, Theo started moving forward, suggesting that they should go, as the giant wolf might return if they stayed in the same place for too long. Zareth remained in a state of shock, her mouth still open without saying anything. Finally, Zareth came to her senses, pondering how in the world Theo could have earned 1,000 tower coins by selling nothing but cherry tomatoes. Was Theo lying? However, he didn't seem like the type of guy who would tell a lie. Zareth continued to follow Theo, her serious expression revealing her determination to unravel the mystery of how Theo had made 1,000 tower coins by selling mere cherry tomatoes. Meanwhile, outside the tower in the Gourmet Company, the CEO was holding a degrade cherry tomato, observing it closely. He decided to taste the cherry tomato, maintaining a serious expression, and commented that this cherry tomato indeed tasted more delicious than the E-grade one. Then he turned to see a person slowly placing a cherry tomato plant full of cherry tomatoes on a table. The chairman inquired if there was any good news, and Jenny, with a smiling face, replied that as he could see, the seed they planted from the E-grade cherry tomato had grown into a normal cherry tomato plant. The chairman, gazing at the cherry tomatoes, expressed that he had expected as much as the item was from the tower, making it impossible to grow on Earth. He then inquired about the progress of the farming project on the first floor, to which Jenny confidently replied that they had already sown 100 E-grade cherry tomatoes on the first floor, and 10 plants had already germinated and were ready to harvest. Hearing the chairman's words, he became genuinely happy and praised Jenny, 
acknowledging her hard work. Jenny, in return, credited the chairman for making it all possible. The chairman mentioned that he had already hired top-grade hunters to protect the farmland on the first floor, and once they successfully grew the cherry tomatoes, he would become the richest man on earth. Meanwhile, Seo Jun was busy harvesting the cherry tomatoes, with the queen bee sitting on his head. All his rabbit friends were helping him, unaware of what was happening outside the tower. In the previous episode, we saw how Theo, after encountering Instagram for the first time, got a brilliant idea. He proceeded to take multiple cute photos of himself alongside the big melon girl. Then he recorded a video of himself striking a cute pose and announced that anyone who wanted to meet him could do so on the 38th floor. As Theo was on his way home to Seo Jun, an unexpected incident occurred. A group of Silver Tribe wolves attacked Theo and began to threaten him, demanding information about the straw hat. They made it clear that if Theo didn't comply, they would kill him. The situation was on the brink of turning chaotic when something unforeseen happened. A smokescreen enveloped the entire area, and police officer Zareth came to Theo's rescue. She managed to save him from the dire situation. Meanwhile, the CEO of the government company and Jenny were filled with joy as they celebrated their successful planting of magical cherry tomato seeds on the first floor of the tower. They believed that this move would allow them to mass-produce the magical cherry tomatoes. The scene then shifts, and we see a wandering merchant officer handing Theo a silver token. Theo happily holds the coin in his hands, and the officer warmly congratulates Theo for getting promoted to a high mid-level merchant. Theo, filled with excitement and wearing a warm smile, raises his hand and proudly shouts that he has finally become a high mid-level merchant. Today's like goal is 5,100 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Theo turns back proudly showing his silver badge around his chest and smiles as Zerath congratulates him, calling him the best. Theo replies with a thankful nod and mentions that their work is done for now and they need to head to the trading market. He has something important to buy. Upon hearing the term trading market, Zareth's facial expression turns serious. She knows that the trading market is a place where only mid-high level merchants and higher level merchants can enter. It's one of the largest trading arenas in the entire tower. In this trading market, there's an auction house where one can buy various items, ranging from farming equipment to crafting materials to even underwear and condoms. You can find almost anything there as long as you're willing to pay for it. After a while, Theo and Zareth finally reached the trading hall. As Zareth followed Theo from behind, she couldn't help but feel a bit worried. While Theo walked confidently without a care in the world, Zareth narrowed her eyes in deep thought. This place was unlike the low-level markets that Theo used to visit. It was on a whole different level compared to the junkyards Theo frequented. Zareth was genuinely curious about what skills Theo would use in this new environment. However, before she could finish her thoughts, Theo suddenly stopped, announcing that they had reached their destination. He seemed genuinely interested in the shop in front of him. As Zareth glanced at the shop, she noticed a pouch symbol on the signboard. She then realized this was just an ordinary shop selling daily household items. Without wasting any time, Theo and Zareth entered the shop. Theo picked up a saw, some needles, threads, a frying pan, and a pot, placing them on the counter. He asked the store owner about the total cost for all these items. Zareth continued to observe Theo, and she couldn't help but notice that the store owner was a hyena with big teeth and sharp claws. Before Theo could say anything further, Zareth started speaking. She asked if Theo was buying these household items to resell them on other floors at a higher price. She expressed her concern, saying it was a really bad idea because these items were not in demand and no one would buy them. Theo casually replied that these items were not for resale. He needed them for someone else. He emphasized that he only sold cherry tomatoes for a living. Hearing this, Zareth frustratedly held her head and exclaimed, Cherry tomatoes again! She was clearly stressed, thinking back to when Theo had told her that he had reached a high-level mid-merchant status and collected 1,000 tower coins by selling cherry tomatoes. At that time, she had thought Theo was just messing with her, as he didn't want to reveal his merchant secrets. Now, she wasn't sure if he was telling the truth or not. The store owner, Heine, with a smiling face, said, The total bill is 2.4 tower coins only. Zareth, upon hearing this amount, paused for a moment. Then, she glanced at the utensils with an annoyed face, thinking that these pots and needles were much cheaper than 2.4 tower coins. Even if you combined all the things that Theo had bought, their total bill should not be more than 2 tower coins. In her imagination, she pictured the store owner, Heine, 
wearing a heavy suit of armor with a wicked smile, while Theo stood there in poor armor looking like a novice who didn't know anything. She concluded by saying that the store owner was ripping Theo off. With a serious expression, Zareth was pondering how Theo would counter this professional merchant. But before she could come up with any ideas, a voice echoed saying, Give me a discount. In her imagination, she saw Theo launching an attack on the Heine shop owner. In one swift slash, Theo disarmed the store owner, leaving him in shock. Then, she saw Theo in reality slamming his hand on the store counter and demanding a discount with a dead serious expression, glaring into the stone owner's eyes. This left Zareth speechless, with her mouth hanging open. She had expected Theo to use some mighty merchant skill, but he was just being reckless once again. The Heine store owner, still maintaining his warm smile, replied that he was already selling the goods at the lowest possible price. He suggested that Theo could go and check the market prices at other stores, as they were also selling at the same price. He emphasized that the quality of the goods in his store was the best in the entire trading market making the price reasonable. Theo, however, just stood there, glaring at the store owner without uttering a single word. After a while, still maintaining his sweet smile, the store owner, while rubbing his hands, decided to make an offer. He mentioned that since Theo was new to his store and appeared to be a gentleman and a nice guy, he would give a big discount and sell all the goods for 2.2 tower coins. But from Zareth's perspective, the Heine store owner appeared to be smiling wickedly and excitedly, attempting to overcharge Theo for the products. She explained that this store owner was playing a mental game where they initially set high prices for goods and then gradually reduced them, making customers believe they were getting a good deal when, in reality, they were being fooled into paying higher prices. Zerath imagined the store owner with deadly red eyes brutally attacking Theo, with Theo barely dodging the attacks. With a worried expression, Zareth thought that this store owner was not easygoing and was definitely a veteran merchant. This time, Theo might not get away unscathed. However, a voice echoed around the shop, demanding more of a discount with a deep tone. In Zareth's imagination, she saw Theo forcefully slashing the store owner's armor with his shabby sword. Back in reality, Theo continued to shout for a bigger discount, leaving the store owner bewildered and unsure of what to do next. The store owner, Heine, with a poker face, replied to Theo that he was already selling the goods at wholesale prices and barely making any profit from the trade. He explained that since Theo seemed like a nice guy, he couldn't lower the price any further. Theo, realizing that the store owner was not lowering the price, Theo decided to use the legendary technique that Seo Jun had taught him. He referred to it as the technique that every Asian mom uses, the ultimate bargain technique of moms, and with that, Theo turned and began walking away. With a confident tone, he stated that he didn't want to buy anything and would just go home. He called for Zerath to come with him, leaving her clearly confused by the unfolding events. Meanwhile, the store owner was left even more confused and shocked by this unexpected turn of events. Then, Zerath stopped Theo and asked him with a worried tone why he wasn't going to buy the goods. Theo, still maintaining his confident demeanor, replied that since the store owner wasn't offering a bigger discount, he would buy the products, but he had seen another shop nearby where he could definitely get a better deal. Hearing this, the store owner became annoyed, let out a sigh, and stopped Theo. He remarked that Theo was impatient and had lost the bargaining battle. He agreed to sell all the goods for two tower coins, so Theo didn't have to go to the store next door. However, Theo simply glared at the store owner confidently, came closer, and raised his hand. In an arrogant tone, he declared that he would only buy the products for 1.8 tower coins, or else he would leave the shop. This statement left Zareth in shock, her soul seemingly leaving her body as she stood there, like a statue. The store owner, thinking that Theo was not to be underestimated and looked like a professional merchant, considered future potential trades and decided to maintain a friendly relationship. He reluctantly agreed to sell all the goods for 1.8 tower coins, even though he didn't want to. Theo happily thanked the store owner, while Zarath remained in a speechless stupor. In the next moment, as Theo was making the payment and chatting with the store owner, Zarath stood behind, still in a state of shock. She couldn't help but wonder what legendary technique Theo had used to defeat the store owner, a professional merchant who had lost to Theo, a new high mid-level merchant. Zarath's imagination ran wild as she envisioned Theo standing triumphantly on the defeated store owner, holding his sword on his shoulder with a confident smile. Now, seeing all this, Zareth was just wondering. Zareth herself was from a noble merchant family, and she received bargaining education from an early age. 
but she had never heard or seen something like this. Glaring at the confident Theo, who had completed all his purchases, she said they should leave the shop now. She was thinking, is this naive-looking cat really a pro merchant? Did Theo really make 1,000 tower coins just by selling cherry tomatoes? If that's true, then this is surely a historical moment of a genius merchant being born. Meanwhile, Theo was smiling with his heart content, and he was singing in his mind, happy that the discount trick Seo Jun had taught him had worked. He had also bought all the things that Seo Jun had told him to buy. Then the scene shifted, and we saw Theo and Zerath walking in the trading market. Suddenly, Zerath stopped and said that she would be leaving now. Theo turned back, asking why she was leaving so early and mentioning that they hadn't even had a meal. He was about to treat Zerath, but she replied with a kind and warm smile that she had already troubled Theo enough and didn't want to bother him further. She expressed her gratitude for everything she had learned from him and apologized if she had caused any inconvenience or bothered him in any way. Theo looked confused and asked what she meant by teaching her anything special, as he didn't recall doing so. Then Zareth, still maintaining her smile, replied, It's nothing. She then warned Theo to be careful from now on, as the Silver Wolf tribe might attack him again in the future. With this final goodbye, Zareth started walking away from Theo. He watched her go for a while and then, with a mischievous smile, said, What a strange fox she was! Theo turned back, raised both his hands high and started walking forward while singing and expressing his desire to return to the cave quickly for a good nap, as he was feeling really sleepy. The scene then shifted to the building of the tower police. Inside that building, Zarath was writing something. She stopped writing, closed her eyes, and sat at her chair. Just then, her assistant entered her room, informing her that the director wanted to meet Zareth to inquire about the stolen straw hat. Zareth handed a document to her assistant, indicating that she would visit the director. The assistant, after examining the document, asked Zareth if it was related to the wandering merchant cat they suspected of being a smuggler. Zareth, dressed in her police uniform, confirmed that it was. However, according to her investigation, she believed that Theo was not a smuggler but a genuinely good and honest merchant. She instructed her assistant to inform everyone not to spy on Theo and to let them know that Theo was innocent of smuggling. Zarath, fully dressed and looking out at the sky from her window with a proud smile, said, For the first time in a long time I met a real merchant, while her assistant listened with a proud expression. Then the scene shifted, and we are back to Seo Jun. He was once again placing corn leaves on top of the peanut seeds, and the baby bear was helping him. After a few hours of hard work, they successfully covered the entire farm with corn leaves to lock in the moisture. Seo Jun stood there with a proud look, and the white rabbit was busy watering the peanut seeds. Suddenly, from behind Seo Jun, the warrior rabbit came rushing and shouting something in panic. The warrior rabbit was in a frenzy, trying to convey a message to Seo Jun, but Seo Jun couldn't understand a single word. Meanwhile, the chubby rabbit stood behind the warrior rabbit, raising both hands with a smile. After a while, Seo Jun finally understood that the warrior rabbit was pointing towards the ponds. Seo Jun, with the queen bee sitting on his shoulder, reached the pond and gazed at it intently, trying to figure out what was happening. The warrior rabbit and the cart were also fixated on the pond, and the white rabbit, looking a bit scared, was hiding beside Seo Jun's foot. Inside the pond, there were crayfish-like monsters with red and juicy bodies. As Seo Jun finally noticed the crayfish, he was deeply shocked and surprised. Seo Jun and all his monster pets were just staring at the mysterious crayfish in astonishment. Seo Jun wondered how these crayfish-like monsters had ended up in the pond. He pondered whether they had come through the hole he had seen a few days back. However, he immediately dismissed the thought and instead imagined a plate filled with delicious and juicy crayfish. He decided that he would make the most mouth-watering dish with these crayfish that no one had ever tasted before. As Seo Jun daydreamed about the delectable crayfish dish, he couldn't help but drool with anticipation. The white rabbit and the warrior rabbit were lost in their own fantasies, imagining the savory crayfish delights. The queen bee couldn't contain her excitement, looking forward to indulging in Seo Jun's special and juicy creation. Without wasting another minute, Seo Jun prepared to catch the crayfish. He took out his dagger, and the warrior rabbit wielded his hammer. Seo Jun stood there confidently, ready to attack the unsuspecting crayfish, who had no idea what was about to befall them. The other rabbit was equally excited, and the queen bee buzzed with anticipation. In the next moment, they began their hunt to capture and prepare the crayfish for a delicious meal. In the previous episode, we saw how Theo, after receiving his high-level mid-merchant badge, went to the trading market, where only high-level merchants can enter. 
Zareth also followed Theo, hoping to figure out if he was truly a professional merchant or a scam. There, Zareth witnessed an intense battle between the store owner and Theo during bargaining. Theo employed the ultimate technique that Seojun had taught him, the Asian mom bargaining technique, and successfully defeated the store owner, leaving Zareth shocked. After this encounter, Zareth verified and wrote in her report that Theo was indeed a genuine pro-merchant. She realized that Theo's bargaining skills were even more advanced than her own, despite her noble merchant background. She marveled at how Theo, at such a young age, excelled in bargaining, surpassing her abilities. Meanwhile, in his cave, Seo Jun made a new discovery. Crawfish had somehow found their way to the pond, and Seo Jun and his buddies got excited as they planned to catch them and create incredible tasty dishes. Immense concentration held his dagger and stared at the crayfish. Behind him, the rabbit families watched him with curiosity. Then, the crayfish, after studying Seo Jun for a moment, suddenly lunged at him to attack. But Seo Jun was no longer the loser. His stats were all at high-level hunter. With a swift slash, he effortlessly killed all the crayfish that had leaped to attack him. The system notified Seo Jun that he had gained 30 XP, and the warrior rabbit was clapping in excitement, ready to join the fight. So guys, today's like goal is 6,800 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Suddenly, more crayfish jumped towards Seo Jun to attack, and the warrior rabbit approached from behind holding his hammer high with excitement. Seojun turned back and, with enthusiasm, ordered the warrior rabbit to deal with the crayfish. The warrior rabbit began a barrage of attacks, hammering the crayfish one by one, instantly defeating them without breaking a sweat. After a while, the chubby rabbit and the husband rabbit were transporting the dead crayfish in the cart. They were followed by the other rabbit, each carrying a dead crayfish one by one, and transporting them to a spot near the campfire. The sickle rabbit, armed with his razor sickle, prepared to peel the crayfish's skin. The wife rabbit and the baby rabbits watched from behind with anticipation and sparkling eyes. However, as the sickle rabbit tried to cut the shell of the crayfish, even after several attempts with all his might, he couldn't make a scratch on the crayfish's body. The mommy rabbits, noticing this, asked the sickle rabbit what happened and if there was something wrong with his sickle. The sickle rabbit nodded his head, and explained that his sickle was fine, but the crayfish's shell was so strong that he couldn't pierce it. Seo Jun, holding two crayfish in his hand with a smile on his face, approached from behind and explained that even on Earth, it's really challenging to cut through the shell of a crayfish. In the tower, it seemed logical that the shells of the crayfish would be as hard as steel. So Seo Jun suggested cooking the crayfish on the campfire first. When the crayfish were fully cooked, their shells would loosen, making it easier to separate the meat from the shell. The sickle rabbit nodded in response. Then, Seo Jun unwrapped three more perfectly cooked crayfish and placed them in front of him on the onion leaves. He held one in his hand, ready to peel the skin off, and all the rabbits were waiting in anticipation. Seo Jun slowly applied gentle force to split the crayfish in half, and as he did, some of the juice started to splatter. The worker rabbit, the chubby rabbit, and the sickle rabbit stared in amazement with their mouths open. Finally, Seo Jun turned the crayfish's head and, with a gentle force, split the crayfish into two parts. Inside, the chewy and juicy golden meat sparkled. Seo Jun exclaimed in excitement with his mouth open, saying how juicy it looked. After smelling the heavenly scent of the meat, the rabbits were hypnotized and eagerly awaited their turn to take a bite. Seo Jun happily offered a portion of the crayfish's heavenly flesh and they all took it excitedly, stretching out their hand. As they all took a bite, as much as the scent was delicious, the meat was even more delightful. They hadn't eaten something like this in their whole lives, and they were really happy. While savoring large bites of the crayfish, Seo Jun chewed the meat and commented on its taste. He mentioned that the crayfish tasted exactly the same as those on Earth, but with a bit more juiciness. The seasoning was perfect, with a hint of tanginess from the cherry tomatoes and a slight saltiness, making it incredibly delicious. Behind Seo Jun, his rabbit family was also enjoying their crayfish meals. The chubby rabbit was munching on a whole large piece, taking huge bites and wearing a joyful expression. Meanwhile, the wife rabbit was picking the empty shells of the crayfish. Seo Jun noticed this and stopped the wife rabbit, telling her not to throw away the shells as they could still be useful. The wife rabbit looked a bit confused and asked what he meant while holding a crayfish shell. 
Seo Jun picked up the crayfish head shell and explained that these seemingly wasteful shells contain delicious fatty oils. He took a piece of crayfish flesh, dipped it into the fatty oil, and mentioned that eating the crayfish meat with this special juicy oil would enhance the taste by tenfold. As Seo Jun took a bite, he instantly regretted that he didn't have soju. If he did, this would be a really incredible combo. While the warrior rabbit watched Seo Jun eating this weird combination, he thought, why not? He also decided to try this strange-looking gooey substance from the crayfish's head. With courage, the warrior rabbit approached Seo Jun, and Seo Jun handed him some of the crayfish's oil. The warrior rabbit slowly dipped his hand into the weird oil. At first, it didn't look very appetizing to him, with its odd, sticky green appearance. He hesitated, having second thoughts about eating it. However, he decided to trust Seo Jun and took a lick of the strange substance. To his surprise, he instantly liked it. His eyes sparkled with delight as he discovered that it was nothing like he had expected. It was sweet and salty at the same time. Unable to resist, he started devouring the green oil mixed with crayfish organs and flesh. Seo Jun smiled warmly and advised the warrior rabbit to eat slowly, reminding him that the food wasn't going anywhere and they had plenty more to enjoy. After that, we see Seo Jun preparing the crayfishes and asking his rabbit family if anyone wants more crayfish. The warrior rabbit is devouring the crayfish's brain while the chubby rabbit is busy eating his large share of crayfish, and the newly found crayfish's brain mixed with delicious oils. The mommy rabbit and the husband rabbit are busy feeding the baby rabbits, while the sickle rabbit watches with a little smile, and each and every one of them is really happy. Just then, from above the cave entrance, the baby bear comes shouting Seo Jun's name, which catches everyone's attention. Seo Jun, noticing the baby bear, tells the baby bear to wait, as he came at a really good time since they have many more crayfish, and he should also taste some. The baby bear, upon hearing this, starts cheering with both his hands up. After some time, Seo Jun cooks many crayfish and places them in front of the baby bear. The baby bear sees this delicious-looking meat and couldn't contain his excitement. Seo Jun, holding one crayfish in his hand, starts to explain to the baby bear that he has to first hold the crayfish's body and twist the head to separate the steel-like shell, then he will be able to enjoy the meat inside. But before he could explain anything, the baby bear didn't listen and took a crayfish, munching on it like candy along with its steel-like shell. Seo Jun is left standing in shock, and in his shocked mental state, he just asks the baby bear if the meat is good. The baby bear nods in response with a bright, big smile indicating that he likes it very much. Meanwhile, the scene shifts, and we are now on the second floor of the tower, the skeleton village. Here, the townhouses were burned and ruined, and hunters were mercilessly killing the skeleton villagers while the skeleton villagers were trying to run for their lives. All the skeleton villagers were running toward the village, from kid skeletons to women skeletons. While running, a skeleton villager fell, and the hunters were just behind them to kill them. The skeleton even begged the hunters to spare them, but the hunter with the dagger, with a single slash, chopped the skeleton's head, killing him instantly. The head of the skeleton flew and came toward the CEO of the Gourmet Company. Upon seeing the skeleton in anger and disgust, the CEO of the Gourmet Company smashed the skull under his foot. While looking at the scared and dead and running skeletons, he started to smile in enjoyment. As the chairman of the Gourmet Company, we will address him as Musclehead from now on. He came close to the hunter with the dagger. The dagger hunter explained that he and his team had successfully killed all the skeletons in this area, and now this land was all under their control. The muscle head would not find any living skeleton villager here. Only dead skeletons remain in this village. Then the muscle head asked the hunter if he had not captured or taken control of the entire second floor yet. The hunter, a little nervous, explained that he is really sorry, and he has only been able to capture half of the second floor so far. He assured the muscle head that in no time he will take control of the entire second floor, and the muscle head won't see even a single skeleton. The muscle head, a little disappointed and annoyed, asked how much time it will take in total to capture the entire second floor. The hunter explained that even though they are only skeletons, they always roam in groups, and in a village there are at least 50, 100 skeletons present. Moreover, on the second floor, there are more than 50 villages, and the second floor is a very large floor, so it will at least take a few weeks. The muscle head was hearing this in silence, his eyes fixed on opening his status window. Then, the muscle head transferred some data to the hunter, surprising him. When the hunter asked what this was, the muscle head explained with a proud face that these are all the people who took debt from his company and were unable to repay. 
He forcefully awakened them and made them hunters. The dagger hunter can use these people, and his task is to take control of this floor within one week. As the musclehead was leaving, the dagger hunter bowed, saying the work will be done. Then the musclehead finally reached the farmland that he and his team had created by planting Seojun's cherry tomatoes. The lead researcher welcomed the musclehead, and while showing the little farm where the magical cherry tomatoes were grown, she explained with a smile on her face that they had successfully grown the special magical cherry tomatoes. The cherry tomatoes had finally grown healthy and ripened, ready to be harvested. She invited the musclehead to pluck the first cherry tomato with his own hands. Hearing this, the musclehead, with a wicked smile glaring at the cherry tomatoes, exclaimed, Finally! With that, he gently plucked a cherry tomato, and after glaring at it for a while with confidence and an excited smile, took a bite and placed the cherry tomato inside his mouth. He slowly chewed the cherry tomato for a while, but then something unexpected happened. The musclehead's whole face turned pale, and suddenly he crouched and started to vomit, throwing up all the cherry tomatoes that he had chewed. All the researchers and the lead researcher lady got a little panicked and came close to the musclehead, asking if he was okay. Then, before the red-haired lady could do or say anything, the musclehead, still with a pained expression on his face, started to shout and scold everyone, saying, What the hell is happening here? This confusion left everyone bewildered. In their confusion, when the red-haired lady asked for an explanation, as she couldn't understand what he was trying to say, the musclehead started to shout even more. He held up a cherry tomato and yelled, Can't she see that I clearly vomited the cherry tomato? That means the cherry tomato tastes disgusting. Hearing this, the red-haired researcher lady took the cherry tomato from the musclehead's hand, and she herself took a bite of the cherry tomato. All the other researchers also took a bite. And just like the musclehead, they started to vomit due to the cherry tomato's taste. The red-haired woman was also really shocked, saying they had used all the high-quality nutritional supplements, and everything was top-notch. Even in their lab, they had successfully managed to grow the cherry tomato on Earth, but it was not this disgusting. Hearing all this, the musclehead realized that all his money and career would go to waste if he didn't grow the magical cherry tomatoes. He had already invested a large amount of money into this project. In frustration, he forcefully plucked some cherry tomatoes and then threw them on the ground in anger. He started stomping on them, and as he raised his foot, what he saw left him in terror and shock. There was not a single seed inside the cherry tomato. Well, this happened because Seo Jun had all the exclusive rights to all the crops he would grow, and no one in the world would be able to grow his crops without his permission. Meanwhile, we see Seo Jun sleeping like there's no tomorrow, with his mouth open and drooling. Above him, there is a theft in progress. Ox number one sneaked in quietly, seeing the onion leaves placed on top of the peanut seed. With a wicked smile, he picked some onion leaves and stared at them for a while. Then, with a warm smile, he started to munch on them, completely unaware that something terrible was approaching him. In the previous episode, we saw how Seo Jun slaughtered the crayfish and then cooked it with cherry tomatoes and corn, having a feast with his animal family. Meanwhile, on the second floor of the tower, the CEO of the gourmet company mercilessly slaughtered all the poor, innocent skeletons living in the village just because he was planning to farm Seo Jun's special cherry tomato. He successfully made a farm after slaughtering half of the innocent skeletons on the second floor. However, as he plucked the first cherry tomato and tasted it, he was left speechless as the taste was truly awful like dog's shit. And the weird thing was that there was not a single seed in the cherry tomato, meaning they were gay. On the other hand, Ox Number 3 was secretly stealing onion leaves while Seo Jun was sleeping. Now the CEO was sitting in a hut inside the 38th floor, glaring at the cherry tomato that his team had grown on the second floor. With an annoyed face, he exclaimed that without any seeds, how could they reproduce the cherry tomatoes, let alone improve their breed? The taste was also terrible, like dog poop. Then his facial expression became a bit more serious, and while holding his chin with a contemplative look, he suddenly remembered something. We are shown a flashback to ten years ago when the musclehead was returning from his office and got sucked inside the black hole, accidentally entering the tower and becoming a player. The musclehead's dream was to become rich, not just rich, but the richest human alive on Earth. He even wanted to keep Elon Musk as his driver. So, guys, we are very close to reaching 200,000 subscribers. To those who haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do subscribe and support the channel. Today's like goal is 6,000 likes. Thank you, as always, for your love and support. Now, let's continue. Inside the tower, he realized that the sun never sets, and there's 24-hour sunlight shining on the ground. 
creating a perfect environment for growing crops with high-quality soil. He got a brilliant idea. His first step toward becoming the richest man on earth was to dominate and become number one on the global food chain by growing high-quality crops inside the tower. Then, after returning from the tower, he explained his dream to his dad, and although skeptical, his dad agreed to fund his dream. Then, he took all his father's company's money and started his project to grow crops inside the tower. He bought high-quality seeds and fertilizer, hired professional farmers, made them players, and guided them inside the tower for farming. But things didn't go according to his plan. After a few months, and repeated attempts to grow crops, not a single blade of grass sprouted on his farmland, let alone a crop. Seeing this, the muscle head was getting frustrated and desperate. He knelt on the ground, holding the soil, and started shouting, asking why. Even after investing all his father's company's money, trying hundreds of seedling methods, using high-quality seeds and fertilizers, and hiring professionals, not a single plant was growing. He was demanding answers while angrily gripping the soil. Then, after some time, an incident occurred. In the news, a report went viral stating that inside the tower, if hunters engaged in sexual activity, they would not get pregnant. For some reason, once a human enters the tower, their sperm loses the ability to pregnant a woman. Because of this, many couples were seen going inside the tower for their desires. Well, the musclehead, after hearing this news, realized that the same rule applied to crops. This was the reason he was not able to grow Earth's crops inside the tower. Crops were treated as foreign objects, and they also lost the ability to grow or reproduce. Even after all this, the musclehead didn't give up. He went on a quest to find all the merchants in the tower and started asking for fruits and vegetable seeds that grows inside the tower. His theory was that if the crops were grown inside the tower from the seed of the tower crops, he might be able to grow the crops himself. However, to his disappointment, all the merchants were willing to sell normal fruits and vegetables, but refused to sell crop seed. They explained that crop production was monopolized by a greedy and dangerous individual named Grid. Yes, it was the same guy who had hired the Silver Wolves to find Theo and retrieve the straw hat. All the merchants told him that they could only sell the crops, not the seed, or Grid would kill them. Hearing this, the musclehead was left devastated and depressed, with a pale face and no options left. He had used almost all the money from his father's company, and as he had failed in his project, his father declared him a failure and beat the shit of him after slammed his ass with Iron Road 100 times, and his father removed his name from the company and left him on the street. Just like that, his dream of creating a farm inside the tower crumbled like breadcrumbs. Now back in the present, the musclehead was deep in thought, glaring at the cherry tomato they had managed to grow from Seo Jun's cherry tomato seeds. Yes, the one that tasted like dog excrement. Then the musclehead suddenly stood up from his chair, and he immediately started shouting and ordering all his men to gather all the hunters on the 38th floor in front of him right now. He slammed a big pouch full of tower coins, shocking everyone. With a determined look on his face, he announced that it doesn't matter how much money he has to spend. He will successfully grow the crops inside the tower. They used E-grade tomatoes and made progress in at least growing a crop, so it's possible that if they try to grow again using the seeds of D-grade crops, the results might be different. While glaring at the cherry tomato while holding it in his hand, he continued saying, Everyone has only one mission, and that is to find that wandering merchant cat and buy each and every D-grade cherry tomato he is holding. Then... With a tight grip, he squeezed the cherry tomato and started laughing wickedly, saying he will definitely succeed in becoming the richest man on earth, make Elon Musk his driver, and show his father that he is not a useless son. Meanwhile, Theo was happily returning to the cave, thinking he would finally be able to become Uncle Theo again. However, he noticed something weird. Onion leaves were scattered on the ground. To inspect, Theo picked up an onion leaf and realized it was indeed the plant Seo Jun had grown inside the cave. He questioned why these leaves were lying outside the cave, but he didn't get any answers. Theo decided to collect all the onion leaves and ask Seo Jun once he reached the cave. He started picking up the onion leaves from the ground one by one as he moved forward. Suddenly, he bumped into something really hard. When Theo looked upward, he saw a large ox with a peculiar expression as if it was enjoying something. The ox appeared to be sucking on one of the onion leaves. As ox number three noticed Theo, he turned down and realized it was a wandering merchant. He asked if Theo needed anything. Theo, with an angry expression, pointed his finger toward ox number three and asked where he found that leaf he was munching on like a lollipop. Ox number three, 
sitting casually with a casual tone, pointed his finger toward Seo Joon's cave and replied that he found these leaves lying on the ground, so he took them. Hearing this, Theo started shouting while pointing his finger toward ox number three, saying there was no way the onion leaves were left or thrown recklessly on the ground. He had observed Seo Joon for months, watching him create useful things from these onion leaves, from footplates to bowls and even ropes. He had also seen Seo Joon wiping his ass with these onion leaves after taking a poop, so there was no way Seo Joon would have thrown them on the ground without any reason. Theo continued, expressing his outrage at Ox Number 3 for stealing these precious leaves. However, upon hearing this, Ox Number 3 became furious. He declared that Minotaurs were a proud and honorable clan, and they never stole anything. He slammed his giant hand on the ground, shaking the entire area and creating a huge hole. Theo was thrown high into the air by the impact, but managed to dodge the attack, saving himself from being smashed. Still seething with anger, Ox Number 3 growled with veins bulging from his head, stating that even though Theo was a wandering merchant, he would not hesitate to kill him if he dared to accuse Ox Number 3 of stealing these leaves. It was a direct attack on the Minotaur Clan's pride. Theo listened in fear, trembling and wearing a worried expression. Then, gathering a little courage, Theo stated that he was not lying and that he was an honest merchant who never lied. He stood up with even more courage, determined to protect his pride. In a loud voice, while pointing his finger toward Ox Number 3, he suggested that they should go to Seojun and ask him if he had really thrown these onion leaves on the ground or not. This way, the matter could be resolved without fighting. For a moment, Ox Number 3 listened to Theo's newfound courage. Then, his angry eyes gradually turned more normal and he replied that this was indeed a good idea. He was ready to go and ask Theo to take him to Seojun. Theo, filled with enthusiasm, began to lead the way to Seojun's cave. He requested that Ox Number 2 follow him and refrain from eating or doing anything with the onion leaves until they cleared things up with Seojun. Ox Number 3 silently followed Theo. After a while, they finally reached the entrance of the cave. Theo walked forward proudly, feeling like he had done a great job. Ox number three wore an annoyed expression, glaring at Theo and wondering why Seo Jun would have thrown these precious and magical grass on the ground to rot. However, suddenly, Ox number three, while holding his cheeks and with sparkling eyes, remembered that the Ox King had indeed instructed him to find out about the person who grew these magical grass. Now, he was about to meet that person, and he imagined the Ox King complimenting and rewarding him for his success. Lost in his daydream, he continued to follow Theo. Meanwhile, completely unaware of the events unfolding, Seo Jun continued to sleep soundly. Suddenly, a figure jumped from the cave entrance and landed on Seo Jun's stomach, causing him to spit out saliva from the impact and jolting him awake. In great pain and trembling, Seo Jun held his stomach, trying to recover from the shock. Theo, standing behind him, shouted at Seo Jun, urging him to get up and follow him immediately. Theo excitedly told Seo Joon that he had accomplished something remarkable, and Seo Joon would surely reward him when he saw what he had done. However, Seo Joon struggled to contain his anger due to the pain. After a moment, with the pain subsiding a bit, Seo Joon turned his head toward Theo and asked what the matter was. Smirking, Theo explained that he had caught a thief. Seo Joon, still lying on his back, was a little confused and asked Theo to clarify further. Theo insisted that Seo Jun should simply follow him, and he would find out everything soon enough. As Seo Jun slowly emerged from the cave, he was met with a sight that left him sweating with anxiety. He saw a massive buffalo-like creature, resembling a monster, staring angrily at the cave entrance. Seo Jun was left speechless, his face paling as he observed the intimidating presence before him. In a shaky voice, he turned to Theo and asked who this formidable figure was and whether it was the thief Theo had mentioned. Theo, perched on Seo Jun's shoulder with an air of confidence, remained silent. As they both stepped outside the cave, Theo hopped down onto the ground and began pointing his finger at the massive creature, Ox Number 3, while shouting that this was indeed the thief and that Seo Jun should scold him promptly. Seo Jun, still bewildered and unsure of how to confront the enormous buffalo-like creature, watched in confusion. Theo hurriedly retrieved the onion leaves that Ox Number 3 had taken and claimed as stolen. He presented them as evidence, insisting that Seo Jun needed to scold the creature for his actions. Seo Jun then realized that these were the onion leaves he had spread on the peanut seed farm to lock in moisture. 
Ox number three defended himself, shouting loudly that he had merely picked them up from the ground as they appeared to have been discarded and useless to anyone. He adamantly declared that he was not a thief. Using his observational skills, Seojun deduced that this massive creature was the Black Minotaur, the same one the Mama Bear had warned him about. It became clear that this creature had also been responsible for stealing corn leaves from the peanut field and creating large holes in the farm during the blue moon. As Seojun was lost in deep thought, Ox Number 3 continued shouting in anger, emphasizing that he was an honorable warrior of the Minotaur clan and could never steal anything. Theo, bolstered by his proximity to Seojun, joined in the shouting, asserting that Seojun had not discarded the onion leaf, and Ox Number 3 had definitely taken them. Seojun stood in uncertainty, trying to figure out how to handle the situation. In the midst of his contemplation, Seojun had a brilliant idea, but before he could elaborate, Theo interjected. Addressing Seojun as chairman, he urged Seojun to hurry and tell the truth about whether he had really discarded the onion leaf. Seojun responded that he had not thrown them away, as they were too precious and had multiple purposes. He explained that he had spread the grass on the field to retain moisture for the peanuts to grow well. Hearing this revelation, Ox Number 3 was taken aback, his mouth agape in shock. Now, Ox Number 3 was growing increasingly nervous and he stammered as he explained to Seo Jun that he thought the grass had been discarded, which was why he had taken it. He began to berate himself, questioning how he, a proud minotaur, could have mistakenly taken something that didn't belong to him. He then humbly apologized to Seo Jun, acknowledging his error in taking the grass. However, Seo Jun had his own devious plan in mind. With a sly smile and folded arms, he responded to Ox Number 3, stating that mere words of apology would not suffice. He reminded Ox Number 3 that he had not only stolen this time, but had also previously destroyed his farm during the Blue Moon. Seo Jun extended his hand confidently and declared that Ox Number 3 would have to compensate him with 100 Tower Coins, as his business had suffered due to Ox Number 3's mistake, and this was the price he had to pay. Then, with a confident look, Seo Jun stretched out his hand and shouted, 100 Tower Coins! Seo Jun needed 100 tower coins as compensation for the mess Ox Number 3 made in his farmland on the Blue Moon night and for stealing onion and corn leaves two times. Hearing this, Ox Number 3's world turned upside down, and with a pale face in shock, he shouted and panicked, asking if the grass was that expensive. He had no idea, and he sincerely apologized from the bottom of his heart. Ox Number 3 sat on the ground with a hanging mouth, depressed and not knowing what to do. He had unknowingly stolen someone else's things, and Seo Jun was glaring at him with an angry look. Then, pointing his hand towards Ox Number 3, Theo started shouting, insisting that he had indeed stolen the leaves. He demanded that Ox Number 3 hurry up and pay 100 tower coins for compensation. However, Ox Number 3 just listened silently, as he didn't even have a single tower coin. Then Theo climbed on top of Ox Number 3's body, tapping his muscular abs, and addressed Seo Jun as the chairman. He inquired about what they should do now, as Ox Number 3 appeared to have no money, just his underwear and his big PP. Seo Jun, however, maintained his angry expression, causing Ox Number 3 to become even more panicked and worried. Beads of sweat formed on his face as he contemplated the consequences of his actions and the impact on the pride of the entire Ox clan. Breaking the tense silence, Seo Jun, still wearing a confident look and a warm smile, politely suggested to Theo that there might be a solution. If Ox Number 3 didn't have the money to pay, he could pay with his labor. Seo Jun proposed that Ox Number 3 would have to come to him and work diligently every day, doing whatever Seo Jun instructed. In return, Seo Jun would give Ox Number 3 one tower coin every day, and after 100 days, he could repay his debt of 100 tower coins. As Seo Jun explained this arrangement, Ox Number 3 listened carefully. After processing the proposal, he replied seeking clarification. So, Seo Jun, you want Ox Number 3 to work here and pay off his debt, right? Seo Jun, while hiding his face, explained, Yes, Ox Number, you got this right. On top of one tower coin every day, Seo Jun will also give Ox Number 3 food to eat, like the spring onion he just stole and the corn leaves he stole the other day. But it's just the beginning, as he also has many more delicious crops to give, like corn, cherry tomatoes, and sweet potatoes. Ox Number can eat or even take home as much as he wants to, as Seo Jun is not an evil person, and he will take good care of his workers. But even before Seo Jun could finish his sentence, a barrage of Ox Number's spit started to spray at Seo Jun's face. Ox Number 3 got really pumped up, 
started to drool, and took heavy breaths with his eyes wide open while shouting, Can he really eat as much as the magical grass he wants? Seo Jun, barely able to stand because of the breath and rain of saliva from ox number three, with a warm and polite tone, while forwarding his hand, said, Yes, ox number three, you heard it correctly. You indeed can eat as much as your heart desires. So, let's first sign a contract. First, ox number three can come to work from tomorrow. Hearing this, ox number two, happily with a smiling face, forwarded his hand and made a contract with Seo Jun to become his slave for 100 days, saying he is the happiest monster alive. As if he got to eat these magical leaves, he is even ready to pay two tower coins, and he will get to eat the magical grass for free on top of getting tower coins. It's like he is in heaven. Then, ox number three enthusiastically shook Seo Jun's hand, and Seo Jun, with a smiling face, also shook his hand, thinking that he had secured a good muscular worker to help dig the farmland. Ox number three was thinking that he had gotten a good deal, he should be getting punished, but instead, he was getting rewarded. Theo, in all of this, stood with his mouth open, bewildered, seeing Seo Jun's business tactics. Theo had learned another valuable lesson from Seo Jun, that if one doesn't have money, they can pay with their labor. He started to admire Seo Jun even more as he learned this valuable lesson once again. Immediately, Theo, with a serious face, took out a paper and pen, saying that he should write all this down so that if, in the future, for whatever reason, he doesn't have money to pay for something, he can offer his labor. Ox number three happily left for his cave, saying goodbye to Seo Jun with a happy smile, and Seo Jun and Theo bid him farewell, wishing him a safe journey. After that, Seo Jun turned toward Theo and with a warm smile complimented him, saying that Theo had really done a great job by catching the thief. Because of that, Seo Jun had acquired a great worker, and plowing the farmland would become much easier now. Theo listened to Seo Jun with a proud smile. Hearing this, Theo also enthusiastically asked if he really did a great job, wondering how well he had done. He thought that Seo Jun might make him a chairman because of his excellent work. Seo Jun, seeing Theo filled with so much excitement, just smiled a bit. Then, Seo Jun turned back, crossed his hands, and smiled as he said, Because Theo accomplished such a great achievement, I will now extend your sales cat status for a whole month. Hearing this, Theo gave a straight and disappointed look. He had been expecting to be promoted to the status of chairman and have authority over Seo Jun. Then, Theo, like a child, grabbed onto Seo Jun's legs and started to nag like a spoiled kid, saying he wanted more reward. And this wasn't fair. Seo Jun, getting a little annoyed, started to shake his legs, trying to remove Theo from his leg. He told Theo that he needed to get off because he only had this pair of pants, and if they tore, he would have to walk naked in the cave. And just like that, the days passed by happily. The next day, early in the morning, Seo Jun, with the warrior rabbit on his shoulder, got ready to hunt some crayfish. Seo Jun had his dagger, and the warrior rabbit had his little hammer, both glaring at the crayfishes with confidence. With Seo Jun's command, the warrior rabbit jumped, raising his cute little hammer, and in a single swing, they started to hunt the crayfish with ease. After a while, we see Seo Jun with his dagger peeling the skin off the crayfishes with great concentration. The warrior rabbit, on the other hand, was systematically killing the crayfishes one by one and handing them over to Seo Jun. Seo Jun turned back and said, This should be enough for today. And we see a large pile of crayfish, all with their skins skillfully peeled off. Seo Jun was holding one of the dead crayfish, and the agile rabbit and the white rabbit were taking care of the crayfish removing the skin easily as Seo Jun had made a cut for that purpose. Then, Seo Jun ordered the warrior rabbit to stop hunting, and the warrior rabbit happily complied, landing beside Seo Jun. Seo Jun, with a warm smile, complimented the black rabbit, saying he had done a great job and worked really hard. It seemed that the warrior rabbit's skills had improved significantly. However, something unexpected happened. The body of the warrior rabbit started to glow with a blue aura. Seo Jun, looking confused, asked the warrior rabbit why his body was glowing. But the warrior rabbit was equally puzzled, not knowing why he was glowing. In the next moment, the warrior rabbit's hammer began to glow, and it started to float in mid-air, shocking the warrior rabbit even more. And then, with a transformation, the warrior rabbit's hammer evolved and changed. Now one half of the hammer had a pointed cone-like structure, and the other half was flat, making it more flexible and deadly for battle. Seeing this, Seo Jun exclaimed in surprise, Wow, you have evolved! The warrior rabbit, still shocked and surprised, held the floating, newly evolved hammer, and slowly his body started to return to normal. 
Then Seo Jun, with a warm smile, started to clap and congratulate the warrior rabbit, along with the chubby rabbit, the cart rabbit, and the white rabbits. They were all genuinely happy for the warrior rabbit, and they clapped and congratulated him. Seo Jun commented that the warrior rabbit's new hammer looked really cool, and he was genuinely happy for him. The warrior rabbit, hearing all the praise, stood beside the pond, holding his newly evolved hammer on his shoulder with a proud and confident look. Seo Jun excitedly said, now that the warrior rabbit has become a real warrior after evolving, he can handle the crayfish hunting himself while showing a thumbs up. The warrior rabbit responded with an enthusiastic thumbs up saying, leave it to me. However, the conversation was interrupted by the growl of the mommy bear. The mommy bear was signaling Seo Jun to come outside the cave. Seo Jun then stepped out of the cave asking, is there any problem? As he looked at the cave wall where the baby bear was pointing, he was shocked to see a beehive. In excitement, he exclaimed, Is this the beehive of the new thick bee? Oh, sorry, the new queen bee. Just then, upon hearing Seo Jun's voice, the baby queen bee emerged from the hole in the beehive. When she saw Seo Jun, she had a cute smile on her face, and in the next moment, she excitedly dashed towards Seo Jun, calling him Daddy. This sudden revelation startled Seo Jun for a moment, and he exclaimed, Is she the baby of the mommy queen bee that hatched that day? Then, the baby queen bee came close to her daddy, Seo Jun, and started rubbing her cheek against Seo Jun's cheek. Seo Jun, holding her gently, also started rubbing his cheek against hers, expressing how happy he was to finally meet her. He had dreamt about this moment every day and had been really worried, wondering where she had gone. Now, he was overjoyed to finally be reunited with her. The baby queen bee then called her own poison worker bee formation, and Seo Jun greeted them, complimenting the baby queen bee on how she had already started building her own little bee empire. He was genuinely impressed with her. Seo Jun then turned toward the baby bear and corrected himself, saying, She is the baby of the queen bee whose honey you really like. He encouraged the baby bear to say hello to her. The baby queen bee, standing behind Seo Jun, curiously glared at her new uncle bear. The baby bear introduced himself to the baby queen bee, and Seo Jun commended the baby bear, saying that now that he had become an uncle, he had to protect the baby queen bee and take good care of her. This way, the mommy queen bee would be happy to see this, and she might give the baby bear more of her special juice to eat. The baby queen bee listened to all of this while sitting on Seo Jun's hat. Then, in the next moment, the baby queen bee dashed toward the baby bear and began patting her new uncle on his nose with a warm smile. The worker bee also perched on top of the baby bear, and the baby bear happily greeted and played with the baby queen bee, his heart filled with joy, and the mother bear and Seo Jun watched as the baby bear and the baby queen played joyfully. However, the ground started to shake slightly, and Seo Jun turned back to see none other than ox number three approaching with a happy and warm smile. Ox number three greeted Seo Jun with a friendly hello, and Seo Jun returned the greeting, saying hello and good morning. But before they could exchange further pleasantries, the mother bear suddenly stomped the ground with great force, causing the entire ground to shake. This startled Seo Jun, the baby queen bee, and everyone present. The mother bear let out a loud growl directed at ox number three, and the shock wave from her roar was so powerful that it pushed everyone back. Ox number three, realizing that he was facing the red bear that ox kind had warned him about, got into a battle-ready position. The mother bear, with a deadly look in her eyes, was ready for a bloody fight. The atmosphere turned dark and chilling as tension filled the air. Ox number three clenched his fists, expanded his muscles, and stared at the red bear with utmost seriousness. He mentioned that he didn't expect to encounter the red bear so soon, but had no choice but to fight. In response, the mother bear, already furious, became even more enraged. Her eyes glowed red and she continued to growl, appearing as if she would devour ox number three alive. Seeing the situation escalating out of control, Seo Jun tried to stop the mother bear, explaining that ox number three was not an enemy. However, the mother bear was too angry to listen to Seo Jun's words. In her fury, she tossed Seo Jun the baby bear and the baby queen bee aside, while Seo Jun desperately tried to prevent a bloody fight from unfolding. Then Theo, the warrior rabbit, and the cart rabbit came outside the cave and saw Seo Jun lying on the ground. They asked what was happening, and Seo Jun, with a hint of worry and fear, explained that ox number three and the mother bear were about to engage in a fight. If he didn't do anything, one of them might die or get seriously injured. Seo Jun carefully placed Theo on his shoulder, 
and with a sense of urgency asked Theo to try and convince both Ox Number 3 and the Mother Bear to stop fighting. The Mother Bear wasn't listening to Seo Jun, and Theo, though a bit scared and panicked, agreed to give it a try. Seo Jun then started running towards the scene where the Mother Bear and Ox Number 3 were giving each other menacing glares. He continued to plead with them to stop fighting, emphasizing that the Minotaur was now working for him. The misunderstanding had been resolved, and there was no need for a conflict. The mother bear finally turned her attention towards Seo Jun. Despite his attempts to explain the situation and prevent the fight, the mother bear growled in anger. Theo translated, explaining that the mother bear wanted Seo Jun to go back into his cave. Even though the misunderstanding was resolved, she couldn't tolerate the Minotaur invading her territory without her permission. Seo Jun approached the Minotaur with a worried expression, trying to convince him not to fight. However, Ox Number 3, with an honorable and prideful warrior spirit, explained that he couldn't back down from a fight. He would rather die than back away from a battle. At this moment, Seo Jun was truly overwhelmed. He didn't know what to do, and he was holding his head in frustration. In this intense moment, Theo shouted to Seo Jun that the baby bear was asking Theo to give him some churu again and that Seo Jun should scold the baby bear. Seo Jun, feeling incredibly frustrated, was at a loss for words. To make matters worse, the tower manager started asking Seo Jun for food because she was bored and hungry. Seo Jun tried to explain to the tower manager that he was busy trying to stop the fight between the mommy bear and the minotaur. However, the tower manager insisted that she wanted to eat because she was really hungry. Even before Seo Jun could respond, the baby bear was grabbing Seo Jun's shirt from behind, asking for churu because he was hungry. The tower manager continued to nag Seo Jun, saying she was hungry and the Minotaur and Mommy Bear were about to engage in a fight. Seo Jun at this moment finally lost his composure. The tower manager was hungry, the baby bear was hungry, Tio wanted Churu, and the Mommy Bear and Minotaur were about to fight. He had reached his breaking point. Seo Jun's whole face turned red with anger, and he shouted at the top of his lungs, If no one listens to me, I won't give food to anyone. Upon hearing this, the baby bears and all the rabbit's eyes widened in shock. The mommy bear turned to Seo Jun, her face filled with pain and fear. The mommy bear and the minotaur, realizing they would not get to eat the delicious food, fell into a state of depression. The baby bear and all the rabbits began to scream in panic at the thought of not getting Seo Jun's special juicy food, and the cart rabbit was just holding his head, witnessing all the chaos. Lastly, the tower manager also started screaming, holding her cheeks, and Theo, while grabbing Seo Jun's shirt, addressed Seo Jun as Sir and started crying out loud, apologizing and pleading not to cut his food supply. Seo Jun remained silent, his anger evident, and now everyone fell into silence in front of Daddy Seo Jun, feeling scolded like children in front of their father. In the previous episode, we saw how Seo Jun tricked Ox Number 3 into selling his body to him. Now, Ox Number 3 has to work for 100 days, and he will receive one tower coin each day. After that, he has to return those 100 coins to Seo Jun. Meanwhile, the warrior rabbit evolved and his hammer was upgraded. Seo Jun finally met the baby queen bee, and they hugged each other. However, trouble arose when Ox Number 3 came to work and unfortunately encountered Mommy Bear, leading to a fight. Seo Jun tried his best to stop them from fighting, but Mommy Bear was adamant as she couldn't allow anyone to invade her territory. Ox number three, driven by his pride, couldn't back down from the fight. As Seo Jun became increasingly frustrated with how to stop the fight, Theo, Baby Bear, and the tower manager pressured Seo Jun to give them food. This was enough to push Seo Jun over the edge, and he shouted that he would not give a single piece of food to anyone if no one listened to him. This declaration shocked everyone. Seo Jun, still furious with a loud voice while pointing his finger, commanded everyone to sit down. The mommy bear, ox number three, the baby bear, along with all the rabbits and Theo, as well as the tower manager, with a sad face realizing they were wrong, sat silently without saying a single word. After that, the situation came a little under control. Today's like goal is 4,400 likes. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Now let's continue. Seo Jun, still angry, said to both the mommy bear and ox number three that if both of them go on a rampage like that, not just the field and crops, but even Seo Jun and his other animal friends will get harmed too, so they must not fight. After that, Seo Jun turned back toward the rabbits and with a warm smile said, now they have to prepare a meal, as only by eating delicious food, 
everyone's mood will get happy and good, and it will also help in making friends between the mommy bear and ox number three. All the rabbits replied to Seo Jun with a cute, yes, sir. And Seo Jun, while clapping his hands with a warm smile, said, well then, let's eat, shall we? With this command, the warrior rabbit started to hunt crayfish and piranhas with his newly evolved hammer. Then the sickle rabbit started to chop spring onion leaves while the white rabbit, one by one, started to roast some mouth-watering corn on the campfire. The chubby and cart rabbit, while glaring and drooling upon seeing the roasted corn, started to transport the roasted corn and the spring onion. Seo Jun started to cook the meal. He first roasted some spring onions in his pan with delicious spices. Then he placed freshly roasted corn on a plate made with onion leaves and roasted piranhas wrapped in onion leaves placed on a plate also made with onion. Additionally, there was a full plate full of spring onions. Well, this was a feast. The mommy bear and ox number three, upon seeing this delicious food in front of them, couldn't help but open their mouths in amazement and excitement with sparkling eyes. And the next moment, they dug into the feast. Mommy bear and ox number three were sitting next to each other in front of the array of delicious foods, and Seo Jun and all his animal friends were also sitting in front of the foods. Seo Jun politely told Mommy Bear and Ox Number Three to eat to their heart's content. Mommy Bear was about to eat, but Ox Number Three had already started eating the spring onions. Seo Jun then picked up a plate full of roasted corn and happily handed it to the tower manager, telling him to enjoy. The tower manager thanked Seo Jun in advance. Ox Number Three, extremely happy while chewing a piece of onion, slowly approached to pick a piece of roasted corn. But before he could pick one, his hand clashed with Mommy Bear's as she was also trying to pick a piece of roasted corn. Then, once again, like two-year-old kids, they started to glare at each other while growling, ready to go on a rampage. Seo Jun and his animal friends were left sitting speechless. Seo Jun, while clearing his throat and raising his voice, said that he was going to announce something very important to make the situation calm. Seo Jun first came close to Mommy Bear, and then, with a polite tone, said to Ox Number 3 that this is Mommy Bear. She protects Seo Jun's cave and field, and she lives together with her cub named Kyung. As Seo Jun was introducing Mommy Bear to Ox Number 3, she was just sitting there still angry and breathing heavily. Then, Seo Jun went to Ox Number 3 and said, but before he could say anything, Ox Number 3 cut him off midway, and with an arrogant tone, said that he is Ox Number 3, a minotaur proud warrior. Then, still with a polite tone, Seo Jun explained to Mommy Bear that this Minotaur is called Ox Number Three, and he is going to help Seo Jun in fieldwork. As Seo Jun was explaining this, Theo was just sitting on Seo Jun's lap, listening to all of this. Finally, Seo Jun, with a serious tone, explained to both of them that now that they know each other and know that they are not enemies, they have to become friends with each other and not fight in the future. If they ever even for a second fight, Seo Jun is not going to give them food. Well, just hearing this, both Mommy Bear and Ox Number Three's worlds turned upside down, just thinking that they will not be able to drink and eat Seo Jun's special juice and food. And the next moment, the once enemies started exchanging warm handshakes like they are long lost friends. Then they clung to each other's hands and started taking oaths that they will never ever fight in the future with sparkling eyes. Well, they were friends now. They were. This is a good question. Meanwhile, Theo was just sleeping on Seo Jun's lap like a king. Then Seo Jun, while cuddling Theo, said to Ox Number Three to just follow him, and he will show what Ox Number Three's work is. Then Seo Jun brought Ox Number Three to the barren field. While looking at the field, Seo Jun explained to Ox Number Three that his work is very simple. Ox Number Three just has to dig up the ground, just like he did on the day of the blue moon, but not as rough as he did on the blue moon. Ox Number Three just has to dig a little rough and solid ground until the soft soil comes. Hearing this, Ox Number Three excitedly asked Seo Jun if he really has to just dig the soil, and after that, he will get one tower coin with as much food as he can eat. Seo Jun, with a proud look on his face, replied, Of course, he is telling the truth, as he is a very good boss who doesn't exploit his workers. After that, Ox Number Three got into position, lowering his body, and Seo Jun and Theo just watched curiously, thinking about how Ox Number Three was going to dig the soil. The next moment, Ox number three started to shake, his body started to glow purple, and his horn started to grow big, his eyes turned big, and Seo Jun and Theo got shocked and surprised. With a large growl, ox number three dashed while lowering his head with huge horns, and as he was going forward, because of his huge horns, the ground was getting plowed. While plowing this ground, ox number three was daydreaming, 
opening his mouth and drooling excessively with sparkling eyes. He was just thinking about eating the delicious spring onions after the work. Seo Jun and Theo were watching him from behind, seeing how Ox Number 3 easily plowed the ground like a bulldozer. Afterward, finally, Ox Number 3 plowed the field, and the chubby rabbit, with his cart full of spring onions, brought them to Seo Jun. Behind him was the father rabbit, ready with his watering can, and the shovel rabbit, ready to plant the spring onions. Seo Jun said, let's plant some spring onions, and everyone was happy and excited at the same time to plant them. After that, Seo Jun, one by one, started to plant the spring onions in the ground, and ox number three was playing with Baby Bear, showing off his muscles. Baby Bear was impressed, seeing the muscular ox number three. Then, while planting the spring onions, Seo Jun explained that it's not difficult to grow spring onions. They only have to plant spring onions once, and after that, whenever the spring onions fully grow, all they have to do is cut the spring onions in half, and the spring onions will grow fully again from the half-cut spring onion. As Seo Jun continued to plant the spring onions, the system notified him that he had created a 20-square-meter spring onion field and acquired 200 XP. Finally, all the spring onions were planted, and Seo Jun stood beside the planted spring onion field with a proud look on his face. He was chewing on a spring onion and said, Spring onions grow really fast inside the tower. So from now on, I will have an infinite amount of spring onions, and I can also feed ox number three as much as he wants. Then, Seo Jun turned toward the husband rabbit, who was watering the spring onion leaves. He said, there is only one problem after that. The husband rabbit's watering can suddenly stopped working, and the husband rabbit started to slam his watering can. Seo Jun, with a worried face, continued, the only problem now is that there is a limit to the amount of water in the watering can, so it's not possible to water all the crops and we have to go inside the cave and manually bring water from the pond or wait until the watering can recharge fully. As Seo Jun was wondering what to do, suddenly, the husband rabbit's whole body started to glow blue. His baby watering cat rabbit came close to see what was happening, and even Seo Jun got a little curious and asked why light was coming from the husband's rabbit's body. And whoosh! The next moment, the husband rabbit's watering can evolved and turned golden. The husband rabbit was very, very happy with sparkling eyes and gently raised his hand to catch the floating golden watering can. After that, as the husband rabbit very happily held his new golden watering can and stared at it, Seo Jun exclaimed in excitement, The watering can changed and evolved, just like what happened to the warrior rabbit. This is the second awakening I've seen. Raising both his hands, Seo Jun continued, The timing is perfect, and I'm really, really happy for the husband rabbit. Then Seo Jun asked the husband rabbit, Now, how much water can the husband rabbit hold? The husband rabbit confidently showed with his finger, Two times. Now I can hold water two times more than before, and I can regenerate the empty water can two times faster. Hearing this, while clenching his fist, Seo Jun exclaimed twice, That is great. Then, while raising his hand, he started to cheer for the husband rabbit and the baby watering rabbit, saying, Now they can continue their watering and the spring onion will grow nicely. Meanwhile, the Minotaur King was sitting on his throne, shining and wondering what happened to Ox Number 3, why he's not returning for three days. After that, Seo Jun picked up all the newly born baby rabbits and put them in his bag. He then brought them outside the cave and released them, saying, Today is the first day of the baby rabbits, and he brought them out to show them the outside of the cave. Seo Jun introduced the baby rabbits to the baby bear, and the baby bear, with a warm smile, gently welcomed them by holding their tiny paws. Then, all the baby rabbits came close to the baby bear's mouth and started sniffing the baby bear. The next moment, the baby bear started to lick the baby rabbits, startling them. Finally, after the licking session was over, all the baby rabbits, for a moment, just stared at the baby bear, thinking about what had just happened. Then, in an instant, all together, they jumped and climbed on top of the baby bear's chest. The baby bear, with his open hand, welcomed the baby rabbits. Then, the baby bear lay on the ground, and all the baby rabbits started to play on his chest, and some took a little nap. Seo Jun and Theo were watching this heartwarming moment from behind. Seo Jun was really happy, but Theo was not. He was angry, standing with his arms crossed. Seo Jun said to Theo, Baby bear and the baby rabbit seem to be getting along, and the baby rabbit seem really happy. After that, Theo, with confidence, laughed a little and said, I'm Uncle Theo, and the baby rabbits like me more than the baby bear. Then, to prove he is right, Theo turned and said to all the baby rabbits, Let's go with him, as Uncle Theo has come, and now he will take them on an exciting adventure outside the cave. 
The baby bears and all the rabbits listened to Theo without saying anything for a moment. After a while, Theo noticed that all the baby rabbits were just ignoring him and started to play with the baby bear. The baby bear once again started to like the baby rabbits, and yes, they were really having fun. But Theo, on the other hand, well, his heart broke into millions of pieces. Theo fell on the ground with his knees and started to cry while shivering, asking the baby rabbits, did they forget their Uncle Theo? How can they forget their lovable Uncle Theo who loved them so much? How can they betray him? He started to smash the ground, saying, after all the things he went through to raise them, this is the result he got. As Theo continued to cry, Seojun couldn't do anything but just stand there silently, not knowing what to do. Then Seojun gently held Theo, saying not to be too sad. Seojun placed Theo on his lap, telling him to take a seat. The baby rabbits hadn't forgotten Theo. They were just playing with the baby bear. After that, they would definitely come to Theo, and now Seo Jun would give Theo some churu. But Theo was just sitting there, pouting in anger. Then Seo Jun, while feeding Theo some churu, asked curiously, It's almost time for Theo to go to the lower floor to sell and trade, so why is Theo not going? Theo, with a worried and sweet face, explained that he didn't want to go. Or to be clear, he didn't think he could go even if he wanted to. Seo Jun got a little confused and asked, What does that mean? Theo, getting more worried and panicked, explained everything that happened with him. He told how the Silver Wolf tribe attacked him. As Theo was explaining, the baby bear and the baby rabbit continued to play. Then, upon hearing Theo's whole story, Theo couldn't believe what he was hearing, that a bunch of wolves attacked because of this straw hat. Seo Jun wondered, was this really Luffy's hat? Theo, still a little scared, explained that this is why he can't go to the lower floor, or they will once again attack him and he doesn't know if he will be able to come back alive. He is really scared. Seo Jun, on the other hand, placed his hand on the straw hat. He took his straw hat off his head and while staring at it wondered. He knows this is an artifact, but it is an unnecessary and useless item unless you are a farmer. Then Seo Jun realized there might be other farmers in this tower. Seo Jun, with a confident smile, once again put the straw hat on his head. Yes, he got a really good idea. Then. With a confident smile and a thumbs up, he said to Theo not to worry, as he really has a great idea to teach a lesson to those wolves. In the previous episode, we saw how Seo Jun used the ultimate power of food to tame each and every monster and solve the grand battle between the mommy bear and ox number three. After that, ox number three and the mommy bear became really good friends, and then ox number three started his first day at his job. Just like a bulldozer, he plowed all the ground in a single day, and Seo Jun then planted an entire field with spring onions. Then the husband rabbit also evolved after leveling up. But then a great problem arose. Seo Jun noticed that Theo was not going to the lower floors to sell cherry tomatoes. When Seo Jun asked why, Theo was not going. Theo, getting more worried and panicked, explained everything that happened with him. He told how the Silver Wolf tribe attacked him. As Theo was explaining, the baby bear and the baby rabbit continued to play. Then, upon hearing Theo's whole story, Theo couldn't believe what he was hearing, that a bunch of wolves attacked because of this straw hat. Seo Jun wondered, was this really Luffy's hat? Theo, still a little scared, explained that this is why he can't go to the lower floor, or they will once again attack him, and he doesn't know if he will be able to come back alive. He is really scared. Seo Jun, on the other hand, placed his hand on the straw hat. He took his straw hat off his head and while staring at it wondered. He knows this is an artifact, but it is an unnecessary and useless item unless you are a farmer. Then Seo Jun realized there might be other farmers in this tower. Seo Jun, with a confident smile, once again put the straw hat on his head. Yes, he got a really good idea. Then, with a confident smile and a thumbs up, he said to Theo not to worry, as he really has a great idea to teach a lesson to those wolves. Hearing this, Theo got surprised, and with a surprised face he asked Seo Jun, How is that possible? How can Theo possibly battle against those Silver Wolf guys? Guys, please, everyone who is watching this video at this point, like the video at once. I want to see how many likes this video can get and subscribe if you are new to support the channel. Now let's continue. Seo Jun explained that as the guys who hired the Silver Wolves, Theo could also hire someone to guard Theo's ass. Hearing this, Theo got surprised and excitedly, with a big smile, replied that it's actually a great idea. Then Seo Jun explained that being a freelance mercenary is a job that only those born in the tower, like Theo, can do. 
Anyone can sign a contract with a tower monster to become a mercenary. You just have to be from the tower. If you sign a contract with a client and become a mercenary, that monster will get the ability to use the passage by paying a fee, just like wandering merchants. Although one has to register as a mercenary at the mercenary office and get a badge to do mercenary jobs, there is an exception. Any monster can become a temporary mercenary if they sign a contract with a wandering merchant without any registration or anything. Seojun's idea is to make Ox Number 3, Theo's guard. Seojun, with a slight smile, wished he could also go down the tower by signing a contract with Theo as a mercenary, but he can't, because only those born in the tower can do that. Hearing this, Theo complimented Seo Jun and said Seo Jun remembered all this that he told him a few months ago, and he is impressed. After that, Theo, with an excited face, asked Seo Jun, but how will they manage to make Ox Number 3 become Theo's bodyguard? As although Ox Number the Third of May look like a dumb monster, he is indeed a monster from the 99th floor, so he is insanely strong compared to the lower floors. Seo Jun, with a smirking smile, replied that he has a great idea. He will offer Ox Number 3 three times the daily rate, which will be three tower coins, to become Theo's guard by signing a mercenary contract with Theo. He will also offer more onion leaves, since Ox Number 3 seems to like them very much. He was sure that just the name of onion leaves would be enough to make Ox Number 3 Theo's bodyguard. Hearing this, Theo instantly jumped high and took Seo Jun's straw hat from his head, patting Seo Jun's head and saying that Seo Jun is a real genius. Today, Theo learned yet another valuable lesson that if one can order any person by giving them food and money. Seo Jun, on the other hand, got a little startled seeing Theo's reaction. Then Seo Jun put his hat back on his head and, now feeling a little proud of himself, said that it was nothing, and in the future, Theo would also become a genius like him. Theo just had to follow Seo Jun, and for sure, in the future, Theo would become the most intelligent monster in the entire towers. Then Seo Jun took out a packet of churu and asked if Theo wanted it. Theo, wagging his tail, happily replied that he wanted it. Well, this is the power of food manipulation, my boys and gals. See how Theo is getting manipulated without even realizing he is getting manipulated. Now back to the story. As Theo happily enjoyed the churu, thinking he would definitely become a genius like Seo Jun without knowing he was already in Seo Jun's trap, getting manipulated by Seo Jun through the churus. Meanwhile, far from Seo Jun's cave, on the barren land, Ox Number 3 was a little nervous and scared. He was trying to hide from someone, looking right and left. Just then, someone stamped her foot on the ground, startling and scaring Ox Number 3. A rowdy voice asked Ox Number 3 where he was going. And voila, now we have a thick, thicker, I mean a female minotaur, full of thickness. She was a warrior ox from Ox Number 3's clan, a very strong one, let's say a muscle lady. She asked Ox Number 3 why he was searching for him for three days and where he had been. Ox Number 3, trembling and nervous, said he was just playing around, nothing special. With a single glare, the muscle lady figured out that something fishy was going on. Then, the muscle lady came close to Ox Number 3. After glaring at Ox Number 3 for a while with a suspicious face, she asked, Why is Ox Number 3's face shining? Is Ox Number 3 eating something delicious secretly, huh? Ox Number 3 just stood there with a sweet face, unable to say a single word. The muscle lady grabbed Ox Number 3's shoulder and started shaking him violently. She said she knew Ox Number 3 was going somewhere secretly, and seeing how shiny his hair and muscular his body was, she was sure he was eating something delicious. Ox Number 3 in front of the muscle lady remained like a statue. Then the muscle lady, while pointing her finger toward Ox Number 3, furiously shouted that if he didn't tell her where the food he was eating secretly was, she would beat the living daylights out of him. She threatened to tie him up with chains, beat him four times a day without giving him anything to eat or drink until he revealed the location of the food. Hearing this, Ox Number 3 lost his will and spilled all the beans. He revealed everything about how he met Seo Jun, obtained the divine spring onion, and how he was working to pay his debt, getting three meals a day by doing so. The muscle lady got really happy and, while raising her hand, told Ox Number 3 to take her to see Seo Jun. Without any choice, Ox Number 3 agreed to take the muscle lady to Seo Jun. As they began their journey to Seo Jun's cave, Ox Number 3 asked the muscle lady if she could please keep this a secret from the other minotaurs and the minotaur king. She agreed saying she only wanted to eat the divine leaf and would keep it a secret until she died. Then, after a while, Ox Number 3 finally reached Seo Jun's cave. As Seo Jun and Theo came outside the cave, 
they were left speechless and a little nervous. Standing in front of them was Ox Number 3, looking scared and nervous, and behind him was the Muscle Lady. Seeing this, Seojun curiously approached Ox Number 3 and asked, Who is she? Is she Ox Number 3's friend? Ox Number 3 replied hesitantly, and then the Muscle Lady excitedly introduced herself. She said hello and that her name is Rainy Mountain. Then she asked Seo Jun if he's the one who said he would give food to Ox Number 3 if he turned the ground upside down. Seo Jun confirmed that he was, and then Ox Number 3, with a depressed tone, asked Seo Jun if he could let his friend work here too, or else there would be a big problem, a very big one. Seo Jun stood there observing what was going on. After thinking for some time, Seo Jun replied that they had already plowed all the land, and now there was no need for extra help. However, he had another idea. He asked the muscle lady if she would be willing to work as a guard for Theo, who was being chased by dangerous wolves. Seo Jun offered to pay her three tower coins per day for this service. Upon hearing this, the muscle lady got a little angry and replied that she didn't like the offer at all. She didn't want tower coin. She wanted something she could eat, not pieces of metal. Seo Jun was curious about the sudden change in her attitude. She had said she wanted a job earlier, but now she was refusing. He asked if there was a problem. The muscle lady explained with annoyance that she couldn't eat tower coin. She wanted the reward to be something edible, not pieces of metal. Seo Jun realized he had struck the jackpot. Just like ox number three, she was willing to do anything for some onion leaf. Seo Jun offered her three meals a day and delicious snacks as a bonus if she did her job properly. Hearing this, the muscle lady got pumped up and, in a battle-ready position, clanged her fists together, saying she was ready. Then ox number three, seeing this, panically asked Seo Jun if he also wanted to do this job, can he? And Seo Jun, with a smile, though he knew ox number three would also want to go seeing how the reward is food, said, okay, ox number three can also go. With ox number three, Theo will be more secure. One can guard Theo while the other can battle with the wool. Then Seo Jun, with a gentle smile, said, now we will prepare some food and some snacks for traveling for their journey. Just hearing the word food, ox number three, and Muscle Lady got excited and started to scream in excitement, saying, Food! Yeah! After that, in excitement, Muscle Lady jumped and tightly hugged Ox Number 3, saying thanks so much for introducing her to Seo Jun. Well, guys, Ox Number 3, for the first time feeling the melons of Muscle Lady, started to blush a little because he is also a virgin. Now, Ox Number 3, to impress his new crush, confidently said it was nothing, and if she continued to follow him, he would make sure she never ran out of food, and he promised to take good care of her, and they continued their hunt for a while. Seo Jun from behind was watching this romantic scene with a naughty face. After that, Seo Jun harvested some spring onions, and after a while he collected quite a big pile of spring onions. He said, this should be enough for the newly loved birds, right? Then Theo came close to Seo Jun and said he packed all the cherry tomatoes inside his bag and he's ready to go. Seo Jun said to Theo that there seems to be a problem here. Theo might have to take out some cherry tomatoes so that he can also carry the spring onions for the minotaurs. Theo, with a smirking face while opening his cap, said not to worry. Then Theo threw his bag on top of the pile of spring onions and in an instant all the spring onions got sucked inside Theo's bag. In style, Theo caught his falling bag with one hand. Seeing this, Seo Jun got shocked and asked Theo how did Theo manage to fit all the spring onions in his bag along with the cherry tomatoes. And Theo, while showing his new merchant bag, proudly replied that now he became a senior wandering merchant, so now he can carry more things inside his bag. Hearing this, Seo Jun, now addressing Theo with a little respect, called his name as Senior Theo, now that he saw his badge's color and symbol indeed chain. Theo, a little angry, replied that only now Seo Jun noticed this after he told him about it, and he is not happy. Seo Jun then, stretching Theo's cheeks, said, Yes, yes, he made a mistake, and he is sorry for that. Now Theo has to hurry and get ready. Now Theo, holding his cheeks, was pouting, and Seo Jun said to Theo that he also packed some gifts for their family. So he asked Theo to take those gifts and give them to Dong Shik's family. Theo turned back, and with a thumbs up, he said, Leave it to me. After finally packing everything, Theo, with ox number three and his new girlfriend, was ready to go. While going, Theo bid Seo Jun goodbye, and ox number three and muscle lady assured Seo Jun that they would make sure not a single hair of Theo would be harmed. Seo Jun waved his hand to Theo, ox number three, and muscle lady, wishing them to be safe, leaving Theo in their hands now. The two minotaurs also waved back to Seo Jun.
After that, we see on the merchant alley, the road to the end of the lower floor. The wolves were keeping an eye on Theo because he had to go through this gate to go into the lower floor, so they were sure Theo had no choice but to go from here. Then we see Elka holding three roasted meat pieces and coming toward the chieftain, saying he brought food. The chieftain asked Elka how much more food was left, and Elka replied that this was the last of their food. The chief turned toward Elko, who was clearly bored and didn't want a guard, asking him to eat. Elko replied with a sad face that he didn't want to eat. Then Elka asked the chief how long they had to stay here. He was really tired, standing here for days, just looking at the passers-by. Can't they go back to the 85th floor? Now, hearing this, the chief became furious and grabbed Elko from his cape, shoutingly asked, Are you going to keep saying stupid things? Have you thought about their tribe members who are starving for food for days and are waiting on the 85th floor for them to complete their mission so that they will be able to eat some food? Then the chief's face turned really terrifying, and while growling with menacing deadly eyes, he said, if they don't complete the task, they will not be able to get food from Grid, the one who hired them to get the straw hat. And this mission will decide the survival of their clan, so not to say stupid things. Hearing this, Elko started crying and tearfully said he is really sorry and not to be angry. He was wrong, and he will do his job properly, he promised. Then the chief, holding his head really frustrated, said that the more they delay the mission, the more their tribe members will die because of hunger. They have to somehow find this Theo. Elko was just wiping his tears, and Elko was standing with the last roasted meat pieces. Then Elka offered a piece of chicken to Elko, saying that even if he is not hungry, he has to eat or he will grow weak. Elko, still crying, didn't say anything. Elka, with a warm smile, said that this meat was bought with the last of the money they had, so they have to eat this to gain strength. Elko just listened to Elka with teary eyes. Then Elka also offered a piece of meat to the chief, and as the chief was about to grab the piece of meat, he sensed something and instantly turned back at lightning speed. He aggressively started to look down the stairs. Elka, curious, asked the chief what is wrong, what happened, but the chief didn't say anything because he found Theo. Theo was just below them, walking joyfully. Now the chief, growling and ready to grab Theo by the collar, said that this time, no matter what happens, he will definitely catch Theo and then get information about the straw hat. So, that wraps up this chapter, folks. I'm concluding the video right here. Stay tuned for the thrilling developments in the next episode. And don't forget to show your support with a like and subscribe, fueling my motivation to bring you even more captivating comic chapters in the future. Until next time, happy reading.